Section 1 of History of Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, Chapter 13, The Military Despotism of Nicholas I, Part 1. 1. Military Service as a Means of De-Judaization The era of Nicholas I was typically inaugurated by the bloody suppression of the Decemberists and their constitutional demands proving, as it subsequently did, one continuous triumph of military despotism over the liberal movements of the age. As for the emancipation of the Jews, it was entirely unthinkable in an empire which had become Europe's bulwark against the inroads of revolutionary or even moderately liberal tendencies. The new despotic regime, overflowing with aggressive energy, was bound to create, after its likeness, a novel method of dealing with the Jewish problem. Such a method was contrived by the iron will of the Russian autocrat. Nicholas I, who was originally intended for a military career, was placed on the Russian throne by a whim of fate. Prior to his accession, Nicholas had shown no interest in the Jewish problem. The Jewish masses had flitted across his vision but once, in 1816, when, still a young man, he traveled through Russia for his education. The impression produced upon him by this strange people is recorded by the then Grand Duke in his diary in a manner fully coincident with the official views of the government. The ruin of the peasants of these provinces are the Zs. As property holders, they are here second in importance to the landed nobility. By their commercial pursuits, they drain the strength of the hapless white Russian people. They are everything here. Merchants, contractors, salon keepers, mill owners, ferry holders, artisans. They are regular leeches and suck these unfortunate governments to the point of exhaustion. It is a matter of surprise that in 1812 they displayed exemplary loyalty to us and assisted us wherever they could at the risk of their lives. The characterization of merchant, artisans, mill owners, and ferry holders as leeches could only spring from a conception which looked upon the Jews as transient foreigners who, by pursuing any line of endeavor, could only do so at the expense of the natives and thus abused the hospitality offered to them. No wonder then that the future Tsar was puzzled by the display of patriotic sentiments on the part of the Jewish population at the fatal juncture in the history of Russia. This immunical view of the Jewish people was retained by Nicholas when he became the master of Russian Jewish destinies. He regarded the Jews as an injurious element which had no place in a Slavonic Greek Orthodox monarchy and which therefore ought to be combated. The Jews must be rendered innocuous, must be corrected and curbed by such energetic military method as are in keeping with a form of government based on the principles of stern tutelage and discipline. As a result of these considerations, a singular scheme was gradually maturing in the minds of the Tsar to detach the Jews from Judaism by impressing them into a military service of a wholly exceptional character. The plan of introducing personal military service instead of the hitherto customary exemption tax, had engaged the attention of the Russian government towards the end of Alexander I's reign and had caused 
a great deal of alarm among the Jewish communities. Nicholas I was now resolved to carry this plan into effect. Not satisfied with imposing a civil obligation upon a people deprived of civil rights, the Tsar desired to use the Russian military service, a service marked by most extraordinary features, as an educational and disciplinary agency for his Jewish subjects. The barrack was to serve as a school, or rather as a factory, for producing a new generation of de-Judaized Jews, who were completely russified and, if possible, Christianized. The extension of the term of military service, marked by the ferocious discipline of that age, to a period of 25 years, the enrollment of immature lads or practically boys, their prolonged separation from a Jewish environment, and finally, the employment of such methods as were likely to produce an immediate effect upon the recruits in the desired direction. All this was deemed an infallible means of dissolving Russian Jewry within the dominant nation, nay, within the dominant church. It was a direct and simplified scheme which seemed to lead in a straight line to the goal. But had the ruling spheres of St. Petersburg known the history of the Jewish people, they might have realized that the annihilation of Judaism had in past ages been attempted more than once by other, no less forcible means, and that the attempt had always proved a failure. In the very first year of the new reign, the plan of transforming the Jews by military methods was firmly settled in the emperor's mind. In 1826, Nicholas instructed his ministers to draft a special statute of military service for the Jews, departing in some respects from the general law. In view of the fact that the new military reform was intended to include the western region, which was under the military command of the Tsar's brother, Grand Duke Constantine, the draft was sent to him in Warsaw for further suggestions and approval, and was in turn transmitted by the Grand Duke to Senator Nicholas Novosiltsev, his co-regent, for investigation and report. As an experienced statesman who had familiarized himself during his administrative activity with the Jewish conditions obtaining in the Western region, Novosiltsev realized the grave risks involved in the imperial scheme. In a memorandum submitted by him to the Grand Duke, he argued convincingly that the sudden imposition of military service upon the Jews was bound to cause an undesirable agitation among them, and that they should, on the contrary, be slowly prepared for such a radical transformation. Novosiltsev was evidently well informed about the state of mind of Jewish masses. No sooner had the rumor of the proposed ukase reached the Pale of Settlement than the Jews were seized by a tremendous excitement. It must be borne in mind that the Jewish population of Western Russia had but recently been incorporated into the Russian Empire. Cling with patriarchal devotion to their religion, estranged from the Russian people, and kept Moreover, in a state of civil rightlessness, the Jews of that region could not be reasonably expected to gloat over the prospect of a military service of 25 years' duration, which was bound to alienate their sons from their ancestral faith, detach them from their native tongue, their habits and customs of life, and throw them into a strange and often hostile environment. The ultimate aim of the project, which embedded in the mind of its originators, seemed safely hidden from the eye of publicity and was quickly sensed by the delicate national instinct, and the soul of the people was stirred to its depths. Public-minded Jews strained every nerve to avert the calamity. Jewish representatives journeyed to St. Petersburg and Warsaw to plead the cause of their brethren. 
negotiations were entered into with dignitaries of high rank and with men of influence in the world of officialdom. Rumor had it that immense bribes had been offered to Novosiltsev and several high officials in St. Petersburg for the purpose of receiving their cooperation. But even the intercession of leading dignitaries was powerless to change the will of the Tsar. He chafed under the red tape formalities which obstructed the realization of his favorite scheme. Without waiting for the transmission of Novosiltsev's memorandum, the Tsar directed the Minister of the Interior and the Chief of the General Staff to submit to him for signature a new case imposing military service upon the Jews. The fatal enactment was signed on August 26, 1827. 2. The recruiting new case of 1827 and juvenile conscription. The new case announces the desire of the government to equalize military duty for all estates without, be it noted, equalizing them in their rights. It further expresses the conviction that the training and accomplishments acquired by the Jews during their military service will, on their return home after the completion of the number of years fixed by law, fully a quarter of a century, be communicated to their families and make for greater usefulness and higher efficiency in their economic life and in the management of their affairs. However, the statute of conscription and military service subjoined to the U case was a lurid illustration of a tendency utterly at variance with the desire to equalize military duty. Had the Russian government been genuinely desirous of rendering military duty uniform for all estates, there would have been no need of issuing separately for the Jews a huge enactment of 95 clauses with supplementary instructions, consisting of 62 clauses for the guidance of the civil and military authorities. All that was necessary was to declare that the general military statute applied also to the Jews. Instead, the reverse stipulation is made. The general laws and institutions are not valid in the case of the Jews when at variance with the special statute. Clause 3. The discriminating character of Jewish conscription looms particularly large in the central portion of the statute. Jewish families were stricken with terror on reading the eighth clause of the statute prescribing that the Jewish conscripts presented by the Jewish communes shall be between the ages of 12 and 25. This provision was supplemented by Clause 74. Jewish minors, i.e., below the age of 18, shall be placed in preparatory establishment for military training. True, the institution of minor recruits, called Cantonist, existed also for Christians. But in their case, it was confined to the children of soldiers in active service by virtue of the principle laid down by the Arakchev that children born of soldiers were property of the military department, whereas the conscription of Jewish minors was to be absolute and to apply to all Jewish families without discrimination. To make things worse, the law demanded that the years of preparatory training should not be included in the term of active service the latter to start only with the age of 18, close 90. In other words, the Jewish Cantonists were compelled to serve an additional term of six years over and above the obligatory 25 years. Moreover, at the examination of Jewish conscripts, all that was demanded for their enlistment was that they be free from any disease or defect incompatible with military service but the other qualifications required by the general rules shall be left out of consideration. The duty of enlisting the recruits was imposed upon the Jewish communes or kahals, which were to elect for that purpose between three and six executive officers or trustees 
in every city. The community as such was held responsible for the supply of a given number of recruits from its own midst. It was authorized to draft into military service any Jew guilty of irregularity in the payment of taxes, of vagrancy, and other misdemeanors, in case the required number of recruits was not forthcoming within a given term, the authorities were empowered to obtain them from the derelict community by way of execution. Any irregularity on the part of the recruiting trustees was to be punished by the imposition of fines or even by sending them into the army. The following categories of Jews were exempted from military duty. Merchants holding membership in guilds, artisans affiliated with trade unions, mechanics in factories, agricultural colonists, rabbis and the Jews, few and far between at that time, who had graduated from a Russian educational institution. Those exempted from military service in kind were required to pay recruiting money, 1,000 rubles for each recruit. The general law providing that a regular recruit could offer as his substitute a volunteer was extended to the Jews with the proviso that the volunteer must also be a Jew. The instructions to the civil authorities appended to the statute specify the formalities to be followed both at the recruiting stations and in administering the oath of allegiance to the conscripts in the synagogues. The latter ceremony was to be marked by gloomy solemnity. The recruits was to be arrayed in his prayer shawl, talit, and shroud, kittel. With his phylacteries wound around his arm, he should be placed before the ark and amidst burning candles and to the accompaniment of shofar blasts made to recite a lengthy or inspiring oath. The instructions to the military authorities accompanying the statute prescribe that every batch of Jewish conscripts shall be entrusted to a special officer to be watched over prior to their departure for their places of destination and shall be kept apart from the other recruits. Both in the places of conscription and on the journey, the Jewish recruits were to be quartered exclusively in the homes of Christian residents. The promulgated military constitution surpassed the very worst apprehension of the Jews. All were staggered by this sudden blow, which descended crushingly upon the mode of life, the time-honored tradition, and the religious ideals of Jewish people. The Jewish family nests became astir, trembling for their fledglings. Barely a month after the publication of the military statute, the central government in St. Petersburg was startled by the report that the Volinian town of Old Constantine had been the scene of mutiny and disorder among the Jews on the occasion of the promulgation of the UKs. Benkendorf, the chief of the gendarmerie, conveyed this information to the Tsar, who thereupon gave orders that in all similar cases the culprits be court-martialed. Evidently, the St. Petersburg authorities apprehended a whole series of Jewish mutinies as a result of the dreadful UKs, and they were ready with extraordinary measures for the emergency. However, their apprehensions were unfounded. Apart from the incident referred to, there was no case of open rebellion against the authorities. As a matter of fact, even in old Constantine, the mutiny was of a nature little calculated to be dealt with by a court martial. According to the local tradition, the Jewish residents, Hasidim almost to a man, were so profoundly stirred by the imperial UKs that they assembled in the synagogue, fasting and praying, and finally resolved to adopt energetic measures. A petition reciting their grievances against the Tsar was framed in due form and placed in the hands of a member of the community who had just died with the request 
that the deceased presented to the Almighty, the God of Israel. This childlike appeal to the heavenly king from the action of an earthly sovereign and the emotional scenes accompanying it were interpreted by the Russian authorities as mutiny. Under the patriarchal conditions of Jewish life prevailing at that time, a political protest was a matter of impossibility. The only medium through which the Jews could give vent to their burning national sorrow was a religious demonstration within the walls of the synagogue. End of section 1section 2 of history of jews in russia and poland volume 2 from the death of alexander the first until the death of alexander the third 1825 to 1894 by shimon dubnov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ss kim seoul south korea chapter 13 the Military Despotism of Nicholas I, Part Two. Three, Military Martyrdom. The ways and means by which the provisions of the military statute were carried into effect during the reign of Nicholas I, we do not learn from official documents, which seem to have drawn a veil over this dismal strip of the past. Our information is derived from sources far more communicative and nearer to truth, the traditions current among the people. Owing to the fact that every Jewish community, at the mutual responsibility of all its members, was compelled by law to supply a definite number of recruits, and that no one was willing to become a soldier of his own volition, the Kahal administration and the recruiting trustees, who had to answer to the authorities for any shortage in recruits, were practically forced to become a sort of police agents, whose function it was to capture the necessary quota of recruits. Prior to every military conscription, the victims marked for prey, the young men and boys of the burger class, very generally took to flight hiding in distant cities outside the zone of their cars or in forests and ravines. A popular song in Yiddish refers to these conditions in the following words. Der Ukas is Arup gekommen auf jüdische Zellner. Seinen mir sich zulaufen in die Puste Wälder. In alle Puste Wälder seinen mir zulaufen. In Puste Gruber seinen mir verlaufen. Oi wei, oi wei. When the UKs came down about Jewish soldiers, we all dispersed over the lonesome forest. Over the lonesome forest did we disperse. In lonesome pits did we hide ourselves. Woe me, woe. The recruiting agents hired by the Kahal or its trustees who received the nickname hunters or captors, hunted down the fugitives, trailing them everywhere and capturing them for the purpose of making up the shortage. In default of a sufficient number of adults, little children who were easier catch were seized, often enough in violation of the provision of law. Even boys under the required age of 12 sometimes no more than eight years old, were caught and offered as conscripts at the recruiting stations, their age being misstated. The agent perpetrated incredible cruelties. Houses were raided during the night, and children were torn from the arms of their mothers, were lured away and kidnapped. After being captured, the Jewish conscripts were sent into the recruiting jail where they were kept in confinement until their examination at the recruiting station. The enlisted miners were turned over to a special officer to be dispatched to their places of destination, mostly in the eastern provinces including Siberia. 
for it must be noted that the Cantonists were stationed almost to a man in the outlying Russian governments where they could be brought up at a safe distance from all Jewish influences. The unfortunate victims who were drafted into the army and deported to these far-off regions were mourned by their relatives as dead. During the autumnal season, when the recruits were drafted and deported, the streets of the Jewish towns resounded with moans. The juvenile Cantonists were packed into wagons like so many ships and carried off in batches under a military convoy. When they took the leave of their dear ones, it was for a quarter of a century. In the case of children, it was for a longer term. Too often it was goodbye for life. How these unfortunate youngsters were driven to their places of destination, we learn from the description of Alexander Herzen, who chanced to meet a batch of Jewish cancionists on his involuntary journey through Vyatka in 1835. At one of the post stations in some God-forsaken village of the Vyatka government, he met the escorting officer. The following dialogue ensued between the two. Whom do you carry and to what place? Well, sir, you see, they got together a bunch of these accursed Jewish youngsters between the age of eight and nine. I suppose they are meant for the fleet, but how should I know? At first, the command was to drive them to Perm. Now there is a change. We are told to drive them to Kazam. I have had them on my hands for a hundred versts or thereabout. The officer that turned them over to me told me that they were an awful nuisance. A third of them remained on the road. At this, the officer pointed with his finger to the ground. Half of them will not get to their destination, he added. Epidemics, I suppose. I inquired, stirred to the very core. No, not exactly epidemics, but they just fall like flies. Well, you know, these Jewish boys are so punny and delicate. They can't stand mixing dirt for ten hours with dry biscuits to live on. Again, everywhere, strange folks, no father, no mother, no caress. Well then, you just hear a cough and the youngster is dead. Hello, corporal. Get out the small fry. The little ones were assembled and arrayed in a military line. It was one of the most terrible spectacles I have ever witnessed. Poor, poor children. The boys of 12 or 13 managed to somehow to stand up, but the little ones of 8 and 10, no brush, however black, could convey the terror of this scene on the canvas. Pale, worn out, with scared looks, this is the way they stood in their uncomfortable, rough soldier uniforms, with their starched, turned-up colors, fixing an inexpressibly helpless and pitiful gaze upon the garrison soldiers who were handling them rudely. White lips, blue lines under the eyes, betokened either fever or cold. And these poor children, without care, without caress, exposed to the wind which blows unhindered from the Arctic Ocean, were marching to their deaths. I seized the officer's hand and with the words, Take good care of them, threw myself into my carriage. I felt like sobbing and I knew I could not master myself. The great Russian writer saw the Jewish Cantonists on the road, but he knew nothing of what happened to them later on in the recesses of the barracks into which they were driven. This terrible secret was revealed to the world at a later period by the few survivors among these martyred Jewish children. Having arrived at their destination, the juvenile conscripts were put into the Cantonist battalions. The preparation for military service began with the religious re-education at the hands of surgeons and corporals. No means was neglected so long as it bade fair to bring the children to the baptismal font. The authorities refrained from giving formal instructions, 
leaving everything to the zeal of the officers who knew the wishes of their superiors. The children were first sent for spiritual admonition to the local Greek Orthodox priests, whose efforts, however, proved fruitless in nearly every case. They were then taken in hand by the surgeons and corporals who adopted military methods of persuasion. These brutal soldiers invented all kinds of tortures. A favorite procedure was to make the Cantonists get down on their knees in the evening after all had gone to bed and to keep the sleepy children in that position for hours. Those who agreed to be baptized were sent to bed. Those who refused were kept up the whole night till they dropped from exhaustion. The children who continued to hold their own were flogged and, under the guise of gymnastic exercises, subjected to all kinds of tortures. Those that refused to eat pork or the customary cabbage soup prepared with lard were beaten and left to starve. Others were fed on salted fish and then forbidden to drink until the little ones, tormented by thirst, agreed to embrace Christianity. The majority of these children, unable to endure the tortures inflicted on them, saved themselves by baptism. But many Cantonists, particularly those of a mature age, between 15 and 18, bore their martyrdom with heroic patience. Beaten almost into senselessness, their bodies stripped by lashes, tormented to the point of exhaustion by hunger, thirst, and sleeplessness, the lads declared again and again that they would not betray the faith of their fathers. Most of these obstinate youth were carried from the barracks into the military hospitals to be released by a kind death. Only a few remained alive. Alongside of this passive heroism, there were cases of demonstrative martyrdom. One such incident has survived in the popular memory. The story goes that during a military parade in the city of Kazan, the battalion chief drew up all the Jewish Cantonists on the banks of the river, where the Greek Orthodox priests were standing in their vestment and all was ready for the baptismal ceremony. At the command to jump into the water, the boys answered in military fashion, I, I, whereupon they dived under and disappeared. When they were dragged out, they were dead. In most cases, however, these little martyrs suffered and died noiselessly in the gloom of the guardhouses, barracks, and military hospitals. They strewed with their tiny bodies the road that led into the outlying regions of the empire, and those that managed to get there were fading away slowly in the barracks, which had been turned into inquisitorial dungeons. This martyrdom of children, set in a military environment, represents a singular phenomenon even in the extensive annals of Jewish martyrology. Such was the lot of the juvenile Cantonists. As for the adult recruits, who were drafted into the army at the normal age of conscription, 18 to 25, their conversion to Christianity was not pursued by the same direct methods, but their fate was not a whit less tragic from the moments of their capture till the end of their grievous 25 years' service. Youth, who had no knowledge of the Russian language, were torn away from the heather or yeshiva, often from wife and children. In consequence of the early marriages then in vogue, most youths at the age of 18 were married. The impending separation for a quarter of a century added to the danger of the soldiers' apostasy or death in far-off regions often disrupted their family ties. Many recruits, before entering upon their military career, gave their wives a divorce so as not to doom them to perpetual widowhood. At the end of 1834, rumors began to spread among the Jewish masses concerning a law which was about to be issued, forbidding early marriages but exempting from conscription those married prior to the promulgation of the law. A panic ensued. Everywhere, 
feverish haste was displayed in marrying off boys from 10 to 15 years old to girls of an equally tender age. Within a few months there appeared in every city hundreds and thousands of such couples whose marital relations were often confined to playing with nuts or bones. The misunderstanding which had caused this senseless matrimonial panic or beholo, as it was afterwards popularly called, was cleared up by the publication on April 13, 1835, of the new statute on the Jews. To be sure, the new law contained a clause forbidding marriage before the age of 18, but it offered no privileges for those already married, so that the only result of the beholo was to increase the number of families robbed by the conscription of their heads and supporters. The years of military service were spent by the grown of Jewish soldiers amidst extraordinary hardships. They were beaten and ridiculed because of their inability to express themselves in Russian, their refusal to eat trefa, and their general lack of adaptation to their strange environment and to the military mode of life. And even when this process of adaptation was finally accomplished, the Jewish soldier was never promoted beyond the position of a non-commissioned under-officer, baptism being the inevitable stepping stone to a higher rank. True, the statute on military service promised those Jewish soldiers who had completed their term in the army with distinction admission to the civil service, but the promise remained on paper so long as the candidates were loyal to Judaism. On the contrary, the Jews who had completed their military service and had in most cases become invalids were not even allowed to spend the rest of their lives in the localities outside the Pale, in which they had been stationed as soldiers. Only at a later period, during the reign of Alexander II, was this right accorded to the Nicholas soldiers and their descendants. The full weight of conscription fell upon the poorest classes of the Jewish population, the so-called burger estate, consisting of petty artisans and those impoverished tradesmen who could not afford to enroll in the mercantile guilds, those there are cases on record where poor Jews begged from door to door to collect a sufficient sum of money for a guild certificate in order to save their children from military service. The more or less well-to-do were exempted from conscription, either by virtue of their mercantile status or because of their connections with the Kahal leaders who had the power of selecting the victims. 4. The Policy of Expulsions In all lands of Western Europe, the introduction of personal military service for the Jews was either accompanied or preceded by their emancipation. At all events, it was followed by some mitigation of their disabilities, serving, so to speak, as an earnest of the grant of equal rights. Even in clerical Austria, the imposition of military duty upon the Jews was preceded by the tolerance patent. This would be act of emancipation. In Russia, the very reverse took place. The introduction of military conscription of a most aggravating kind and the unspeakable cruelties attending its practical execution were followed, in the case of the Jews, by an unprecedented recrudescence of legislative discrimination and the monstrous increase of their disabilities. The Jews were lashed with the double knout, a military and a civil. In the same ill fate year which saw the promulgation of the conscription statute, barely three months after it had received the imperial sanction, while the moans of the Jews, fasting and praying to God to deliver them from the calamity, were still echoing in the synagogues, two new ukases were issued both signed on December 2, 1827, they won decreeing the transfer of the Jews from all villages and village inns in the government of Grodno into the towns and townlets, 
the other ordering the banishment of all Jewish residents from the city of Kiev. The expulsion from the Grodno villages was the continuation of the policy of the rural liquidation of Jewry, inaugurated in 1823 in White Russia. The Grodno province was merely meant to serve as a starting point. Grand Duke Constantine, who had brought up the question, was ordered at first to carry out the expulsion in the government of Grodno alone and to postpone for a later occasion the application of the same measure to the other governments entrusted to his command. Simultaneously, considerable foresight was displayed in instructing the Grand Duke to wait with the expulsion of the Jews until the conclusion of the military conscription going on at present. Evidently, there was some fear of disorders and complications. It was thought wiser to seize the children for the army first and then to expel the parents, to get hold of the young birds, than to destroy the nest. The expulsion from Kiev was of a different order. It marked the beginning of a new system, the narrowing down of the urban area allotted to the Jews within the Pale of Settlement. Since 1794, the Jews had been allowed to settle in Kiev freely. They had formed there with official sanction an important community and had vastly developed commerce and industry. Suddenly, however, the government discovered that their presence is detrimental to the industry of this city and to the exchequer in general, and is moreover at variance with the rights and privileges conferred at different periods upon the city of Kiev. The discovery was followed by a grim rescript from St. Petersburg, forbidding not only the further settlement of Jews in Kiev, but also prescribing that even those settled there long ago should leave the city within one year, those owning immovable property within two years. Henceforward, only the temporary sojourn of Jews for a period of not exceeding six months was to be permitted and to be limited, moreover, to merchants of the first two guilds who arrive in connection with contracts and fairs or to attend to public bids and deliveries. In 1829, the whip of expulsion cracked over the backs of the Jews dwelling on the shores of the Baltic and the Black Sea. In Courland and Livonia, measures were taken looking to the reduction of the number of Jews, which had been considerably swelled by the influx of newcomers, of Jews not born in those provinces and therefore having no right to settle there. The Tsar endorsed the proposal of the Jewish committee to transfer from Courland all Jews not born there into the cities in which their birth was registered. Those not yet registered in a municipality outside the province were granted a half year's respite for that purpose. If within the prescribed term they failed to attend to their registration, they were to be sent to the army or in case of unfitness for military service, deported to Siberia. In the same year, an imperial ukase case declared that the residence of civilian Jews in the cities of Sevastopol and Nikolaev was inconvenient and injurious in view of the military and naval importance of these places, and therefore decreed the expulsion of their Jewish residents, those owning real property within two years, the others within one year. By a new U case issued in 1830, the Jews were expelled from the villages and hamlets of the government of Kiev. Thus were human beings hurled about from village to town, from city to city, from province to province, with no more concern than might be displayed in the transportation of cattle. This process of mobilization had reached its climax when the Polish insurrection of 1830 to 1831 broke out, affecting the whole western region. Fearing lest the persecuted Jews might be driven into the arms of the Poles, 
the government decided on a strategic retreat. In February 1831, in consequence of the representations of the local military commander who urged the government to take into consideration the present political circumstances in which they, the Jews, may occasionally prove useful, the final expulsion of the Jews from Kiev was postponed for three years. At the end of the three years, the governor of Kiev made similar representations to St. Petersburg, emphasizing the desirability of allowing the Jews to remain in the city, even though it might become necessary to segregate them in a special quarter, this, i.e., their remaining in the city, being found useful also in this respect, that on account of their temperate and simple habits of life, they are in a position to sell their goods considerably cheaper, whereas in the case of their expulsion, many articles and manufacturers will rise in price. Nicholas I rejected this plea and only agreed to postpone the expulsion until February 1835 for the reason that the new statute concerning the Jews, then in preparation which was to define the general legal status of Russian Jewry, was expected to be ready by that time. Similar short reprieves were granted to the Jews about to be exiled from Nikolaev, from the villages of the government of Kiev, and from other places. End of section 2Section 3 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Dubnov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. Chapter 13 the military despotism of Nicholas I. Part 3. 5. The codification of Jewish disabilities. No sooner had the conscription new case been issued than the bureaucrats of St. Petersburg began to apply themselves in the hidden recesses of their chancelleries to a new civil code for the Jews which was to supersede the antiquated statute of 1804. The work passed through a number of departments. The projected enactment was framed by the Jewish Committee, which had been established in 1823 for the purpose of bringing about a reduction of the number of Jews in the monarchy, and consisted of cabinet ministers and the chiefs of departments. Originally, the department chiefs had elaborated a draft covering 1,230 clauses, a gigantic code of disabilities, evidently founded on the principle that, in the case of Jews, everything is forbidden which is not permitted by special legislation. The dimension of the draft was such that even the government was appalled and decided to turn it over to the ministerial members of the committee. Modified in shape and reduced in size, the code was submitted in 1834 to the Department of Laws, forming part of the Council of State, and after careful discussion by the Department of Laws, was brought up at the plenary sessions of the Council. The ministerial draft, though smaller in bulk, was marked by such severity that the Department of Laws found it necessary to tone it down. The ministers, with the exception of the Minister of Finance, had proposed to transfer all Jews within a period of three years from the villages to the towns and townlets. The Department of Laws considered this measure too risky, pointing to the White Russian expulsion of 1823 which had failed to produce the expected results, and while it has ruined the Jews, it does not in the least seem to have improved the conditions of the villagers. The plenum of the Council agreed with the Department of Laws that the proposed expulsion of the Jews from the villages 
being extremely difficult of execution and being of problematic benefit, should be eliminated from the statute and should be stopped even there, where it had been decreed but not carried into effect. The report was laid before the Tsar, who attached to it the following resolution. Where this measure of expulsion had been started, it is inconvenient to repeal it, but it shall be postponed for the time being in the governments in which no steps towards it have as yet been made. For a number of years, this resolution hung like the sword of Damocles over the heads of the rural jury. Less yielding was the Tsar's attitude on the question of the partial enlargement of the Pale of Settlement. The Department of Laws had suggested to grant the merchants of the First Guild the right of residence in the Russian interior in the interest of the exchequer and big business. At the general meeting of the Council of State, only a minority, 13, voted for the proposal. The majority, 22, argued that they had no right to violate the time-honored tradition dating from the time of Peter the Great, which bars the Jews from the Russian interior, that to admit them would produce a very unpleasant impression upon our people, which, on account of its religious notions and its general estimate of the moral peculiarities of the Jews, has become accustomed to keep aloof from them and to despise them, that the countries of Western Europe, which had accorded full citizenship to the Jews, cannot serve as an example for Russia, partly because of the incomparably larger number of Jews living here, partly because our government and people, with all their well-known tolerance, are yet far from that indifference with which certain other nations look upon religious matters. After marking his approval of the last words by the marginal exclamation, thank God, the Tsar disposed of the whole matter in the following brief resolution. This question has been determined by Peter the Great. I dare not change it. I completely share the opinion of the 22 members. While on this occasion the Tsar endorsed the opinion of the Council as represented by its majority, in case in which it proved favorable to the Jews, he did not hesitate to set it aside. Thus, the Department of Laws, as part of the Council of State, and following in its wake, the Council itself had timidly suggested to Nicholas to comply in part with the plea of the Jews for mitigation of the rigors of conscription, but the imperial verdict read, to be left as heretofore. Nicholas remained equally firm on the question of the expulsion from Kiev. The Department of Laws, guided by the previously mentioned representation of the local governor, favored the postponement of the expulsion, and 14 members of the plenary council agreed with the suggestion of the department and resolved to recommend it to the benevolent consideration of His Majesty, in other words, to request the Tsar to revoke the painful ukase. But 15 members rejected all such propositions on the ground that, as far as that question was concerned, the imperial will was unmistakable, the Tsar having decided the matter in a sense unfavorable to the Jews. In a similar manner, numerous other decisions of the Council of State were dictated not so much by inner conviction as by fear of the clearly manifest imperial will, which no one dared to cross. Under these circumstances, the entire draft of the statute passed through the Council of State. In its session of March 28, 1835, the Council voted to submit it to the Emperor for his signature. On this occasion, a solitary and belated voice was raised in defense of the Jews, without evoking an echo. A member of the Council, Admiral Greig, who was brave enough to swim against the current, submitted a special opinion on the proposed statute, 
in which he advocated a number of alleviations in the intolerable legal status of the Jews. Greig put the whole issue in a nutshell. Are the Jews to be suffered in the country or not? If they are, then we must abandon the system of hampering them in their actions and in their religious customs and grant them at least equal liberty of commerce with others. For in this case, we may anticipate more good from their gratitude than from their hatred. Should, however, the conclusion be reached that the Jews ought not to be tolerated in Russia, then the only thing to be done is to banish them all without exception from the country into foreign lands. This might be more useful than to allow this estate to remain in the country and to keep it in a position which is bound to arouse in them continual dissatisfaction and resentment. It need scarcely be added that the voice of the queer admiral found no hearing. Nor did the Jewish people manage to get a hearing. Stunned by the uninterrupted succession of blows and moved by the spirit of martyrdom, Russian Jewry kept its peace during those dismal years. Yet, when the news of an impending general regulation of the Jewish legal status began to leak out, a section of Russian Jewry became astir. For to anticipate a blow is more excruciating than to receive one, and it was quite natural that an attempt should be made to stay the hand which was lifted to strike. Towards the end of 1833, the Council of State received, as part of the material bearing on the Jewish question, two memoranda, one from the Kahal of Vilna, signed by six elders, and another from Littman Feigin of Chernigov, well known in administrative circle as merchant and public contractor. The Kahal of Vilna declared that the repressive policy pursued during the last few years by the Jewish committee had thrown a large part of Jewish people into utmost disorder and had made the Jews shiver and shudder at the thought that a general Jewish statute had been drafted by the same committee and had now been submitted to the Council of State for revision. The petitioners go on to say that, weighed down by a succession of cruel discriminations affecting not only their rights but also their mode of discharging military service, the Jews would succumb to utter despair, did they not repose their hopes in the benevolence of the Tsar who, on his recent trip through the western provinces, had expressed it to the deputies of the Jewish communes his imperial satisfaction with the loyalty to the throne displayed by the Jews during the Polish insurrection of 1831. The Kahal of Vilna, therefore, implored the Council of State to turn its attention to this unfortunate and maligned people and to stop all further persecutions. A more emphatic note of protest is sounded in the Memorandum of Feigin. By a string of references to the latest government measures, he demonstrates the fact that the Jewish people is hunted down not because of its moral qualities, but because of its faith. The Jews, faced by the new statute, had lost all hope for a better lot, inasmuch as the government has embarked upon this measure without having solicited the explanations or justifications of these people, whereas, according to the common legal procedure, even an individual may not be condemned without having been called upon to justify himself. The rebuke had no effect. The government preferred to render its verdict in absentia, without listening to counsel for the defense and without any safeguards of fair play. In line with this attitude, it also denied the petition of the Vilna Kahal to be allowed to send at least four deputies to the capital as spokesmen of the entire Jewish people for the purpose of submitting to the government their explanations and propositions concerning the reorganization of the Jews after having been presented with the draft of the statute. The final verdict was pronounced in the spring of 1835, and in April 
the new statute concerning the Jews received the signature of the Tsar. This Charter of Disabilities, which was destined to operate for many decades, represents a combination of the Russian ground laws concerning the Jews and the restrictive bylaws issued after 1804. The Pale of Settlement was now accurately defined. It consisted of Lithuania and the southwestern provinces without any territorial restrictions, White Russia minus the villages, Little Russia minus the Crown Hamlets, New Russia minus Nikolaev and Sevastopol, the government of Kiev minus the city of Kiev, the Baltic provinces for the old settlers only, while the rural settlements on the entire 51st zone along the western frontier were to be closed to newcomers. As for the interior provinces, only temporary follows, limited to six weeks and to be certified by gubernatorial passports, were to be granted for the execution of judicial and commercial affairs, with the proviso that the travelers should wear Russian instead of Jewish dress. The merchants affiliated with the first and second guilds were allowed, in addition to visit the two capitals, the seaports, as well as the fairs of Nizhny Novgorod, Kharkov, and other big fairs for wholesale buying or selling. The Jews were further forbidden to employ Christian domestics for permanent employment. They could hire Christians for occasional services only, on condition that the latter live in separate quarters. Marriages at an earlier age than 18 for the bridegroom and 16 for the bride were forbidden under the pain of imprisonment, a prohibition which the defective legislation of birth and marriages then in vogue made it easy to evade. The language to be employed by the Jews in their public documents was to be Russian or any other local dialect, but under no circumstances the Hebrew language. The function of the Kahal, according to the statute, is to see to it that the instructions of the authorities are carried out precisely, and that the state taxes and communal assessments are correctly remitted. The Kahal elders are to be elected by the community every three years from among persons who can read and write Russian, subject to their being ratified by the gubernatorial administration. At the same time, the Jews are entitled to participation in the municipal elections, those who can read and write Russian are eligible as members of the town councils and magistracies. The supplementary law of 1836 fixed the rate at one-third, excepting the city of Vilna, where the Jews were entirely excluded from municipal self-government. Synagogues may not be built in the vicinity of churches. The Russian schools of all grades are to be open to Jewish children who are not compelled to change their religion. Clause 106, a welcome provision in view of the compulsory method which had then become habitual. The coercive baptism of Jewish children was provided for in a separate enactment, the Statute on Conscription, which is declared to remain in force. In this way, the Statute of 1835 reduces itself to a codification of the whole mass of the preceding anti-Jewish legislation. Its only positive feature was that it put a stop to the expulsion from the villages which had ruined the Jewish population during the years 1804 to 1830. 6. The Russian censorship and conversionist endeavors with all its discriminations, the promulgation of this general statute was far from checking the feverish activity of the government. With indefatigable zeal, its hands went on turning the legislative wheel and squeezing ever tighter the already unbearable vice of Jewish life. The slightest attempt to escape from its pressure was punished ruthlessly. In 1838, the police of St. Petersburg discovered a group of Jews in the capital with expired passports. 
these Jews, having extended their stay there a little beyond the term fixed for Jewish travelers, and the Tsar curtly decreed to be sent to serve in the penal companies of Kronstadt. In 1840, heavy fines were imposed upon the landed proprietors in the great Russian governments for keeping over Jews on their estates. Considerable attention was bestowed by the government on placing the spiritual life of the Jews under police supervision. In 1836, a censorship campaign was launched against Hebrew literature. Hebrew books, which were then almost exclusively of a religious nature, such as prayer books, Bible and Talmud editions, rabbinic, Kabbalistic, and Hasidic writings, were then issuing from the printing presses of Vilna, Slavta, and other places, and were subject to a rigorous censorship exercised by Christians or by Jewish converts. Practically, every Jewish home library consisted of religious works of this type. The suspicion of the government were aroused by certain Jewish converts who had insinuated that the foreign editions of these works and those that had appeared in Russia itself prior to the establishment of a censorship were of an injurious character. As a result, all Jewish home libraries were subject to a search. Orders were given to deliver into the hands of the local police in the course of that year all foreign Hebrew prints as well as the uncensored editions published at any previous time in Russia and to entrust their revision to dependable rabbis. These rabbis were instructed to put their stamp on the books approved by them and return the books not approved by them to the police for transmission to the Ministry of the Interior. The regulation involved the entire ancient Hebrew literature printed during the 16th, 17th, and 18th century prior to the establishment of the Russian censorship. In order to facilitate the supervision of the new publications or reprints from all the editions, all Jewish printing presses which existed at the time in various cities and towns were ordered closed, and only those of Vilna and Kiev, to which special censors were attached, were allowed to remain. As the Hebrew orders of antiquity or the Middle Ages did not fully anticipate the requirements of the Russian censors, many classic works were found to contain passages which were thought to be at variance with imperial enactments. By the U.K. of 1836, all books of this kind, circulating in tens of thousands of copies, had to be transported to St. Petersburg under a police escort to await their final verdict. The procedure, however, proved too cumbersome, and in 1837, the emperor, complying with the petitions of the governors, was graciously pleased to command that all these books be delivered to the flames on the spot. This auto da fe was to be witnessed by a member of the gubernatorial administration and a special dependable official dispatched by the governor for the sole purpose of making a report to the central government on every literary conflagration of this kind and forwarding to the Ministry of the Interior one copy of each annihilated book. But even this was not enough to satisfy the lust of the Russian censorship. It was now suspected that even the dependable rabbis might pass many a book as harmless, though its contents were subversive of the public will. As a result, a new U case was issued in 1841, placing the rabbinical censors themselves on the government control. All uncensored books, including those already passed as harmless, were ordered to be taken away from the private libraries and forwarded to the censorship committees in Vilna and Kiev. The latter were instructed to attach their seals to the approved books and deliver to the flames the books condemned by them. Endless wagon load of these confiscated books could be seen moving toward Vilna and Kiev, and for many years afterwards, the literature of the people of the book 
covering a period of three millenniums, was still languishing in the jail of censorship, waiting to be saved from or to be sentenced to a fiery death by a Russian official. It is almost unnecessary to add that the primitive method of solving the Jewish problem by means of conversion was still the guiding principle of the government. The Russian legislation of that period teems with regulations concerning apostasy. The surrender of the synagogue to the church seemed merely a question of time. In reality, however, the government itself believed but half-heartedly in the sincerity of the converted Jews. In 1827, the Tsar put down in his own handwriting the following resolution. It is to be strictly observed that the baptismal ceremony shall take place unconditionally on a Sunday and with all possible publicity so as to remove all suspicion of a pretended adoption of Christianity. Subsequently, this watchfulness had to be relaxed in the case of those who avoid publicity in adopting Christianity, more especially in the case of the Cantonists, who have declared their willingness to embrace the orthodox faith under the effect, we may add, of the tortures in the barracks. Sincerity under these circumstances was out of the question, and in 1831, the battalion chaplains were authorized to baptize these helpless creatures even without applying for permission to the ecclesiastic authorities. The barrack missionaries were frequently successful among these unfortunate military prisoners. In the imperial rescripts of that period, the characteristic expression, privates from among the Jews remaining in the above faith, figures as a standing designation for that group of refractory and incorrigible soldiers who disturbed the officially pre-established harmony of epidemic conversion by remaining loyal to Judaism. But among the civilian Jews, who had not been detached from their Jewish environment, apostasy was extraordinarily rare, and law after law was promulgated in vain, offering privileges to converts or leniency to criminals who were ready to embrace the orthodox creed. End of section 3. Section 4 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825-1894, to by Shimon Dubnov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. Chapter 14 Compulsory Enlightenment and Increased Oppression Part 1 1. Enlightenment as a Means of Assimilation There was a brief moment of respite when, in the phrase of the Russian poet, the fighter's hand was tired of killing. The Russian government suddenly felt the need of passing over from the medieval forms of patronage to a more enlightened and perfected method. Among the leading statesmen of Russia were men, such as the Minister of Public Instruction, Sergius Ubarov, who were well acquainted with Western European ways and fully aware of the fact that the reactionary governments of Austria and Prussia had invented several contrivances for handling the Jewish problem, which might be usefully applied in their own country. Though anxious to avoid all contact with the rotten West and being in constant fear of European political movements, the Russian government was nevertheless ready to siege upon the relics of enlightened absolutism, which was still stalking about, particularly in Austria, in the early decades of the 19th century. As far as Prussia was concerned, the abundance of assimilated and converted Jews in that country and their attempts at religious reform, which to a missionary's imagination were identical with the change of front in favor of Christianity, 
had a fascination of its own for the Russian dignitaries. No wonder, then, that the government yielded to the temptation to use some of the contrivances of Western European reaction while holding in reserve the police knout of genuine Russian manufacture. In 1840, the Council of State was again busy discussing the Jewish question, this time from a theoretic point of view. The reports of the provincial administrator, in particular that of Bivikov, governor general of Kiev, dwelled on the fact that even the statute of 1835 had not succeeded in correcting the Jews. The root of the evil lay rather in their religious fanaticism and separatism, which could only be removed by changing their inner life. The ministers of public instruction and of the interior, Ubarov and Stroganov, took occasion to expound the principles of their new system of correction before the Council of State. The discussions culminated in a remarkable memorandum submitted by the Council to Nicholas I. In this document, the government confesses its importance in grappling with the defects of the Jewish masses, such as the absence of useful labor, their harmful pursuit of petty trading, vagrancy, and obstinate aloofness from general civic life. Its failure, the government ascribes to the fact that the evil of Jewish exclusiveness has hitherto not been attacked at its root, the latter being embedded in the religious and communal organization of the Jews. The fountainhead of all misfortunes is the Talmud, which fosters in the Jews utmost contempt toward the nations of other faiths and implants in them the desire to rule over the rest of the world. As a result of the obnoxious teachings of the Talmud, the Jews cannot but regard their presence in any other land except Palestine as a sojourn in captivity, and they are held to obey their own authorities rather than a strange government. This explains the omnipotence of the Kahals, which, contrary to the law of the state, employ secret means to uphold their autonomous authority both in communal and judicial matters, using for this purpose the uncontrolled sums of the special Jewish revenue, the meat tax. The education of the Jewish youth is entrusted to Melamed, a class of domestic teachers immersed in profoundest ignorance and superstition, and under the influence of these fanatics, the children imbibe pernicious notions of intolerance towards other nations. Finally, the special dress worn by the Jews helps to keep them apart from the surrounding Christian population. The Russian government had adopted a series of protective measures against the Jews without producing any marked effect. Even the conscription statute had succeeded to a limited extent only in alerting the habits of the Jews. Mere promotion of agriculture and of Russian schooling had been found inadequate. The expulsions from the villages had proved equally fruitless. The Jews, to be sure, have been ruined, but the conditions of the rustics had shown no improvements. It is evident, therefore, the Council declares, that restrictions which go only halfway or are externally imposed by the police are not sufficient to direct this huge mass of people towards useful occupations. With the patience of martyrs, the Jews of Western Europe had endured the most atrocious persecutions and had yet succeeded in keeping their national type intact until the government took the trouble to inquire more deeply into the causes separating the Jews from general civic life, so as to be able to attack the causes themselves. After blotting out the truth that the government's ultimate aim was the obliteration of the Jewish individuality and modestly yielding the palm in inflicting the most atrocious persecutions upon the Jews to Western Europe, where, after all, they were receding into the past, while in Russia, 
they were still the order of the day. The Council of State proceeds to consider the example set by foreign countries and lingers with particular affection over the Prussian regulation of 1797 issued by that country for its recently occupied Polish provinces, the Prussian Emancipation Edict of 1812. The memorandum very shrewdly passes over in silence and on the system of compulsory schooling adopted by Austria. Taking its clue from the West, the Council delineates three ways of bringing about a radical transformation of this people. 1. Cultural reforms, such as the establishment of special secular schools for Jewish youth, the fight against the old-fashioned headers and melamed, the transformation of the rabbinate, and the prohibition of Jewish dress. 2. Abolition of Jewish autonomy, consisting in the dissolution of the kahals and the modification of the system of special Jewish taxation. 3. Increase of Jewish disabilities by segregating from their midst all those who have no established domicile and are without a definite financial status with a view of subjecting them to disciplinary correction through expulsions, legal restrictions, intensified conscription, and similar police measures. In this manner, the memorandum concludes, it may be hoped that by coordinating all the particulars of this proposition with the fundamental idea of reforming the Jewish people and by taking compulsory measures to aid, the goal of the government will be attained. As a result of this expose of the Council of State, an imperial rescript was issued on December 27, 1840, calling for the establishment of a committee for defining measures looking to the radical transformation of the Jews of Russia. Count Kizelev, Minister of the Crown Domains, was appointed chairman. The other members included the Ministers of Public Instructions and the Interior, the Assistant Minister of Finance, the Director of the Second Section of the Imperial Chancellery, and the Chief of the Political Police were the dreaded Third Section. The latter was entrusted with special task to keep a watchful eye on the intrigues and actions which may be resorted to by the Jews during the execution of this matter. Moreover, the expose of the Council of State, which was to serve as the program of the new committee, was sent out to the Governors General of the Western Region confidentially for personal information and consideration. The reformatory campaign against the Jews was thus started without any formal declaration of war under the guise of secrecy and surrounded by police precautions. The procedure to be followed by the committee was to consider the project in the order indicated in the memorandum. First, enlightenment, then abolition of autonomy, and finally, disabilities. 2. Uvarov and Lilienthal an elaborate expose on the question of enlightenment was composed and laid before the committee by the Minister of Public Instruction, Sergius Uvarov. Having acquired the bon ton of Western Europe, Uvarov prefaces his statement by the remark that the European governments have abandoned the method of persecution and compulsion in solving the Jewish question, and that this period has also arrived for us. Nations, observes Uvarov, are not exterminated, least of all the nation which stood at the foot of Calvary. From what follows, it seems evident that the minister is still in hopes that the gentle measures of enlightenment may attract the Jews towards the religion which derives its origin from Calvary. The best among the Jews, he states, are conscious of the fact that one of the principal causes of their humiliation lies in the perverted interpretation of their religious tradition, that the Talmud demoralized and continues to demoralize their co-religionists. 
But nowhere is the influence of the Talmud so potent among us in Russia and in the Kingdom of Poland. This influence can be counteracted only by enlightenment, and the government can do no better than to act in the spirit that animates the handful of the best among them. The re-education of the learned section among the Jews involves at the same time the purification of their religious conceptions. What purification the author of the memorandum has in mind may be gathered from his casual remark that the Jews, who maintain their separatism, are rightly afraid of reforms. For is it not the religion of the cross the purest symbol of universal citizenship? This, however, Uvarov cautiously adds, should not be made public, for it would have no other effect except that of arousing from the very beginning the opposition of the majority of the Jews against the projected schools. Officially, the reform must confine itself to the opening in all the cities of the Jewish pale of elementary and secondary schools in which Jewish children should be taught the Russian language, secular sciences, Hebrew, and religion according to the Holy Writ. The instruction should be given in Russian, though owing to the shortage in teachers familiar with this language, the use of German is to be admitted temporarily. The teachers in the lower grade schools shall provisionally be recruited from among melamed who can be depended upon. Those in the higher grade schools shall be chosen from among the modernized Jews of Russia and Germany. The committee endorsed Uvarov's scheme in its principal features and urgently recommended that, in order to prepare the Jewish masses for the impending reform, a special propagandist be sent into the Pale of Settlement for the purpose of acquainting this obstreperous nation with the benevolent intentions of the government. Such a propagandist was soon found in the person of young German Jew, Dr. Max Lilienthal, a resident of Riga. Lilienthal, who was a native of Bavaria, he was born in Munich in 1815, and the German university graduate was a typical representative of the German Jewish intellectual of that period, a champion of assimilation and of moderate religious reform. Lilienthal had scarcely completed his university course when he was offered by a group of educated Jews in Riga the post of preacher and director of the new local Jewish school, one of the three modern Jewish schools than in existence in Russia. In a short time, Lilienthal managed to raise the instruction in secular and Jewish subjects to such a high standard of modernity that he elicited a glowing tribute from Uvarov. The minister was struck by the idea that the Riga school might serve as a model for the net of schools with which he was about to cover the whole pale of settlement, and Lilienthal seemed the logical man for carrying out the planned reforms. In February 1841, Lilienthal was summoned to St. Petersburg, where he had a prolonged conversation with Uvarov. According to the testimony of the official Russian sources, he tried to persuade the minister to abolish all private schools, the headers, and to forbid all private teachers, the melamets, to teach even temporarily in the projected new schools, and to import, instead, the whole teaching staff from Germany. Lilienthal himself tells us in his memoir that he made bold to remind the minister that all obstacles in the path of the desired re-education of the Russian Jews would disappear were the Tsar to grant them complete emancipation. To this, the minister retorted that the initiative must come from the Jews themselves, who first must try to deserve the favor of the sovereign. At any rate, Lilienthal accepted the proffered task. He was commissioned to tour the Pale of Settlement to organize there the few isolated progressive Jews, the lovers of enlightenment, or 
Maskelim, as they styled themselves, and to propagate the idea of a school reform among the Orthodox Jewish masses. While setting out his journey, Lilienthal himself did not fully realize the difficulties of the task he had undertaken. He was to instill confidence in the benevolent intentions of the government into the heart of a people which, by an uninterrupted series of persecutions and cruel restrictions, had been reduced to the level of periods. He was to make them believe that the government was well-wisher of Jewish children, those same children who at that very time were hunted like wild beasts by the captors in the streets of the Pale, who were turned by the thousands into soldiers, deported into outlying provinces, and belabored in such a manner that scarcely half of them remained alive and barely a tenth remained within the Jewish fold. Guided by an infallible instinct, the plain Jewish people formulated their own simplified theory to account for the step taken by the government. Up to the present, their children had been baptized through the barracks. In the future, they would be baptized through the additional medium of the school. Lilienthal arrived in Vilna in the beginning of 1842 and, calling a meeting of the Jewish community, explained the plan conceived by the government and by Uvarov, the friend of the Jews. He was listened to with unveiled distrust. The elders, Lilienthal tells us in his memoirs, sat there absorbed in deep contemplation. Some of them, leaning on their silver-adorned steps or smoothing their long beards, seemed as if agitated by honest thoughts and justifiable suspicions. Others were engaging in a lively but quiet discussions on the principles involved. Such put to me the ominous question, Doctor, are you fully acquainted with the leading principles of our government? You are a stranger. Do you know what you are undertaking? The course pursued against all denomination but the Greek proves clearly that the government intends to have but one church in the whole empire, that it has in view only its own future strength and greatness and not our own future prosperity. We are sorry to state that we put no confidence in the new measures proposed by the ministerial council and that we look with gloomy foreboding into the future. In his reply, Lilienthal advanced an impressive array of arguments. What will you gain by your resistance to the new measures? It will only irritate the government and will determine it to pursue its system of repression, while at present you are offered an opportunity to prove that the Jews are not enemies of culture and deserve a better lot. When questioned as to whether the Jewish community had any guarantee that the government plan was not a veiled attempt to undermine the Jewish religion, Lilienthal, by way of reply, solemnly pledged himself to throw off his mission the moment he would find that the government associated with it secret intentions against Judaism. The circle of enlightened Jews in Vilna pledged its support to Lilienthal, and he left full of faith in the success of his enterprise. A cruel disappointment awaited him in Minsk. Here, the arguments which the opponent advanced in a passionate debate at the public meeting were of a utilitarian rather than of an idealistic nature. So long as the government does not accord equal rights to the Jews, General culture will only be his misfortune. The plain uneducated Jew does not balk at the low occupation of factor or peddler, for, drawing comfort and joy from his religion, he is reconciled to his miserable lot. But the Jew, who is educated and enlightened, and yet has no means of occupying an honorable position in the country, will be moved by a feeling of discontent to renounce his religion, and no honest father will think of giving an education to his children, which may lead to such an issue. The opponents of official enlightenment in Minsk 
were not content with advancing arguments that appealed to reason. Both at the meetings and in the street, Lilienthal was the target of insulting remarks from the crowd. On his return to St. Petersburg, Lilienthal presented Uvarov with a report which convinced the minister that the execution of the school reform was a difficult but not a hopeless task. On June 22, 1842, an imperial rescript was issued placing all Jewish schools, including the headers and yeshivas, under the supervision of the Ministry of Public Instruction. Simultaneously, it was announced that the government had summoned a commission of four rabbis to meet in St. Petersburg for the purpose of supporting the efforts of the government in the realization of the school reform. This committee was to serve Russian Jewry as a security that the school reforms would not be directed against the Jewish religion. At the same time, Lilienthal was ordered to proceed again to the Pale of Settlement. He was directed to tour principally through the southwestern and new Russian governments and exert his influence upon the Jewish masses in accordance with the instructions received from the ministry. Before setting out on his journey, Lilienthal published a Hebrew pamphlet under the title Magid Yeshua, Herald of Salvation, which called upon the Jewish communities to comply readily with the wishes of the government. In his private letters addressed to prominent Jews, Lilienthal expressed the assurance that the school ukase was merely the forerunner of a series of measures for the betterment of the civic status of the Jews. This time, Lilienthal met with a greater measure of success than on his first journey. In several large centers, such as Berdichev, Odessa, Kishinev, he was accorded a friendly welcome and assured of the cooperation of the communities in making the new school system a success. Filled with fresh hopes, Lilienthal returned in 1843 to St. Petersburg to participate in the work of the Rabbinical Commission, which had been convoked by the government and was now holding its sessions in the capital from May till August. The makeup of the Rabbinical Commission did not fully justify its appellation. Only two ecclesiastics were on it, the president of the Talmudic Academy of Volodzin, Rabbi Itzok Isaac Itzaki and the leader of the White Russian Hasidim, Rabbi Mendel Schneerson, while the southwestern region and New Russia had sent two laymen, the banker Halperin of Berdichev and the director of the Jewish school in Odessa, Bezalel Stone. The two representatives of the clergy put up a warm defense for the traditional Jewish school, the header, endeavoring to save it from the ministerial supervision, which aimed at its annihilation. Finally, a compromise was effected. The traditional header was to be left intact for the time being, but the proposed crown school was to be given full scope in competing with it. The commission even went so far as to work out a program of Jewish studies for the new type of school. The labors of the Rabbinical Commission were submitted to the Jewish Committee under the chairmanship of Kezelev and discussed by it in connection with the general plan of Russian school reform. It was necessary to find resultant between two opposing forces, between the desire of the government to substitute the Russian crown school for the old-fashioned Jewish school and the determination of Russian Jewry to preserve its own school as a bulwark against the official institutions foisted upon it. The government was bent on carrying out its policy and found itself compelled to resort to diplomatic contrivances. On November 13, 1844, Nicholas signed two enactments the one a public ukase relating to the education of the Jewish youth, the other a confidential rescript addressed to the Minister of Public Instruction. 
the public enactment called for the establishment of Jewish schools of two grades, corresponding to the courses of instruction in the parochial and county schools, and ordered the opening of two rabbinical institutes for the training of rabbis and teachers. The teaching staff in the Jewish crown schools was to consist both of Jews and Christians. The graduates of these schools were granted a reduction in the term of military service. The execution of the school reforms in the respective localities was placed in the hands of school boards composed of Jews and Christians, which were to be appointed provisionally for that purpose. In the secret rescript, the tone was altogether different. There it was stated that the aim pursued in the training of the Jews is that of bringing them nearer to the Christian population and eradicating the prejudices fostered in them by the study of the Talmud. That with the opening of the new schools, the old ones were to be gradually closed or reorganized. And that as soon as the crown schools have been established in sufficient numbers, Attendance at them would become obligatory, that the superintendents of the new schools should only be chosen from among Christians, that every possible effort should be made to put obstacles in the way of granting teaching licenses to the Melamites who lacked a secular education, that after the lapse of 20 years, no one should hold the position of teacher or rabbi without having obtained his degree from one of the official rabbinical schools. It was not long, however, before the secret came out. The Russian Jews were terror-stricken at the thought of being robbed of their ancient school autonomy and decided to adopt the well-tried tactics of passive resistance to all government measures. The school reform was making slow progress. The opening of the elementary schools and of the two rabbinical institutes in Vilna and Zitomir did not begin until 1847, and for the first few years they dragged on a miserable existence. Lilienthal himself disappeared from the scene without waiting for the consummation of the reform plan. In 1845, he suddenly abandoned his post at the Ministry of Public Instruction and left Russia forever. A more intimate acquaintance with the intentions of the leading government circles had made Lilienthal realize that the apprehensions voiced in his presence by the old men of the Vilna community were well founded, and he thought it his duty to fulfill the pledge given by him publicly. From the land of serfdom, where, to use Lilienthal's own world, the only way for the Jew to make peace with the government was by bowing down before the Greek cross. He went to the land of freedom, the United States of America. There he occupied important pulpits in New York and Cincinnati, where he died in 1882. End of section 4《Section 5 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland》Volume 2 From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III 1825 to 1894 By Shimon Dubnov Translated by Israel Friedlander This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by S.S. Kim Seoul, South Korea Chapter 14 Compulsory Enlightenment and Increased Oppression Part 2 3. The Abolition of Jewish Autonomy and Renewed Persecutions No sooner had the school reform, which was tantamount to the abrogation of Jewish school autonomy, been publicly announced than the government took steps to realize the second article of its program, the annihilation of the remnants of Jewish communal autonomy. A new case published on December 19, 1844, ordered the placing of the Jews in the cities and countries 
under the jurisdiction of the general, i.e., Russian administration, with the abolition of the Kahals. By this new case, all the administrative functions of the Kahals were turned over to the police departments and those of an economic and fiscal character to the municipalities and town councils. The old elective Kahal administration was to pass out of existence. Carried to its logical conclusions, this reform would necessarily have led, as it actually did lead in Western Europe, to the abolition of the Jewish community outside the narrow limits of a synagogue parish. Had the Jews of Russia been placed at the same time on a footing of equality in regard to taxation? But such European consistency was beyond the mental range of Russian autocracy. It was neither willing to abandon the special and for the Jews doubly burdensome method of conscription, nor to forego the extra levies imposed upon the Jews over and above the general state taxes for needs which, properly speaking, should have been met by the exchequer. Thus, it came about that for the sake of maintaining Jewish disabilities in the matter of conscription and taxation, the government itself was obliged to mitigate the blow at Jewish autonomy by allowing the institutions of Jewish conscription trustees and tax collectors elected by the Jewish communes from among the most dependable men to remain in force. The government, moreover, found it necessary to establish a special department for Jewish affairs at each municipality and town council. In this way, the law managed to destroy the self-government of the Kahal and yet preserve its rudimentary function as an autonomous fiscal agency which was to be continued under the auspices of the municipality. In point of fact, the Kahal, which through its trustees and captors had acted the part of a government tool in carrying out the dreadful military conscription, had long become thoroughly demoralized and had lost its former prestige as a great Jewish institution. Its transformation into a purely fiscal agency was merely the formal ratification of a sad fact. Having disposed of the cars as a vehicle of Jewish separatism, the government next attacked the special Jewish system of taxation, not to abolish it, of course, but rather to place it under a more rigorous control for the purpose of preventing it from serving in the hands of the Jews as an instrument for the attainment of specific Jewish ends. It is significant that on the same day on which the Kahal U case was made public was also issued the new regulation concerning the basket tax. The revenue from this tax, which had for a long time been imposed upon kosher meat, was originally placed at the free disposal of the Kahals, though subject since 1839 to the combined control of the administration and municipality. According to the new enactment, the proceeds from the meat tax, which was to be led to the highest bidder, were to be left entirely in the hands of the gubernatorial administration. The latter was instructed to see to it that the income from the tax should first be applied to cover the fiscal arrears of the Jews, then to provide for the maintenance of the crown schools and the official promotion of agriculture among Jews, and only as a last item to be spent on the local charities. In addition to the general basket tax imposed upon all Jews who used kosher meat, an auxiliary basket tax was instituted to be levied on immovable property as well as on business pursuits and bequests. Moreover, following the Austrian model, the government instituted, or rather reinstituted, the candle tax, a toll on Sabbath candles. The proceeds from this impost on a religious ceremony were to go specifically towards the organization of the Jewish crown schools and were placed entirely at the disposal of the Ministry of Public Instruction. 
Thus, in exact proportion to the curtailment of communal autonomy, voluntary self-taxation was gradually supplanted by compulsory government taxation, a circumstance which not only increased the financial burden of the Jewish masses, but also tended to aggravate it from a moral point of view. The tax, as the meat tax was called for short, became in the course of time one of the scourges of Jewish communal life, that same life which the measures of the government had merely succeeded in disorganizing. Anxious as the government was to act diplomatically, and for fear of intensifying the distrust of Russian Jewry towards the new scheme, to stem the flood of restriction during the execution of the school reform, it could not long restrain itself. The third plank in the platform of the Jewish committee, the increase of Jewish disabilities, which had hitherto been kept in reserve, was now pressing forward and issued forth from the recesses of the chancelleries somewhat earlier than tactical consideration might have dictated. On April 20, 1843, while the Enlightenment propaganda was in full swing, there suddenly appeared in the form of a resolution appended by the Tsar's own hand to the report of the Council of Ministers the following curt ukase. All Jews living within the 50 verst zone along the Prussian and Austrian frontier are to be transferred into the interior of the border governments. Those possessing their own houses are to be granted a term of two years within which to sell them, to be carried out without any excuses. On the receipt of this green command, the Senate was at first puzzled as to whether the imperial order was a mere repetition of the former law concerning the expulsion of the Jews from the villages and hamlets on the frontier, or whether it was a new law involving the expulsion of all Jews on the border without discrimination, including those in the cities and towns. Swayed by the harsh and emphatic tone of the imperial resolution, the Senate decided to interpret the new order in the sense of a complete and absolute expulsion. This interpretation received the Tsar's approbation, except that the time limit for the expulsion of real estate owners was extended for two years more, and the ruined exiles were promised temporary relief from taxation. The new catastrophe, which descended upon tens of thousands of families, particularly in the government of Kovno, caused a cry of horror, not only throughout the border zone, but also abroad. When the Jews doomed to expulsion were ordered by the police to state places whither they intend to emigrate, 19 communities refused to comply with this demand and declared that they would not abandon their hearts and the graves of their forefathers and would only yield to force. Public opinion in Western Europe were running high with indignation. The French, German, and English papers condemned in no uncertain terms the Polish of New Spain. Many Jewish communities in Germany petitioned the Russian government to revoke the terrible expulsion decree. There was even an attempt at diplomatic intervention. During this stay in England, Nicholas I was approached on behalf of the Jews by personage of high rank. Yet the government would scarcely have yielded to public protest had it not become patent that it was impossible to carry out the decree without laying waste entire cities and thereby affecting injuriously the interest of the exchequer. The fatal UK case was not officially repealed, but government did not insist on its execution. In the meantime, the Jewish committee kept up a correspondence with the governors general in regard to the ways and means of carrying into effect the third article of its program, the assortment or classification of the Jews. The plan called for the division of all Russian Jews into two categories, into useful and useless ones. The former category was to consist of merchants affiliated with guilds, artisans belonging to trade unions, agriculturists, 
and those of the burgher class who owned immovable property with a definite income. All other burghers who could not claim such a financial status and had no definite income, in other words, the large mass of petty tradesmen and paupers, were to be labeled as useless or detrimental and subjected to increased disabilities. The inquiry of the Ministry of the Interior regarding the feasibility of such an assortment met with a strongly worded rebuttal from the Governor-General of New Russia, Voronsov. While on a leave of absence in London, this Russian dignitary, who had evidently been affected by English ideas, prepared a memorandum and sent it in October 1843 to St. Petersburg with the request to have it submitted to the Tsar. I ventured to think, quote Voronsov with reference to the projected segregation of the useless Jews, that the application of the term useless to several hundred thousand people who, by the will of the Almighty, have lived in this empire from ancient times is in itself both cruel and unjust. The project labels as useless all those numerous Jews who are engaged either in the retail purchase of goods from their original manufacturers for delivery to wholesale merchants or in the useful distribution among the consumers of the merchandise obtained from the wholesalers. Judging impartially, one cannot help wondering how these numerous tradesmen can be regarded as useless and consequently as detrimental if one bears in mind that by their petty and frequently maligned pursuits they promote not only rural but also commercial life. The atrocious scheme of assaulting the Jews is nailed down by Voronsov as a bloody operation over a whole class of people which is threatened not only with hardship but also with annihilation through poverty. I venture to think, with these words, Voronsov concludes his memorandum that this measure is both harmful and cruel. On the one side, hundreds of thousands of hands which assist petty industry in the provinces will be turned aside when there is no possibility and for a long time there will be none of replacing them. On the other side, the cries and moans of such an enormous number of unfortunates will serve as a reproach to our government, not only in our own country, but also beyond the confines of Russia. Since the time of Speransky and the like-minded members of the Jewish Committee of 1803 and 1812, the leading spheres of St. Petersburg had had no chance to hear such courageous and truthful words. Voronsov's objection implied a crushing criticism of the whole fallacious economic policy of the government in branding the petty tradesmen and middlemen as an injurious element and building their own, a whole system of anti-Jewish persecution and cruelties. But St. Petersburg was not amenable to reason. The only concession wrested from the Jewish committee consisted in replacing the term useless as applied to small tradesmen by the designation not engaged in productive labor. The cruel project continued to engage the attention of the Jewish committee for a long time. In April 1815, the chairman of the committee, Kiselev, addressed a circular to the governor's general in which he pointed out that after the promulgation of the laws concerning the establishment of crown schools and the abolition of the cars, laws which were aimed at the weakening of the influence of the Talmud and the destruction of all institutions fostering the separate individuality of the Jews, the turn had come for carrying into effect by means of the proposed classification, the measures directed towards the transfer of the Jews to useful labor. Of the regulations tending to affect the Jews culturally, the circular emphasizes the prohibition of Jewish dress 
to take effect after the lapse of five years. All the regulations alluded to, Kiselev writes, have been issued and will be issued separately in order to conceal their interrelations and common aim from the fanaticism of the Jews. For this reason, His Imperial Majesty has been graciously pleased to command me to communicate all their said plans to the Governors General confidentially. It would seem, however, that the Russian authorities had grossly underestimated the political sense of the Jews. They were not aware of the fact that St. Petersburg's conspiracy against Judaism had long been exposed in the pale of settlement, if only for the reason that the conspirators were not clever enough to hide even for a time the chastising knout beneath the cloak of the cultural reforms. 4. Intercession of Western European Jewry The mask of the Russian government was soon torn down also before the eyes of Western Europe. In the initial stage of Lilienthal's campaign, public-minded Jews of Western Europe were inclined to believe that a happy era was drawing upon their co religionists in Russia. At the instance of Uvarov, Lilienthal had entered into correspondence with Philipson, Geiger, Kremio, Montefiore, and other leaders of West European Jewry, bespeaking their moral support on behalf of the school reform and going so far as to invite them to participate in the proceedings of the rabbinical commission convened at St. Petersburg. The replies from these prominent Jews were full of complimentary references to Uvarov's endeavors. The Allgemeine Zeitung des Judentums, in the beginning of the 40s, voiced the general belief that the era of persecution in Russia had come to an end. The frontier expulsions of 1843 acted like a cold douche on these enthusiasts. They realized that the pitiless banishment of thousands of families from home and hearth was not altogether compatible with benevolent intentions. A sensational piece of news made its rounds through Germany. The well-known painter Oppenheim of the Frankfurt on the Main had given up working at the large picture ordered by the leaders of several Jewish communities for the presentation to the Tsar. The painting had been intended as an allegory, picturing a sunrise in a dark realm, but the happy anticipations proved will or the wisp, and the plan had to be given up. Instead, Western Europe was resounding with moans from Russia, betokening new persecutions and even more atrocious schemes of restrictions. The sufferings of the Russian Jews suggested the thought that it was the duty of the influential Jews of the West to intercede on behalf of their persecuted brethren before the Emperor of Russia. The choice fell on the famous Jewish philanthropist in London, Sir Moses Montefiore, who stood in close relations to the court of King Victoria. Having established his fame by championing the Jewish cause in Turkey during the ritual murder trial of Damascus in 1840, Montefiore resolved to make a similar attempt in the land of the Tsar. In the beginning of 1846, he set out for Russia, ostensibly in the capacity of a traveler desirous of familiarizing himself with the conditions of his co religionists Montefiore, who was the bearer of a personal recommendation from Queen Victoria to the Russian emperor, was received in St. Petersburg with great honors. During an audience granted to Montefiore in March 1846, the Tsar expressed his willingness to receive from him, through the medium of the Jewish committee, suggestions bearing on the condition of the Russian Jews based on the information to be gathered by him on his travels. Montefiore's journey through the Pale of Settlement, including a visit to Vilna, Warsaw, and other cities, was marked by great solemnity. He was courteously received by the highest local officials who acted according to instructions from St. Petersburg, and he met everywhere with an enthusiastic welcome from the Jewish masses who expected great results from his intercession before the Tsar. 
Needless to say, these expectations were not realized. On his return to London, Montefiore addressed various petitions to Kiselev, the chairman of the Jewish Committee, to Minister Uvarov, and to Paskevich, the then viceroy of Poland. Everywhere he pleaded for a mitigation of the harsh laws which were pressing upon his unfortunate brethren, for the restoration of the recently abolished communal autonomy, for the harmonization of the school reform with the religious traditions of the Jewish masses. The Tsar was informed of the contents of these petitions, but it was all of no avail. In the same year, another influential foreigner made an unsuccessful attempt to improve the condition of the Russian Jews by emigration. A rich Jewish merchant of Marseille named Isaac Altaras came to Russia with a proposal to transplant a certain number of Jews to Algiers, which had recently passed under French rule. Fortified by letters of recommendation from Premier Guizot and other high officials in France, Altaras entered into negotiations with the ministers Nesselrode and Perovsky in St. Petersburg and with Viceroy Paskevich in Warsaw for the purpose of obtaining permission for a certain number of Jews to emigrate from Russia. He gave the assurance that the French government was ready to admit into Algiers a full-fledged citizens, thousands of destitute Russian Jews, and that the means for transferring them would be provided by lost child banking house in Paris. At first, while in St. Petersburg, Altaras was informed that permission to leave Russia would be granted only on the condition that a fixed ransom be paid for every emigrant. In Warsaw, however, which city he visited later, in October 1846, he was notified that the Tsar had decided to waive the ransom. For some unexplained reason, Altaras left Russia suddenly, and the scheme of a Jewish mass emigration fell through. 5. The economic plight of Russian Jewry and agricultural experiments The attempt at thinning the Jewish population by emigration having failed, the congested Jewish masses continued to gasp for air in their pale of settlement. The slightest effort to penetrate beyond the pale into the interior was treated as a criminal offense. In December 1847, the Council of State engaged in a protracted and honest discussion about the geographical point up to which the Jewish coachmen of Plotsk should be allowed to drive the inmates of the local school of cadets on their annual trip to the Russian capital. The discussion arose out of the fact that the road leading from Brodsk to St. Petersburg is crossed by lines separating the pale from the prohibited interior. A proposal had been made to permit the coachmen to drive their passengers as far as Pushkov, but when the report was submitted to the Tsar, he appended the following resolution, agreeable, though not to Pushkov, but Ostrov the town nearest to the pale. On this trivial kind were Russia's method in curtailing Jewish rights three months before the great upheaval, which, in adjoining Germany and Austria, dealt the death blow to absolutism and inaugurated the era of the Second Emancipation. As for the economic life of the Jews, it had been completely undermined by the system of ruthless tutelage which the government had employed for a quarter of a century in the hope of reconstructing it. All these drumhead methods, such as the hurling of masses of living beings from villages into towns and from the border zones into the interior, the prohibition of certain occupations and the artificial promotions of others, could not but result in economic ruin instead of leading to economic reform. Nor was the government system of encouraging agriculture among Jews attended by greater success. In consequence of the expulsion of tens of thousands of Jews from the villages of White Russia in 1823, some 2,000 refugees had drifted into the agricultural colonies of New Russia, but all they did was to replace the human vestige 
from increased mortality, which, owing to the change of climate and the unaccustomed condition of rural life, had decimated the original settlers. During the reign of Nicholas, efforts were again made to promote agricultural colonization by offering the prospective immigrants subsidies and alleviations in taxation. Even more valuable was the privilege of relieving the colonists from military service for a term of 25 to 50 years from the time of settlement. Yet, only a few tried to escape conscription by taking refuge in the colonies. For the military regime gradually penetrated into these colonies as well. The Jewish colonist was subject to the grim tutelage of Russian curators and superintendents, retired army men who watched his every step and punished the slightest carelessness by conscription or expulsion. In 1836, the government conceived the idea of enlarging the area of Jewish agricultural colonization. By an imperial rescript, certain lands in Siberia, situated in the government of Tobolsk and in the territory of Omsk, were set aside for this purpose. Within a short time, 1,317 Jews declared their readiness to settle on the new lands. Many had actually started on their way in batches. But in January 1837, the Tsar quite unexpectedly changed his mind. After reading the reports of the Council of Ministers on the first results of the immigration, he put down the resolution. The transplantation of Jews to Siberia is to be stopped. A few months later, orders were issued to intercept those Jews who were on their way to Siberia and transfer them to the Jewish colonies in the government of Kherson. The unfortunate immigrants were seized on the way and conveyed like criminals under a military escort into places in which they were not in the least interested. Legislative whims of this kind, coupled with uncouth system of tutelage, were quite sufficient to crush in many Jews the desire of turning to the soil. Nevertheless, the colonization made slow progress, gradually spreading from the government of Kherson to the neighboring governments of Yekaterinoslav and Bessarabia. Stray Jewish agricultural settlements also appeared in Lithuania and White Russia, but a comparative handful of some 10,000 Jewish peasants could not affect the general economic makeup of millions of Jews. In spite of all shocks, the economic structure of Russian Jewry remained essentially the same. As before, the central place in this structure was occupied by the liquor traffic, though modified in a certain measure by the introduction of more extensive system of public leases. Above the rank and file of tavern keepers, both rural and urban, there had arisen a class of wealthy tax farmers who kept the monopoly on the sale of liquor or the collection of excise in various governments of the pale. They functioned as the financial agents of the exchequer, while the Jewish employees in their mills, storehouses, and offices acted as their sub-agents, forming a class of officials of their own. The place next in importance to the liquor traffic was occupied by retail and wholesale commerce. The crafts and the spiritual professions came last. Pauperism was the inevitable companion of this economic organization, and people without definite occupations were counted by the hundreds of thousands. End of section 5section 6 of history of the jews in russia and poland volume 2 from the death of alexander the first until the death of alexander the third 1825 to 1894 by shimon dunov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ss kim seoul south korea chapter 14 Compulsory Enlightenment and Increased Oppression Part 3 
6. The Ritual Murder Trial of Veliz The ordinary persecutions under which the Jews in Russia were groaning were accompanied by afflictions of an extraordinary kind. The severest among these were the ritual murder trials, which became of frequent occurrence, tending to deepen the medieval gloom of that period. True, ritual murder cases had occurred during the reign of Alexander I, but it was only under Nicholas that they assumed a malign and dangerous form. In the year 1816, shortly before Passover, a dead body was found in the vicinity of Grodno and identified as that of the four-year-old daughter of a Grodno resident, Mary Adamovich. Rumors were spread among the superstitious Christian populace to the effect that the girl had been killed for ritual purposes, and the police, swayed by these rumors, set about to find the culprits among the Jews. Suspicion fell on a member of the Grodno Kahal, Shalom Lapin, whose house adjoined that of the Adamovich family. The only evidence against him were a hammer and pike found in his house. A sergeant named Savitsky, a converted Jew, appeared as a material witness before the commission of inquiry and delivered himself of a statement full of ignorant trash which was intended to show that Christian blood is exactly what is needed according to the Jewish religion. Here, the witness referred to the Bible story of the Exodus and to two mythical authorities, the philosopher Rossier and the prophet Azariah. He further disposed that every rabbi is obliged to satisfy the whole kahal under his jurisdiction, by smearing with same, with Christian blood, the lintels of every house on the first day of the Feast of Passover. Prompted by greed and by the desire to distinguish himself, the sergeant declared himself ready to substantiate his testimony from Jewish literature if the chief government will grant him the necessary assistance. The results of this secret investigation were laid before the governor of Grodno and reported by him to St. Petersburg. In reply, Alexander I issued a rescript in February 1817, ordering that the secret investigation be cut short and the murderer be found out, intimating thereby that search be made for the criminal and not for the tenets of the Jewish religion. However, all efforts to discover the culprit failed, and the case was dismissed. This favorable issue was in no small measure due to the endeavors of the deputies of the Jewish people, in particular to Zonenberg, the deputy from Grodno. These deputies, who were present in St. Petersburg at the time, addressed themselves to Golitsyn, the minister of ecclesiastic affairs, protesting against the ritual murder libel. The trial at Grodno and the ritual murder accusations, which simultaneously cropped up in the Kingdom of Poland, made the Minister of Ecclesiastic Affairs realize that there is in the Western region a dangerous tendency of making the Jews the scapegoats for every mysterious murder case and of fabricating lawsuits of the medieval variety by bringing popular superstition into play. Golitsyn, a Christian pietist, who was nevertheless profoundly averse to narrow ecclesiastic fanaticism, decided to strike at the root of this superstitious legend, which was disgracing Poland in a period of decay and was about to fall as a dark stain upon Russia. He succeeded in impressing this conviction upon his like-minded sovereign Alexander I. In the same month in which the U case concerning the Society of Israelitish Christians was published, Golitsyn sent out the following circular to the governors, dated March 6, 1817. In view of the fact that in several of the provinces acquired from Poland, cases still occur in which the Jews are falsely accused of murdering Christian children, 
for the alleged purpose of obtaining blood. His Imperial Majesty, taking into consideration that similar accusations have on previously numerous occasions been refuted by impartial investigations and royal charters, has been graciously pleased to convey to those at the head of the government his sovereign will that henceforward the Jews shall not be charged with murdering Christian children without any evidence and purely as a result of the superstitious belief that they are in need of Christian blood. One might have thought that this emphatic rescript would suffice to put a stop to the efforts of ignorant adventurers to resuscitate the bloody myth. And for several years, indeed, the sinister agitation kept quiet. But towards the end of Alexander's reign, it came to life again and gave rise to the monstrous Velez case. In the year 1823, on the first day of the Christian Passover, a boy of three years, Theodor Emelianov, the son of a Russian soldier, disappeared in the city of Veliz in the government of Vitebsk. Ten days later, the child's body was found in a swamp beyond the town, stepped all over and covered with wounds. The medical examination and the preliminary investigation were influenced by the popular belief that the child had been tortured to death by the Jews. This belief was fostered by two Christian fortune tellers, a prostitute beggar woman called Mary Terentieva and a half-witted old maid by the name of Yeremia Yeva, who by way of divination made the parents of the child believe that its death was due to the Jews. At the judicial inquiry, Terentieva implicated two of the most prominent Jews of Veliz, the merchant Shmerica Berlin and Yevzik Zetlin, a member of the local town council. Protracted investigation failed to substantiate the fabrications of Terentieva, and in the autumn of 1884, the Supreme Court of the Government of Vitebsk rendered the following verdict. To leave the accidental death of the soldier boy to the will of God. To declare all the Jews against whom the charge of murder has been brought on mere surmises free from all suspicion. To turn over the soldier woman Terentieva for her profligate conduct to a priest for repentance. However, in view of the exceptional gravity of the crime, the court recommended to the gubernatorial administration to continue its investigation. Despite the verdict of the court, the dark forces among the local population, prompted by hatred of the Jews, bent all their efforts on putting the investigation on a wrong track. The law mercenary Terentieva became their ready tool. When in September 1825, Alexander I was passing through Veliz, she submitted a petition to him complaining about the failure of the authorities to discover the murderer of the little Theodor, whom she unblushingly designated as her own child and declared to have been tortured to death by the Jews. The Tsar, entirely oblivious of his UK's of 1817, instructed the White Russian Governor-General Kovansky to start a new rigorous inquiry. The imperial order gave the Governor-General, who was a Jew-hater and a believer in the hideous libel, unrestricted scope for his anti-Semitic instincts. He entrusted the conduct of the new investigation to a subaltern by the name of Strakov, a man of the same ilk, conferring upon him the widest possible powers. On his arrival in Veliz, Strakov first of all arrested Terentieva and subjected her to a series of cross-examinations during which he endeavored to put her on what he considered the desirable track. Stimulated by the prosecutor, the prostitute managed to concoct a regular crime romance. She deposed that she herself had participated in the crime, having lured little Theodor into the homes of Zetlin and Berlin. In Berlin's house and later on in the synagogue, a crowd of Jews of both sexes had subjected the child 
to the most horrible tortures. The boy had been stabbed and butchered and rolled about in a barrel. The blood squeezed out of him had been distributed on the spot among those present who thereupon proceeded to soak pieces of linen in it and to pour it out in bottles. All these torturers had been perpetrated in her own presence and with the active participation both of herself and the Christian servant girls of the two families. It may be added that Terentieva did not make this statement at one time, but at different intervals, inventing fresh details at each new examination and often getting muddled in a story. The implicated servant girls at first denied their share in the crime, but yielding to external pressure, like Terentieva, they too were sent for frequent admonition to a local priest called Tarashkevich, a ferocious anti-Semite. They were gradually led to endorse the depositions of the principal material witness. On the strength of these indictments, Strakov placed the implicated Jews under arrest, at first two highly esteemed ladies, Slava Berlin and Hannah Zetlin, later on their husbands and relatives, and finally a number of other Jewish residents of Belize. In all, 42 people were seized, put in chains, and thrown into jail. The prisoners were examined with uh, vengeance. They were subjected to the old-fashioned judicial procedure, which approached closely the method of medieval torture. The prisoners denied their guilt with indignation, and when confronted with Terentieva, denounced her vehemently as a liar. The excruciating cross-examinations brought some of the prisoners to the verge of madness. But as far as Strakov was concerned, the hysterical fits of the women, the angry speeches of the men, the remarks of some of the accused, such as, I shall tell everything, but only to the Tsar, served in his eyes as evidence of the Jews' guilt. In his reports, he assured his superior, Kovansky, that he had got on the track of a monstrous crime perpetrated by a whole kahal with the assistance of several Christian women who had been led astray by the Jews. In communicating his findings to St. Petersburg, the white Russian governor-general presented the case as a crime committed on religious grounds. In reply, he received the fatal resolution of Emperor Nicholas, dated August 16, 1828, to the following effect. Whereas the above occurrence demonstrates that the Zid make wicked use of the religious tolerance accorded to them, therefore, as a warning and as an example to others, let the Jewish schools, the synagogues of Veliz, be sealed up until further orders and let services be forbidden, whether in them or near them. The imperial resolution was couched in the fierce language of the new reign, which had begun in the meantime. It rose in the bloody mist of the Veliz affair. The fatal consequences of this synchronism were not limited to the Jews of Veliz. Judging by the contents and the harsh wording of the resolution, Nicholas I was convinced at that time of the truth of the ritual murder libel. The mysterious and unloved tribe rose before the vision of the new Tsar as a band of cannibals and evildoers. This sinister notion can be traced in the conscription statute, which was then in the course of preparation in St. Petersburg and was soon afterwards to stir Russian Jewry to its depths, dooming their little ones to martyrdom. While punishment was to be meted out to the entire Jewish population of Russia, the fate of the Veliz community was particularly tragic. It was subjected to the terrors of a unique state of siege. The whole community was placed under suspicion. All the synagogues were shut up as if they were dens of thieves, and the hapless Jews could not even assemble in prayer 
to pour out their hearts before God. All business was at a standstill, the shops were closed, and gloomy faces flitted shyly across the streets of the doomed city. The stern command from St. Petersburg ordering that the case be positively probed to the bottom and that the culprits be apprehended gladdened only the hearts of Strakov, the chairman of the Commission of Inquiry, who was now free to do as he pleased. He spread out the net of inquiry in ever wider circles. Terentieva and the other female witnesses who were fed well while in prison and expected not only amnesty but also remuneration for their services gave more and more vent to their imagination. They recollected and revealed before the Commission of Inquiry a score of religious crimes which they alleged had been perpetrated by the Jews prior to the Veliz affair, such as the murder of children in suburban inns, the desecration of church utensils and similar misdeeds. The Commission was not slow in communicating the new revelation to the Tsar, who followed vigilantly the development in the case. But the Commission had evidently overreached itself. The Tsar began to suspect that there was something wrong in this endlessly growing tangle of crimes. In October 1827, he attached to the reports of the Commission the following resolution. It is absolutely necessary to find out who those unfortunate children were. This ought to be easy if the whole thing is not a miserable lie. His belief in the guilt of the Jews had evidently been shaken. In its endeavors to make up for the lack of substantial evidence, the Commission, personified by Kovansky, put itself in communication with the governors of the Pale, directing them to obtain information concerning all local ritual murder cases in past years. The effect of these inquiries was to revive the Gruden affair of 1818, which had been left to oblivion. A certain convert by the name of Gdalinsky from the townlet of Bobovnia in the government of Minsk declared before the Commission of Inquiry that he was ready to point out the description of the ritual murder ceremony in a secret Hebrew work. When the book was produced and the incriminated passage translated, it was found that it referred to the Jewish rites of slaughtering animals. The apostate, thus caught red-handed, confessed that he had turned informer in the hope of making money, and was by imperial command sent into the army. The confidence of St. Petersburg in the activity of the Valais Commission of Inquiry vanished more and more. Kovansky was notified that His Majesty the Emperor, having observed that the Commission bases its deductions mostly on surmises by attaching significance to the fits and gestures of the incriminated during the examinations, is full of apprehension lest the Commission, carried away by zeal and anti-Jewish prejudice, act with a certain amount of bias and protract the case to no purpose. Soon afterwards, in 1830, the case was taken out of the hands of the Commission, which had become entangled in a mesh of lies. Strakov had died in the meantime and was turned over to the Senate. Weighed down by the nightmare proportions of the material which the Veliz Commission had managed to pile up, the members of the Fifth Department of the Senate, which was charged with the case, were inclined to announce a verdict of guilty and to sentence the convicted Jews to deportation to Siberia with the application of the knout and whip, 1831. In the higher court, the plenary sessions of the Senate, there was a disagreement, the majority voting guilty, while three senators, referring to the U case of 1817, were in favor of setting the prisoners at liberty, but keeping them at the same time under police surveillance. In 1834, the case reached the highest court of the empire, the Council of State, and here, for the first time, the real facts came to light. 
Truth found its champion in the person of the aged statesman, Mordivnov, who owned some estates near Veliz and, being well acquainted with the Jews of the town, was roused to indignation by the false charges concocted against them. In his capacity as president of the Department of Civil and Ecclesiastic Affairs of the Council of State, Mordivinov, after sifting the evidence carefully, succeeded in a number of sessions to demolish completely the Babel Tower of Lies erected by Strakov and Kovansky, and to adduce proofs that the governor-general, blinded by anti-Jewish prejudice, had misled the government by his communications. The Department of Civil and Ecclesiastic Affairs was convinced by the arguments of Mordivinov and other champions of the truth, and handed down a decision that the accused Jews be set at liberty and rewarded for their innocent sufferings, and that the Christian women informers be deported to Siberia. The plenary meetings of the Council of State concurred in the decision of the department, rejecting only the clause providing for the reward of the sufferers. The verdict of the Council of State was submitted to the Tsar and received his endorsement on January 18, 1835. It read as follows. The Council of State, having carefully considered all the circumstances of this complex and involved case, finds that the depositions of the material female witnesses Terentieva, Maximova, and Kozlovska containing as they do numerous contradictions and absurdities, and lacking all positive evidence and indubitable conclusions, cannot be admitted as legal proof to convict the Jews of the grave crimes imputed to them, and therefore renders the following decision. 1. The Jews accused of having killed the soldier boy Emelianov and of other similar deeds, which are implied in the village trial, no indictment whatsoever having been found against them, shall be freed from further judgment and inquiry. 2. The material witnesses, the peasant woman Terentieva, the soldier woman Maximova, and the shakta woman Kozlovska, having been convicted of uttering libels, which they have not in the least been able to corroborate, shall be exiled to Siberia for permanent residence. 3. The peasant maid Yeremyeva, having posed among the common people as a soothsayer, shall be turned over to a priest for admonition. After attaching his signature to this verdict, Nicholas I added in his own handwriting the following characteristic resolution, which was not to be made public. While sharing the view of the Council of State that, in this case, owing to the vagueness of the legal deductions, no other decision than the one embodied in the opinion confirmed by me could have been reached. I deem it, however, necessary to add that I do not have, and indeed cannot have, the inner conviction that the murder has not been committed by the Jews. Numerous examples of similar murders go to show that among the Jews there probably exist fanatics or sectarians who consider Christian blood necessary for their rights. This appears the more possible, since, unfortunately, even among us Christians, there sometimes exist such sects which are no less horrible and incomprehensible. In a word, I do not for a moment think that this custom is common to all Jews, but I do not deny the possibility that there may be among them fanatics just as horrible as among us Christians. Having taken this idea into his head, Nicholas I refused to sign the second decision of the Council of State, which was closely allied with the verdict that all governors be instructed to be guided in the future by the U case of 1817, forbidding to stir up ritual murder cases from prejudice only. While rejecting this prejudice in its full-fledged shape, the Tsar acknowledged it in part in somewhat attenuated form. Towards the end of January 1835, 
an imperial ukase reached the city of Veliz, ordering the liberation of the exculpated Jews, reopening of the synagogues, which had been sealed since 1826, and the handing back to the Jews of the Holy Scrolls, which had been confiscated by the police. The dungeon was now ready to give up its inmates, whose strength had been sapped by the long confinement, while several of them had died during the imprisonment. The synagogues, which had not been allowed to resound its moans of the martyrs, were now opened for the prayers of the liberated. The state of siege, which for nine long years had been throttling the city, was at last taken off. The terror which had haunted the ostracized community came to an end. A new leaf was added to the annals of Jewish martyrdom, one of the gloomiest, in spite of its happy finale. 7. The Mysticlav affair. The ritual murder trials did not exhaust the extraordinary afflictions of Nicholas' reign. There were cases of wholesale chastisement inflicted on more tangible grounds when misdeeds of a few individuals were puffed up into communal crimes and visited cruelly upon entire communities. The conscription horrors of that period, when the kahals were degraded to police agencies for capturing recruits, had bred the informing disease among the Jewish communities. They produced the type of professional informer, or mozo, who blackmailed the Kahal authorities of his town by threatening to disclose their abuses, the absconding of candidates for the army and various irregularities in carrying out the conscription, and in this way extorted silence money from them. These scoundrels made life intolerable, and there were occasions when the people took the law into their own hands and secretly dispatched the most objectionable among them. A case of this kind came to light in the government of Podolia in 1836. In the town Novaya Ushitsa, two Moses, named Oxman and Schwarz, who had terrorized the Jews of the whole province, were found dead. Rumors had it that the one was killed in the synagogue and the other on the road to the town. The Russian authorities regarded the crime as the collective work of the local Jewish community, or rather of several neighboring Jewish communities, which had perpetrated this wicked deed by the verdict of their own tribunal. About 80 Kahal elders and other prominent Jews of Usitsa and adjacent towns, including two rabbis, were put on trial. The case was submitted to a court-martial which resolved to subject the guilty to an exemplary punishment. Twenty Jews were sentenced to hard labor and to penal military service, with the preliminary punishment by Spies Ruten through 500 men. A like number were sentenced to be deported to Siberia. The rest were either acquitted or had fled from justice. Many of those who ran the gauntlet died on the strokes and are remembered by the Jewish people in Russia as martyrs. The scourge of informers was also responsible for the Mr. Slavl affair. In 1844, a Jewish crowd in the marketplace of Mr. Slavl, a town in the government of Mogilev, came into conflict with a detachment of soldiers who were searching for contraband goods in a Jewish warehouse. The results of the fray were a few bruised Jews and several broken rifles. The local police and military authorities seized this opportunity to ingratiate themselves with their superiors and reported to the governor of Mogilev and the commander of the garrison that the Jews had organized a mutiny. The local informer, Arye Briskin, a converted Jew found this incident an equally convenient occasion to wreak vengeance on his former co-religionists for the contempt in which he was held by them, and allowed himself to be taken into Tao by the official Jew baiters. In January 1844, alarming communications concerning a Jewish mutiny reached St. Petersburg. The matter was reported to the Tsar, 
and a swift and curt resolution followed. To court martial the principal culprits implicated in this incident, and in the meantime, as a punishment for the turbulent demeanors of the Jews of that city, to take from them one recruit for every ten men. Once more, the principles of that period were applied, one for all, first punishment, then trial. The UKs arrived in Mstislavl on the eve of Purim and threw the Jews into consternation. During the fast of Esther, the synagogues resounded with wailing. The city was in a state of terror. The most prominent leaders of the community were thrown into jail and had to submit to disfigurement by having half of their heads and beards shaved off. The penal recruits were hunted down without any regard to age, since, according to the Tsar's resolution, a tenth of the population had to be impressed into military service. Pending the termination of the trial, no Jew was allowed to leave the city, while natives from Mstislavl in other places were captured and conveyed to their native town. A large Jewish community was threatened with complete annihilation. The Jews of Mstislavl, through their spokesman, petitioned St. Petersburg to wait with the penal conscription until the conclusion of the trial, and endeavored to convince the central government that the local administration had misrepresented the character of the incident. To save his brethren, the popular champion of the interests of his people, the merchant Isaac Zelikin of Monastokina, called affectionately Rabbi Itzele, joined to the capital. He managed to get the ear of the chief of the third section and to acquaint him with the horrors which were being perpetrated by the authorities in Mstislavl. As a result, two commissioners were dispatched from St. Petersburg in quick succession. On investigating the matter on the spot, they discovered the machinations of the overzealous officials and apostatized informers who had represented a street quarrel as an organized uprising. The new commission of inquiry, of which one of the St. Petersburg commissioners, Count Trubetskoy, was member, disclosed the fact that the Jewish community as such had had nothing whatsoever to do with what had occurred. The findings of the commission resulted in an imperial act of grace. The imprisoned Jews were set at liberty. The penal conscripts were returned from service. Several local officials were put on trial, and the governor of Mogilev was severely censured. This took place in November 1844, after the Mstislavl community had for nine long months tasted the horrors of a state of siege. The synagogues were filled with Jews praising God for the relief granted to them. The community decreed to commemorate annually the day before Purim, on which the UK's inflicting severe punishment on the Jews of Mstislavl was promulgated as a day of fasting and to celebrate the third day of month of Kislev, on which the cruel UK's was revoked as a day of rejoicing. Had all the disasters of that era had been perpetuated in the same manner, the Jewish calendar would consist entirely of these commemorations of national misfortunes whether in the form of ordinary persecutions or extraordinary afflictions. End of section 6. Section 7 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894 by Shimon Dubnov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim, Seoul, South Korea. Chapter 15, The Jews in the Kingdom of Poland. Part 1. 1. Plans of Jewish Emancipation. Special mention must be made of the position occupied by the Jews in the vast province which had been formed in 1815 
out of the territory of the former Duchy of Warsaw and annexed by Russia under the name of Kingdom of Poland. This province, which from 1815 to 1830 enjoyed full autonomy with the local government in Warsaw and the parliamentary constitution, handled the affairs of its large Jewish population, numbering between 300 to 400,000 souls, independently and without regard to the legislation of the Russian Empire. Even after the insurrection of 1830, when subdued Poland was linked more closely with the empire, the Jews continued to be subject to a separate provincial legislation. The Jews of the kingdom remained under the tutelage of local guardians who were assiduously engaged in solving the Jewish problem during the first part of this period. The initial years of autonomous Poland were a time of storm and stress. After having experienced the vicissitude of the period of partitions and the hopes and disappointment of the Napoleonic era, the Polish people clutched eagerly at the shreds of political freedom which were left to it by Alexander I in the shape of the constitutional regulation of 1815. The Poles brought to bear upon the upbuilding of the new kingdom all the ardor of the national soul and all their enthusiasm for political regeneration. The feverish organizing activity between 1815 and 1820 was attended by a violent outburst of national sentiment, and such moments of enthusiasm were always accompanied in Poland by an intolerant and unfriendly attitude towards the Jews. With a few shining exceptions, the Polish statesmen were far removed from the idea of Jewish emancipation. They favored either correctional or punitive method, though modeled after the pattern of Western European, rather than of primitive Russian anti-Semitism. In 1815, the provisional government in Warsaw appointed a special committee under the chairmanship of Count Adam Czartoryski to consider the agrarian and the Jewish problem. The committee drew up a general plan of Jewish reorganization, which was marked by the spirit of enlightened patronage. In theory, the committee was ready to concede to the Jews human and civil rights, even to the point of considering the necessity of their final emancipation. But in view of the ignorance, the prejudices and the moral corruption to be observed among the lower classes of the Jewish and the Polish people, the patrician members of the committee in charge of the agrarian and Jewish problem accorded an equal share of compliments to the Jews and the Polish peasants. Immediate emancipation was, in their opinion, bound to prove harmful, since it would confer upon the Jews freedom of action to the detriment of the country. It was therefore necessary to demand, as a prerequisite for Jewish emancipation, the improvement of the Jewish masses, which was to be effected by removal from the injurious liquor trade and inducement to engage in agriculture by abolishing the kahals, i.e. their communal autonomy, and by changing the Jewish school system to meet the civic requirements. In order to gain the confidence of the Jews for the proposed reforms, the committee suggested that the government should invite the enlightened representatives of the Jewish people to participate in the discussion of the project measures of reform. Turning their eyes toward the West, where Jewish assimilation had already begun its course, the Polish committee decided to approach the Jewish reformer David Friedlander of Berlin, who was, so to speak, the official philosopher of Jewish emancipation, and to solicit his opinion concerning the ways and means of bringing about a reorganization of Jewish life in Poland. The Bishop of Kuyavia, Malczewski, addressed himself in the name of the Polish government to Friedlander, calling upon him a pupil of Mendelssohn, the educator of Jewry, to state his views on the proposed Jewish reforms in Poland. 
flattered by this invitation, Friedlander hastened to compose an elaborate opinion on the improvement of the Jews in the Kingdom of Poland. According to Friedlander, the Polish Jews had, in point of culture, remained far beyond their Western co-religionists because their progress had been hampered by their Talmudic training, the pernicious doctrine of Hasidism, and the self-government of their Kahals. All these influences ought, therefore, to be combated. The Jewish school should be brought into closer contact with the Polish school. The Hebrew language should be replaced by the language of the country, and altogether assimilation and religious reform should be encouraged. While promoting religious and cultural reforms, the government, in the opinion of Friedlander, ought to confirm the Jews in the belief that they would receive in time civil rights if they were to endeavor to perfect themselves in the spirit of the regulation issued for them. This flunkish notion of the necessity of deserving civil rights coincided with the views of the official Polish committee in Warsaw. Soon afterwards, a memorandum prepared by the committee was submitted through its chairman, Count Czartoryski, to the Polish viceroy Zajoncek. Formerly a comrade of Kosciusko, Zajoncek later turned from a revolutionary into reactionary, who was anxious to curry favor with the supreme commander of the province, Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich. No wonder, therefore, that the plan of the committee, conservative though it was, seemed too liberal for his liking. In his report to Emperor Alexander I, dated March 8, 1816, he wrote as follows. The growth of the Jewish population in your kingdom of Poland is becoming a menace. In 1790, they formed here a thirteenth part of the whole population. Today, they form no less than an eighth. Sober and resourceful, they are satisfied with little. They earn their livelihood by cheating and, owing to early marriages, multiply beyond measure. Shunning hard labor, they produce nothing themselves and live only at the expense of the working classes which they help to ruin. Their peculiar institutions keep them apart within the state, marking them as a foreign nationality, and as a result, they are unable in their present condition to furnish the state either with good citizens or with capable soldiers. Unless means are adopted to utilize for the common will the useful qualities of the Jews, they will soon exhaust all sources of the national wealth and will threaten to surpass and suppress the Christian population. In the same year, 1816, a scheme looking to the solution of the Jewish question was proposed by the Russian statesman Nicholas Novosiltsev, the imperial commissioner attached to the provincial government in Warsaw. Novosiltsev, who was not sympathetic to the Poles, showed himself in his project to be a friend of the Jews. Instead of the principle laid down by the official committee, correction first and civil rights last, he suggests another more liberal procedure, the immediate bestowal of civil and in part even political rights upon the Jews, to be accompanied by a reorganization of Jewish life along the lines of European progress and the modernized scheme of autonomy. All communal and cultural affairs shall be put in charge of directorates, one central directorate in Warsaw, and local ones in every province of the kingdom, after the pattern of the Jewish consistories of France. These directorates shall be composed of rabbis, elders of the community, and a commissioner representing the government. In the central directorate, this commissioner shall be replaced by a procurator to be appointed directly by the king. This whole organization shall be placed under the jurisdiction of the Minister of Public Instruction, who shall also exercise the right of confirming the rabbis nominated by the directorates. The functions of the directorates shall include 
the registration of the Jewish population, the management of the communal finances, the dispensation of charity, and the opening of secular schools for Jewish children. A certificate of graduation from such a school shall be required from every young man who applies for a marriage license or for a permit to engage in a craft or to acquire property. All Jews fulfilling the obligations imposed by the present statute shall be accorded full citizenship, while those who distinguish themselves in science and art may even be deemed worthy of political rights, not excluding membership in the Polish Diet. For the immediate future, Novosiltsev advises to refrain from economic restrictions such as the prohibition of the liquor traffic, though he concedes the advisability of checking its growth and advocates the adoption of a system of economic reforms by stimulating crops and agriculture among the Jews. In the beginning of 1817, Novosiltsev's project was laid before the Polish Council of State. It was opposed with great stubbornness by Czartoryski, the Polish viceroy Zajoncek, Stasitz, and other Polish dignitaries, whose hostility was directed not so much against the pro-Jewish plan as against its Russian author. The Council of State appointed a special committee, which, after examining Novosiltsev's project, arrived at the following conclusions. 1. It is impossible to carry out a reorganization of Jewish life through the Jews themselves. 2. The establishment of a separate cultural organization for the Jews will only stimulate their national aloofness. 3. The complete civil and political emancipation of the Jews is at variance with the Polish constitution, which vouchsafes special privileges to the professors of the dominant religion. In the plenary session of the Polish Council of State, the debate about Novosiltsev's project was exceedingly stormy. The Polish members of the Council sent it in the project political aims in opposition to the national elements of the country. They emphasized the danger which the immediate emancipation of the Jews would entail for Poland. Let the Jews first become real Poles, exclaimed the referee Kozmian, then will it be possible to look upon them as citizens. When the same gentleman declared that it was impossible to accord citizenship to hordes of people, who first had to be accustomed to cleanliness and cured from leprosy and similar diseases, Zayoncek burst out laughing and shouted, Hear, hear! These slut won't get rid of their scabs so easily. After such elevating criticism, Novosiltsev's project was voted down. The council inclined to the belief that the psychological moment for bringing about a radical reorganization of the inner life of the Jews had not yet arrived, and therefore resolved to limit itself to isolated measures, principally of a correctional and repressive character. 2. Political reaction and literary anti-Semitism Such measures were not long in coming. The only restriction the government of Warsaw failed to carry through was the enforcement of the law of 1812, forbidding the Jews to deal in liquor. This drastic measure was vetoed by Alexander I, owing to the representations of the Jewish deputies in St. Petersburg, and in 1816, the Polish viceroy was compelled to announce the suspension of this cruel law which had hung like the sword of Democles over the heads of hundreds of thousands of Jews. On the other hand, the Polish government managed in the course of a few years, 1816 to 1823, to put into operation a number of other restrictive laws. Several cities which boasted the ancient right to non-tolerant Judaism, 
secured the confirmation of this shameful privilege, with the result that the Jews who had settled there during the existence of the Dutch of Warsaw were either expelled or confined to separate districts. In Warsaw, a number of streets were closed to Jewish residents, and all Jewish visitors to the capital were forced to pay a heavy tax for their right of sojourn, the so-called ticket impost, amounting to 15 kopecks, seven and a half cents a day. Finally, the Jews were forbidden to settle within 21 versts of the Austrian and Prussian frontiers. At the same time, the Polish legislators were fair-minded enough to refrain from forcing the Jews, these disfranchised periods, into military service. In 1817, an announcement was made to the effect that so long as the Jews were barred from the enjoyment of civil rights, they would be released from personal military service in Poland, in lieu whereof they were to pay a fixed conscription tax. About the same time, during the third decade of the 19th century, was also realized the old-time policy of curtailing the Jewish Kahal autonomy, though, as will be seen later, this reform did not proceed from the government spheres, but was rather the product of contemporary social movements among the Poles and the Jews. The political literature of Poland manifested at that time a tendency similar to the one which had prevailed during the Quadrennial Diet. Scores of pamphlets and magazine articles discussed with the polemic ardor the Jewish problem, the burning question of the day. The old Jewish painter Stasitz, a member of the Warsaw government who served on the Commission of Public Instruction and Religious Denominations, resumed his attacks on Judaism. In 1816, he published an article under the title of Concerning the Causes of the Obnoxiousness of the Jews, in which he asserted that the Jews were responsible for Poland's decline. They multiplied with incredible rapidity, forming now no less than an eighth of the population. Should this process continue, the Kingdom of Poland would be turned into a Jewish country and become the laughing stock of the whole of Europe. The Jewish religion is antagonistic to Catholicism. We call them Old Testament believers, while they brand us as pagans. It being impossible to expel the Jews from Poland, they ought to be isolated like carriers of disease. They should be concentrated in separate quarters in the cities to facilitate the supervision over them. Only well-deserving merchants and craftsmen who have plied their trade honestly for five or ten years should be allowed to reside outside the ghetto. The same category of Jews, in addition to those married to Christian women, should also be granted the right of acquiring landed property. The ghetto on the one end of the line and baptism on the other, this medieval policy did not in the least abash the patriotic reformers of the type of Stasitz. Stasitz's point of view was supported by certain publicists and opposed by others, but all were agreed on the necessity of a system of correction for the Jews. The discussion became particularly heated in 1818 after the convocation and during the sessions of the first Polish Diet in Warsaw. Three different tendencies asserted themselves, a moderate, an anti-Jewish, and a pro-Jewish tendency. The first was represented by General Vincent Krasinski, a member of the Diet. In his observations on the Jews of Poland, he proceeds from the following twofold premise. The voice of the whole nation is raised against the Jews, and it demands their transformation. This titled publicist declares himself an opponent of the Jews as they are at present. He shares the popular dread of their multiplication, 
the fear of a Jewish Poland, and is somewhat skeptical about their being corrigible. Nevertheless, he proposes a liberal method of correction, such as the encouragement of big Jewish capital, the promotion of agriculture and handicraft among the Jewish masses, and the bestowal of the rights of citizenship upon those worthy of it. Krasinski was attacked by an anonymous writer in an anti-Semitic pamphlet entitled A Remedy Against the Jews. Proceeding from the conviction that no reforms, however well conceived, could have any effect on the Jews, the writer puts the question in a simplified form. Shall we sacrifice the welfare of 3 million Poles to that of 300,000 Jews, or vice versa? His answer is just as simple. The Jews should be forced to leave Poland. Emperor Alexander I, the benefactor of Poland, ought to be petitioned to rid the country of the Jews by transferring them to the uninhabited steppes in the south of Russia or even on the borders of Great Tartary. The 300,000 Jews might be divided into 300 parties and settled there in the course of one year. The means for expelling and settling the Jews should be furnished by the Jews themselves. This barbarous project aroused the ire of a noble-minded Polish army officer, Valerian Lukasinski, a radical in politics, who subsequently landed in the dungeon of the Schlüsselburg fortress. In his reflections of an army officer concerning the needs of organizing the Jews, Published in 1818, Lukasinski advances the thought that the oppression and disfranchisement of the Jews are alone responsible for their demoralized condition. They were useful citizens in the golden age of Casimir the Great and Sigismund the Old, when they were treated with kindness. The order lashes the hypocrisy of the Shlachta, who holds the Jews to account for ruining the peasant by selling them alcohol in those very taverns which are leased to them by the noble pans. Lukasinski contends that the Jews will become good citizens once they will be allowed to participate in the civil life of Poland when that life will be founded on democratic principles. The choir of Polish voice was but faintly disturbed by the opinions expressed by the Jews. An otherwise unknown rabbi who calls himself Moses ben Abraham echoes in his pamphlet the voice of the people of Israel, the sentiments of Jewish orthodoxy. He begs the Poles not to meddle in the inner affairs of Judaism. You refuse to recognize us as brothers, then at least respect us as fathers. Look at your genealogical tree with the branches of New Testament, and you will find the root in us. Polish culture cannot be foisted upon the Jews. Barbarous as may appear the plan of expelling the Jews from Poland, the persecuted tribe will rather submit to this alternative than renounce its faith and its ancestral customs. The views of the progressive Jews of Poland were voiced by a young pedagogue in Warsaw. Subsequently, the well-known champion of assimilation, Jacob Tugendhold. In a treaty entitled Jerubal or World Concerning the Jews, Tugendhold contends that the Jews have already begun to assimilate themselves to Polish culture. It was now within the power of the government to strengthen this movement by admitting distinguished Jews to civil service. While this literary feud concerning the problem of Judaism was raging, an unhealthy movement against the Jews started among the dregs of the Polish population. In several localities of the kingdom, there suddenly appeared victims of ritual murder in the shape of dead bodies of children, the discovery of which was followed by a series of legal trials against the Jews, 1815 to 1816. Innocent people were thrown into prison, 
where they languished for years and were subjected to cross-examinations, though without the inquisitorial apparatus of ancient Poland. It is impossible to say whither this orgy of superstition might have led, had it not been stopped by a word of command from St. Petersburg. In 1817, as a result of the energetic representations of the deputies of the Jewish people, Sonnenberg and his fellow workers, the Minister of Ecclesiastic Affairs, Golitsyn, gave orders that the UKs, which had just been issued by him, forbidding the arbitrary injection of a ritual element into criminal cases, be strictly enforced in the Kingdom of Poland. This action saved the lives of scores of prisoners and put a stop to the obscure agitation which endeavored to revive the medieval specter. The Polish Diet of 1818 reflected the same state of mind which had previously found expression in political literature, an unmistakable preponderance of the anti-Jewish element. Some of the deputies appealed to Alexander I in their speeches and openly called upon him to give orders to lay before the next session of the Diet a project of Jewish reform with a view to saving Poland from the excessive growth of the Hebrew tribe, which now formed a seventh of all the inhabitants, and in a few years will surpass in the numbers the Christian population of the country. For the immediate future, the deputies recommend the enforcement of the suspended law barring the Jews from the liquor traffic and their subjection to military conscription. One might have thought that the Diet had no need of extra measures to curb the Jews. It was quite enough that it tacitly sanctioned the prolongation of the ten years' term of Jewish rightlessness, which had been fixed by the government of the Varsovian Dutch in 1808. This term ended in 1818, while the first Diet of the Kingdom of Poland was holding its sessions, but neither the Polish Diet nor the Polish Council of State gave any serious thought to the question whether the government of the province had the right to prolong the disfranchisement of the Jews. This right was taken for granted by the Polish legislators who were planning even harsher restrictions for the unloved tribe of Hebrews. End of section 7. Section 8 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Dubunov. Translated by Israel Friedland. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim. Manik Baisha, Portugal. Chapter 15. The Jews in the Kingdom of Poland. Part 2. 3. Assimilationist Tendencies Among the Jews of Poland. In the beginning of the third decade of the 19th century, the noise caused by the Jewish question had begun to subside both in Polish political circles and in Polish literature. Instead, the agitation within the Jewish ranks became more vigorous. That group of Jews already assimilated or thirsting for assimilation, which on an earlier occasion during the existence of the Varsovian Dutch, had segregated itself from the rest of Jewry assuming the labor of Old Testament believers, occupied a very influential position within the Jewish community of the Polish capital. It was made up of wealthy bankers and merchants and boasted of a few men with a European education. The members of this group were hankering after German borders and were anxious to renounce 
the national separatism of the Jews, which was a standing rebuke in the mouth of their enemies. To these Old Testament believers, the abolition of the Kahal and the limitation of communal self-government to the narrow range of synagogue interests appeared the surest remedy against anti-Semitism. Behind the abrogation of the communal autonomy, they saw the smiling vision of a Jewish school reform leading to the Polonization of Jewish education while in the far-off distance they could discern the promised land of equal citizenship. The efforts of the Jewish reformers of Warsaw were now systematically directed toward this goal. In 1820, there appeared an anonymous pamphlet under the title The Petition or Self-Defense of the Members of the Old Testament Persuasion in the Kingdom of Poland. The main purpose of this publication is to show that the root of the evil lies in the Kahal organization, in the elders, rabbis, and burial societies who expend enormous sums of taxation money without any control, i.e., without the control of the Polish municipality, who oppress the people by their harems, excommunication, and altogether abuse their power. It is therefore necessary to abolish this power of the cars and transfer it to the Polish municipalities or even police authorities. Only then will order be established in the Jewish communities and the Jews will be transformed into useful citizens. The government spheres of Poland were greatly pleased by these utterances of the Old Testament believers of Warsaw. They had long contemplated the curtailment of the autonomy of the cars, and now the very Jews clamored for it. In consequence, there appeared in 1821 a series of edicts by the viceroy and various rescripts by the Commission of Public Instruction and Religious Denominations, resulting in the demolition of the ancient communal scheme in which certain forms of self-government but by no means its underlying fundamental principles had become obsolete. These measures were sanctioned by an imperial ukase dated December 20, 1821, decreeing the abolition of the cars and their substitution by congregational boards whose scope of activity was strictly limited to religious matters while all civil and fiscal affairs were placed under the jurisdiction of the local Polish administration. The congregational board were to consist of the rabbi, his assistant or substitute, and three trustees or supervisors. At first, the majority of Jewish communities in Poland were indignant at this curtailment of their autonomy and adopted a hostile attitude towards the new communal organization. The supervisors, elected on the congregational board, often refused to serve, and the authorities were compelled to appoint them. But in the course of time, the communities became reconciled to the new scheme of congregations or guminas, whose range of activity was gradually widened. In 1830, the suffrage of the Polish Jews within the Jewish communities was restricted by a new law to persons possessed of a certain amount of property. The result was particularly noticeable in Warsaw, where the new state of things helped to strengthen the influence of the group of the Old Testament believers and enabled them to gain control of the affairs of the metropolitan community. The leaders of Warsaw Jewry managed soon to establish intimate relations with the Polish government and cooperated with it in bringing about the cultural reforms of the Jews of Poland. In 1825, the Polish government appointed a special body to deal with Jewish affairs. It was called Committee of Old Testament Believers, though composed in the main of Polish officials. It was supplemented by an advisory council consisting of five public-spirited Jews and their alternates, 
among the members of the committee, which included several prominent Jewish merchants of Warsaw, such as Jacob Bergson, M. Kapsky, Solomon Posner, T. Teplitz, was also the well-known mathematician Abraham Stern, one of the few cultured Jews of that period who remained the steadfast upholder of Jewish tradition. The Committee of Old Testament Believers embarked upon the huge task of civilizing the Jews of Poland and purging the Jewish religion of its superstitious excrescences. The first step taken by the committee was the establishment of a rabbinical seminary in Warsaw for the training of modernized rabbis, teachers, and communal workers. The program of the school was arranged with a view to the Polonization of its pupils. The language of instruction was Polish, and the teachers of many secular subjects were Christians. No wonder, then, when the seminary was opened in 1826, Stern refused to accept the post of director which had been offered to him and yielded his place to Anton Eisenbaum, a radical assimilator. The tendency of the school may be gauged from the fact that the Department of Hebrew and Bible was entrusted to Abraham Buchner, who had gained notoriety by a German pamphlet entitled The Nichtigkeit des Talmud, The Worthlessness of the Talmud. Characteristically enough, Buchner had been recommended by the ferocious Jew bait uh, Abbe Schiarini, a member of the Committee of Old Testament Believers, which one might almost suspect was charged with the supervision of Jewish education for no other reason than that to spite the Jews. Shirini was professor of Oriental languages at the University of Warsaw. As such, he considered himself an expert in Hebrew literature and cherished the plan of translating the Talmud into French to unveil the secrets of Judaism before the Christian world. In 1828, Shirini suggested to the Committee of Old Testament Believers to arrange a course in Hebrew archaeology at the Warsaw University for the purpose of acquainting Christian students with rabbinical literature and thus equipping prospective Polish officials with the knowledge of things Jewish. The plan having been approved by the government, Shirini began to deliver a course of lectures on Judaism. The fruit of these lectures were a French publication issued in 1829 under the title Theorie du Judaism. It was an ignorant libel upon the Talmud and Rabbinism, a worthy counterpart of Eisenmenger's Judaism Exposed. Shirini did not even shrink from repeating the hideous lie about the use of Christian blood by the Jews. He was taken to task by Jacob Tugenhold in Warsaw, and by Jost and Zunz in Germany. Yet the evil seed had sunk into the soil. Polish society, which had long harbored unfriendly sentiments against the Jews, became more and more permeated with anti-Semitic bias, and this bias found tangible expression during the insurrection of 1830 to 1831. 4. The Jews and the Polish insurrection of 1831. When, under the effect of the July Revolution in Paris, the November insurrection of 1830 broke out in Warsaw, it put on its mettle that section of Polish Jewry who hoped to improve the Jewish lot by their patriotic ardor. In the month of December, one of the Old Testament delivers, Stanislav Hernisch, addressed himself to the Polish dictator Klopitsky in the name of a group of Jewish youth, assuring him of their eagerness to form a special detachment of volunteers to help in the common task of liberating their fatherland. The dictator replied that, inasmuch as the Jews had no civil rights, they could not be permitted to serve in the army. The minister of war, Moravsky delivered himself on this occasion of the following characteristic utterance. 
We cannot allow that Jewish blood should mingle with the noble blood of the Poles. What will Europe say when she learns that in fighting for our liberty we have not been able to get along without Jewish help? The insulting refusal did not cool the ardor of the Jewish patriots. Joseph Berkovich, son of Berek Yoselovich, who had laid down his life for Polish cause, decided to repeat his father's experiment and issued a proclamation to the Jews calling upon them to join the ranks of the fighters for Polish independence. The national government in Warsaw could not resist this patriotic pressure. It addressed itself to the Congregational Board of Warsaw, inquiring about the attitude of the Jewish community towards the projected formation of a separate regiment of Jewish volunteers. The board replied that the community had already given proofs of its patriotism by contributing 40,000 gulden towards the revolutionary funds and by collecting further contributions toward the equipment of volunteers. The formation of a special Jewish regiment the board did not consider advisable inasmuch as such action was not in keeping with the task of uniting all citizens in the defense of the fatherland. Instead, the board favored the distribution of Jewish volunteers over the whole army. From now on, the Jews were admitted to military service, but more into the militia than into the regular army. The commander of National Guard in Warsaw, Anton Ostrovsky, one of the few rebel leaders who were not swayed by the anti-Semitic prejudices of the Polish nobility, admitted into his militia many Jewish volunteers on condition that they shave off their beards. Owing to the religious scruples of many Jewish soldiers, the latter condition had to be abandoned, and the special beard detachment of the Metropolitan Guard was formed, comprising 850 Jews. The Jewish militia acquitted itself nobly of its duty in the grave task of protecting the city of Warsaw against the onrush of the Russian troops. The sons of wealthy families fought shoulder to shoulder with children of the proletariat. The sight of these stepchildren of Poland fighting for their fatherland stirred the heart of Ostrovsky, and he subsequently wrote, This spectacle could not fail to make your heart ache. Our conscience bade us to attend to the betterment of this most downtrodden part of our population at the earliest possible moment. It is worthy of note that the wave of Polish-Jewish patriotism did not spread beyond Warsaw. In the provincial towns, the inhabitants of the ghetto were, as a rule, unwilling to serve in the army on the ground that the Jewish religion forbade the shedding of human blood. This indifference aroused the ire of the Polish population, which threatened to wreak vengeance upon the Jews suspecting them of pro-Russian sympathies. Ostrovsky's remark with reference to this situation deserves to be quoted. True, he said, the Jews of the provinces may possibly be guilty of indifference towards the revolutionary cause, but can you expect any other attitude from those we oppress? It may be added that soon afterwards the question of military service as affecting the Jews was solved by the Diet. By the law of May 30, 1831, the Jews were released from conscription on the payment of a tax which was four times as large as the one paid by them in the former years. When the aristocratic revolution, having failed to obtain the support of the disinherited masses, had met with disaster, the revolutionary leaders, who saved themselves by fleeing abroad, indulged in remorseful reflections. The Polish historian Leleville, who lived in Paris as a refugee, issued in 1832 a manifesto to the Israelitish nation, calling upon the Jews to forget the insults inflicted upon them by present-day Poland, 
for the sake of the sweet reminiscence of the Polish Republic in days gone by and of the hopes inspired by a free Poland in days to come. He compares the flourishing condition of the Jews in the ancient Polish Commonwealth with their present status on the same territory under the yoke of the Viennese pharaohs or in the land dominated by the northern Nebuchadnezzar, where the terror of conscription reigns supreme, where little children, wrenched from the embraces of their mothers, are hurled into the ranks of a debased soldiery, doomed to become traitors to their religion and nation. Similar utterances could be heard a little later in the mystic circle of Tobiansky and Mitzkevich in Paris, in which the historic destiny of the two martyr nations, the Poles and the Jews, and their universal messianic calling were favorite topics of discussion. But alongside of these flights of imprisoned thought, one could frequently catch in the very same circle the sounds of the old anti-Semitic slogans. The Parisian organ of the Polish refugees, Nova Polska, New Poland, occasionally indulged in anti-Semitic sallies, calling forth a passionate rebuttal from Hornish, an exiled journalist who reminded his fellow journalists that it was mean to hunt down people who were the slaves of slaves. Two other Polish-Jewish revolutionaries, Lublino and Holandersky, shared all the miseries of the refugees and, while in exile, indulged in reflections concerning the destiny of their brethren at home. In pacified Poland, which, deprived of her former autonomous constitution, was now ruled by the iron hand of the Russian viceroy Paskevich, the Jews at first experienced no palpable changes. Their civil status was regulated as heretofore by former Polish legislation, not by that of the empire. It was only in 1843 that the Polish Jews were in one respect equalized with their Russian brethren. Instead of the old recruiting tax, they were now forced to discharge military service in person. However, the imperial ukase extending the operation of the conscription statute of 1827 to the Jews of the kingdom contained several alleviations. Above all, its most cruel provision, the conscription of juveniles or cantonists, was set aside. The age of conscription was fixed at 20 to 25, while boys between the age of 12 and 18 were to be drafted only when the parents themselves wished to offer them as substitute for their elder sons who were of military age. Nevertheless, to the Polish Jews who had never known of conscription, military service lasting a quarter of a century to be discharged in a strange Russian environment seemed a terrible sacrifice. The Congregational Board of Warsaw having learned of the UK's sent a deputation to St. Petersburg with a petition to grant the Jews of the kingdom equal rights with the Christians, referring to the law of 1817, which distinctly stated that the Jews were to be released from personal military service so long as they were denied equal civil rights. The petition, of course, proved of no avail. The very term equal rights was still missing in the Russian vocabulary. Only in points of disabilities were the Jews of Poland gradually placed on an equal footing with their Russian brethren. In 1845, the Russian law imposing a tax on the traditional Jewish attire was extended in its operation to the Polish Jews descending with a force of real calamity upon the Hasidic masses of Poland. Fortunately for the Jews of Poland, the other experiments in which St. Petersburg was reveling during that period left them unscathed. The crisis connected with the problems of Jewish autonomy and the Jewish school 
which threatened to disrupt Russian Jewry in the 40s, had been passed by the Jews of Poland some 20 years earlier. Moreover, the Polish Jews had the advantage over their Russian brethren in that the abrogated Kahal had, after all, been replaced by another communal organization, however curtailed it was, and that the secular school was not forced upon them in the same brutal manner in which the Russian crown schools had been imposed upon the Jews of the empire. Taken as a whole, the lot of the Polish Jews, said though it was, might yet be pronounced enviable when compared with the condition of their brethren in the Pale of Settlement, where the rightlessness of the Jews during that period bordered frequently on martyrdom. End of section 8《Section 9 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland》Volume 2 From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III 1825 to 1894 by Shimon Dubnov Translated by Israel Friedlander This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by S.S. Kim Manikut Baisho, Portugal Chapter 16. The Inner Life of Russian Jewry During the Period of Military Despotism Part 1. 1. The Uncompromising Attitude of Rabbinism The Russian government had left nothing undone to shatter the old Jewish mode of life. Despotic Tsardom, whose ignorance of Jewish life was only equaled by its hostility to it, lifted its hand to strike not merely at the obsolete forms, but also at the sound historic foundations of Judaism. The system of conscription, which annually wrenched thousands of youth and lads from the bosom of their families, the barracks, which served as mission houses, the method of stimulating and even forcing the conversion of recruits, the establishment of crown schools for the same covert purpose, the abolition of communal autonomy, civil disfranchisement, persecution and oppression, all was set in motion against the citadel of Judaism. And the ancient citadel, which had held out for thousands of years, stood firm again, while the defenders within her walls, in their endeavor to ward off the enemy's blows had not only succeeded in covering up the breaches, but also in barring the entrance of fresh air from without. If it be true that in pursuing its system of tutelage and oppression, the Russian government was genuinely actuated by the desire to craft the modicum of European culture to which the Russia of Nicholas I could lay claim upon the Jews, it certainly achieved the reverse of what it aimed at. The hand which dealt out blows could not disseminate enlightenment. The hammer which was lifted to shatter Jewish separatism had only the effect of hardening it. The persecuted Jews clutched eagerly at their old mode of life, the target of their enemies' attacks. They clung not only to its permanent foundations, but also to its obsolete superstructure. The despotism of extermination from without was counterbalanced by a despotism of conservation from within, by the rigid discipline of conduct to which the masses submitted without a murmur, though its yoke must have weighed heavily upon the few, the stray harbingers of new order of things. The government had managed to disrupt the Jewish communal organization and drop the kahal of all its authority by degrading it to a kind of posse for the capture of recruits and extortion of taxes. But while the Jewish masses hated the kahal elders, they retained their faith in their spiritual leaders, the rabbis and tzaddiks. Heeding the command of these leaders, they closed their ranks, 
and offered stubborn resistance to the dangerous cultural influences threatening them from without. Life was dominated by rigidly conservative principles. The old scheme of family life, with all its patriarchal survivors, remained in force. In spite of the law embodied in the Statute of 1835, which fixed the minimum age of the bridegroom at 18 and that of the bride at 16, the practice of early marriages continued as theretofore. Parents arranged marriages between children of 13 and 15. Boys of school age often became husbands and fathers and continued to attend Heather or Yeshva after their marriage, weighed down by the triple tutelage of father, father-in-law, and teacher. The growing generation knew not the sweetness of being young. Their youth withered under the weight of family chains, the pressure of want or material dependence. The spirit of protest, the striving for rejuvenation, which asserted itself in some youthful souls, was crushed in the vice of a time-honored discipline, the product of long ages. The slightest deviation from a custom, a right, or all the habits of thought met with severe punishment. A short jacket or a trimmed beard was looked upon as a token of dangerous free thinking. The reading of books written in foreign languages or even written in Hebrew when treating of secular subjects brought upon the culprit's untold hardships. The scholastic education resulted in producing men entirely unfit for the battle of life, so that in many families, energetic women took charge of the business and became the wage earners, while their husbands were losing themselves in the mazes of speculation. Somewhere in the recesses of the rabbinic Betha Midrash or the Hasidic Klaus. In Lithuania, the whole mental energy of the Jewish youth was absorbed by Talmudism. The synagogue served as a house of study outside the hours fixed for prayers. There, the local rabbi or a private scholar gave lectures on the Talmud, which were listened to by hosts of yeshiva bachurs. The great yeshivas of Volozin, Mir, and other towns sent forth thousands of rabbis and Talmudists. Mentality, erudition, dialectic subtlety were valued here almost all else. Yet, as soon as the mind, whetted by Talmudic dialectics, would point its edge against the existing order of things, or turn in the direction of living knowledge of extraneous sciences, it was checked by threats of excommunication and persecution. Many were the victims of this petrified milieu, whose protest against the old order of things and whose striving for a newer life were nipped in the bud. Instructive in this respect is the fate of one of the most remarkable Talmudists of his time, Rabbi Menashe Elia. Elia spent most of his life in the townlets of Sborgoni and Elia, whence his surname, in the government of Vilna, and died of cholera in 1831. While keeping strictly within the bounds of rabbinical orthodoxy, whose adepts respected him for his enormous erudition and strict piety, Menashe assiduously endeavored to widen their range of thought and render them more amenable to moderate freedom of research and a more sober outlook on the life. But his path was strewn with thorns, when, on one occasion, he expounded before his pupils the conclusion which he had reached after a profound scientific investigation that the text of the Mishnah had in many cases been wrongly interpreted by the Gemara. He was taken to task by a conference of Lithuanian rabbis and barely escaped excommunication. Having conceived a liking for mathematics, astronomy, and philosophy, Menashe decided to go to Berlin to devote himself to these studies, but on his way to the German capital, while temporarily sojourning in Königsberg, 
he was halted by his countrymen who visited Prussia on business and was cowed by all kinds of threats into returning home. By persistent private study, this native of a Russian out-of-the-way townlet managed to acquire a fair amount of general culture, which, with all its limitations, yielded a rich literary harvest. In 1807, he made his debut with the treaty Pesher and Daba, the solution of the problem in which he gave vent to his grief over the fact that the spiritual leaders of the Jewish people kept aloof from concrete reality and living knowledge. While the book was passing through the press in Vilna, Lithuanian fanatics threatened the author with severe reprisals. Their threat failed to intimidate him. When the book appeared, many rabbis threw it into the flames and made every possible effort to arrest its circulation, with the result that the voice of the heretic was stifled. Ten years later, while residing temporarily in Volinia, the hotbed of Hasidism, Menashe began to print his religio-philosophic treatise, Alfe Menashe, the teaching of Menashe, but the first proof sheets sufficed to impress the printer with the heretical character of the book, and he threw them together with the whole manuscript into the fire. The hapless author managed with difficulty to restore the text of his executed work and published it at Vilna in 1822. Here the rabbinical censorship pounced upon him. The book had not yet left the press, when the rabbi of Vilna, Saul Katzen Ellenbogen, learned that in one passage the writer deduced from a verse in Deuteronomy, chapter 17, verse 9, the right of the judges or spiritual leaders which generation to modify many religious laws and customs in accordance with the requirements of the time. The rabbi gave our author fair warning that unless this heretical argument was withdrawn, he would have the book burned publicly in the synagogue yard. Menashe was forced to submit and, contrary to his conviction, weakened his heterodox argument by a number of circumlocutions. These persecutions, however, did not smother the fire of protest in the breast of the excommunicated rural philosopher. In the last years of his life, he published two pamphlets in which he severely lashed the shortcomings of Jewish life, the early marriages, the one-sided school training, the repugnance to living knowledge and physical labor. However, the champions of orthodoxy took good care to prevent these books from reaching the masses. Exhausted by his fruitless struggle, Menashe died unappreciated and almost unnoticed by his contemporaries. 2. The Stagnation of Hasidism A critical attitude towards the existing order of things could on occasion assert itself in the environment of rabbinism, where the mind, though forced into the mold of scholasticism, was yet working at high speed, but such heretical thinking was utterly inconceivable in the dominant circles of Hasidism, where the intellect was rocked to sleep by mystical lullabies and fascinating stories of the miraculous exploits of the tzaddiks. The era of political and civil disfranchisement was a time of luxuriant growth for Hasidism, not in its creative, but rather in its stationary, not to say stagnant phase. The old struggle between Hasidism and Rabbinism had long been fought out, and the tzaddiks rested on their laurels as teachers and miracle workers. The tzaddik dynasties were now firmly entrenched. In White Russia, the scepter lay in the hands of the Shneozian dynasty, the successors of the old rabbi Shneo Zalman the progenitor of the northern Hasidism. The son of the old rabbi Beer, nicknamed the middle rabbi, 1813 to 1828, 
and the latter's son-in-law, Mendel Lubavitcher, 1828 to 1866, succeeded one another on the Hasidic throne during this period with the change in their place of residence. Under Rabbi Zalman, the townlets of Rosno and Ladi served as capitals. Under his successors, they were Ladi and Lubavitch. The three localities are all situated on the borderline of the government of Vitebsk and Mogilev, in which the Hasidism of Habad persuasion formed either a majority, as was the case in the former government, or a substantial minority, as was the case in the latter. Rabbi Baer, the son and successor of the old rabbi, did not inherit the creative genius of his father. He published many books, made up mostly of his Sabbath discourses, but they lack originality. His method is that of the Talmudic pulpul, transplanted upon the soil of Kabbalah and Hasidism, or it consists in expiating upon the ideas contained in the Tanya. The last years of Rabbi Baer were darkened by the White Russian catastrophes, the expulsion from the villages in 1823, and the ominous turn in the ritual murder trial of Veliz. On his deathbed, he spoke to those around him about the burning topic of the day, the conscription new case of 1827. His successor, Rabbi Mendel Lubavitcher, proved an energetic organizer of the Hasidic masses. He was highly esteemed not only as a learned Talmudist, he wrote rabbinical novelle and response, and as a preacher of Hasidism, but also as a man of great practical wisdom, whose advice was sought by thousands of people in family matters, no less than in communal and commercial affairs. This did not present him from being a decided opponent of the new enlightenment. In the course of Lilienthal's educational propaganda in 1843, Rabbi Mendel was summoned by the government to participate in the deliberation of the rabbinical committee at St. Petersburg. There, he found himself in a tragic situation. He was compelled to give his sanction to the crown schools, although he firmly believed that they were subversive of Judaism, not only because they were originated by Russian officials, but also because they were intended to impart secular knowledge. The Hasidic legend narrates that the Tzaddik pleaded before the committee passionately and often with tears in his eyes, not only to retain in the new schools the traditional methods of Bible and Talmud instruction, but also to make room in their curriculum for the teaching of the Kabbalah. Nevertheless, Rabbi Mendel was compelled to endorse against his will the godless plan of a school reform, and a little later to prefix his approbation to a Russian edition of Mendelssohn's German Bible translation. His attitude toward contemporary pedagogic methods may be gauged from the epistle addressed by him in 1848 to Leon Mandelstam, Lilenta's successor in the task of organizing the Jewish crown schools. In this epistle, Rabbi Mendel categorically rejects all innovations in the training of the young. In reply to a question concerning the edition of an abbreviated Bible text for children, he transcendently quotes the famous medieval aphorism. The Pentateuch was written by Moses at the dictation of God. Hence, every word in it is sacred. There is no difference whatsoever between the verse and Timna was the concubine, Genesis chapter 36, verse 12. And hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. With all, the leaders of the northern Hasidim were, comparatively speaking, men of the world, and were ready here and there to make concessions to the demands of the age. Quite different were the Tzaddiks of the Southwest. They were horrified by the mere thought of such concessions. They were surrounded by immense throngs of Hasidim, 
unenlightened, ecstatic, worshipping saints during their lifetime. The most honored among these Hasidic dynasties were that of Chernobyl. It was founded in the Ukraine toward the end of the 18th century by an itinerant preacher or magid called Nahum. His son Mordecai, known under the endearing name Rabbi Motele, died in 1837, attracted to Chernobyl enormous numbers of pilgrims who brought with them ransom money or pedions. Mordecai's empire fell asunder after his death. His eight sons divided among themselves the whole territory of the Kiev and Volhynia province. Aside from the original center in Chernobyl, seats of tzaddiks were established in the townlets of Korostichev, Cherkasy, Makarov, Turisk, Talno, Skivir, and Lakmistrovka. This resulted in a disgraceful rivalry among the brothers, and still more so among their Hasidic adherents. Every Hasid was convinced that reverence was due only to his own rebbe, and he brushed aside the claims of the other tzaddiks. Whenever the adherents of the various tzaddiks met, they invariably engaged in passionate petty quarrels, which on occasions, especially after the customary Hasidic drinking bouts, ended in physical violence. The whole Chernobyl dynasty found a dangerous rival in the person of the Tzaddik Israel Luzner, or Ruzin, the great-grandson of Rabbi Be'er, the apostle of Hasidim, known as the Mezirichia Magid. Rabbi Israel settled in Ruzin, a townlet in the government of Kiev, about 1815, and rapidly gained fame as a saint and miracle worker. His magnificent court at Ruzin was always crowded with throngs of Hasidim. Their onrush was checked by special gentlemen in waiting, the so called Gabaim, who were very fastidious in admitting the people into the presence of the Tzaddik, dependent upon the size of the proffered gifts. Israel drove out in a gorgeous carriage, surrounded by a guard of honor. The gubernatorial administration of Kiev, presided over by the ferocious governor-general Bibikov, received intimations to the effect that the Tzaddik of Ruzin wielded almost the power of a Tsar among his adherents, who did not stir without his advice. The police began to watch the Tzaddik and at length found an occasion for a frame-up. When, in 1838, the Kahal of Ushitsa in the government of Podolia was implicated in the murder of an informer. Rabbi Israel of Luzin was arrested on the charge of abetting the murder. The Hasidic Tsar languished in prison for 22 months. He was finally set free and placed under police surveillance, but he soon escaped to Austria and settled in 1841 in the Bukovina in the townlet of Sadagora, near Chernovitz, where he established his new court. Many Hasidim in Russia now made their pilgrimage abroad to their beloved Tzaddik. In addition, new partisans were won among the Hasidic masses of Galicia and Bukovina. Rabbi Israel died in 1850, but the Sadagora dynasty branched out rapidly and proved a serious handicap to modern progress during the stormy epoch of emancipation which followed in Austria soon afterwards. Another hotbed of the Tzaddik cult was Podolia, the cradle of Hasidism. In the old residence of Beshid, in Metzibos, the scepter was held by Rabbi Joshua Hessel Apter, who succeeded Beshid's grandson, Rabbi Bork of Tulzin. For a number of years, between 1810 to 1830, the aged Joshua Heschel was revered as the Nestor of Tzaddikism, the haughty Israel of Luzin being the only one who refused to acknowledge his supremacy. Heschel's successor was Rabbi Moshe Sabransky, who established a regular Hasidic court 
after the pattern of Chernobyl and Ruzin. The only Tsarik to whom it was not given to be the founder of a dynasty was the somewhat eccentric Rabbi Naman of Bratslav, a great-grandson of Beshit. After his death, the Bratslav Hasidim, who followed the lead of his disciple Rabbi Nathan, suffered cruel persecutions at the hands of the other Hasidic factions. The Bratslavers adopted the custom of visiting once a year during the high holidays, the grave of their founder in the city of Uman, in the government of Kiev, and subsequently erected a house of prayer near his tomb. During these pilgrimages, they were often the target of the local Hasidim, who reviled and often maltreated them. The Bratislavers were the Cinderella among the Hasidim, lacking the powerful patronage of a living Tzaddik. The heavenly patron, Rabbi Naaman could not hold his own against his living rivals, the earthly tzaddiks, all too earthly, perhaps, in spite of their saintliness. The tzaddik cult was equally diffused in the kingdom of Poland. The place of Rabbi Israel of Kozenitz and Rabbi Jacob Isaac of Lublin, who together marshaled the Hasidic forces during the time of the Varsovian Dutch, was taken by founders and representatives of new Tzaddik dynasties. The most popular among these were the dynasty of Kotsk, established by Rabbi Mendel Kotsk, 1827-1859, and that of Gora Kalvaria, or Geir, founded by Rabbi Isaac Meyer Alter, about 1830-1866. The former reigned supreme in the provinces, the latter in the capital of Poland, in Warsaw, which down to this day has remained loyal to the Geir dynasty. The Polish rebels resembled by the character of their activity the type of the northern or Habad Tzaddiks rather than those of the Ukraine. They did not keep luxurious courts, did not hanker so greedily after donations, and laid greater emphasis on Talmudic scholarship. Hasidism produced not only leaders but also martyrs, victims of the Russian Polish regime. About the time when the Tzaddik of Ruzin fell under suspicion, the Russian government began to watch the Jewish printing press in the Volinian townlet of Slavota. The owners of the press were two brothers, Samuel Abba and Phineas Shapiro, grandsons of Beshit companion, Rabbi Phineas of Kretz. The two brothers were denounced to the authorities as persons issuing dangerous mystical books from their press without the permission of the censor. Their denunciation was linked up with the criminal case, the discovery in the house of the prayer, which was attached to the printing press, of the body of one of the compositors who, it was alleged, had intended to lay bare the activities of the criminal press before the government. After a protracted imprisonment of the two Slavta printers in Kiev, their case was submitted to Nicholas I, who sentenced them to Spitzruten and deportation to Siberia. During the procedure of running the gauntlet, while passing through the lines of whipping soldiers, one of the brothers had his cap knocked off his head. Unconcerned by the hail of lashes from which he was bleeding, he stopped to pick up his cap so as to avoid going bareheaded, and then resumed his march between the two rows of executioners. The unfortunate brothers were released from their Siberian exile during the reign of Alexander II. Hasidic life exhibited, no doubt, many examples of lofty idealism and moral purity. But hand in hand with it went an impenetrable spiritual gloom, boundless credulity, a passion for deifying men of a mediocre and even inferior type, and the unwholesome hypnotizing influence of the tzaddiks. Spiritual self-intoxication was accompanied by physical. The Hasidic rank and file, 
particularly in the southwest, began to develop an ugly passion for alcohol. Originally tolerated as a means of producing cheerfulness and religious ecstasy, drinking gradually became the standing feature of every Hasidic gathering. It was in vogue at the court of the Tzaddik during the rush of pilgrims. It was indulged in after prayers in the Hasidic shitiblaha or houses of prayer, and was accompanied by dancing and by the ecstatic narration of the miraculous exploits of the rabbi. Many Hasidim lost themselves completely in this idle revelry and neglected their business affairs and their starving families, looking forward in their blind fatalism to the blessings which were to be showered upon them through the intercession of the tzaddik. It would be manifestly unjust to view the Hasidic indulgence in alcohol in the same light as the senseless drunkenness of the Russian peasant, transforming men into a beast. The Hasid drank, and in moderate doses at that, for the soul, to banish the grief which blunted the heart, to arouse religious exaltation and enliven his social intercourse with his fellow believers. Yet the consequences were equally sad, for the habit resulted in drowsiness of thought, idleness and economic ruin, insensibility to the outside world and to the social movement of the age, as well as in stolid opposition to cultural progress in general. It must be borne in mind that during the era of external oppression and military inquisition, the reactionary forces of Hasidism acted as the only antidote against the reactionary force from the outside. Hasidism and Tzaddikism were, so to speak, a sleeping draught which dulled the pain of the blows dealt out to the unfortunate Jewish populace by the Russian government. But in the long run, the popular organism was injuriously affected by this mystic opium. The poison rendered its consumers insensible to every progressive movement and planted them firmly at the extreme pole of obscurantism at a time when the Russian ghetto resounded with the first appeals calling its inmates toward the light, toward the regeneration and the uplift of inner Jewish life. End of section 9. Section 10 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Dubunov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim, Manikut Baisho, Portugal. Chapter 16 the inner life of Russian Jewry during the period of military despotism, Part Two. Three, the Russian Mendelssohn, Isaac Bear Levinson. It was in the hotbed of the most fanatical species of Hasidism that the first blossoms of Haskalah timidly raised their heads. Isaac Bear Levinson, from Kremenets in Podolia. 1788 to 1860, had associated in his younger days with the champions of enlightenment in adjacent Galicia, such as Joseph Perl, Naman Krochman, and their followers. When he came back to his native land, it was with the firm resolve to devote his energies to the task of civilizing the secular masses of Russian Jewry. In lonesome quietude, carefully guarding his designs from the outside world, which was exclusively Hasidic. He worked at his book, Teude Be Israel, Instruction in Israel, which, after many difficulties, he managed to publish in Vilna in 1828. In this book, our author endeavored, without trespassing the boundaries of orthodox religious tradition, to demonstrate the following elementary truths by citing examples from Jewish history and sayings of great Jewish authorities. 1. 
the Jew is obliged to study the Bible as well as Hebrew grammar and to interpret the biblical text in accordance with the plain grammatical sense. 2. The Jewish religion does not condemn the knowledge of foreign language and literatures, especially of the language of the country, such knowledge being required both in the personal interest of the individual Jew and in common interest of the Jewish people. 3. The study of secular sciences is not attended by any danger for Judaism, men of the type of Maimonides having remained loyal Jews in spite of their extensive general culture. 4. It is necessary from the economic point of view to strengthen productive labor, such as handicrafts and agriculture, at the expense of commerce and brokerage, also to discourage early marriages between persons who are unprovided for and have no definite occupation. These commonplaces sounded to their generation like epoch-making revelations. They were condemned as rank heresies by all the powerful obscurantists and hailed as a gospel of the approaching Renaissance by that handful of progressives who dreamt of a new Jewish life and cowed by the fear of persecution, hid these thoughts deep down in their breasts. A similar fear compelled Levinson to exercise the utmost reserve and caution in criticizing the existing order of things. The same consideration forced him to shield himself behind the pseudonym in publishing his anti-Hasidic satire, Dibre Tzadikum, The Words of the Tzadiks, Vienna, 1830, a rather feeble imitation of Megale Temirin, the Hebrew counterpart of the Epistles of Obscure Men by Joseph Perel. His principal work, entitled Bet Yehuda, The House of Judah, a semi-philosophic, semi-publicistic review of the history of Judaism, remained for a long time in manuscript. Levinson was unable to publish it for the reason that even the printing press of Vilna, the only one to issue publications of a non-religious character, was afraid of bringing out a book which had failed to receive the approbation of the local rabbis. Several years later, in 1839, the volume finally came out, clothed in the form of a reply to inquiries addressed to the author by a high Russian official. From the point of view of Jewish learning, Bet Yehuda can claim but scanty merits. It lacks that depth of philosophic historic insight which distinguishes so brilliantly the guide of the perplexed of our time of the Galician thinker Krochman. The writer's principal task is to prove from history his rather trite doctrine that Judaism had at no time shunned secular culture and philosophy. For the rest, the author, quite shy of the difficult problems of religious philosophy and is always on the lookout for compromises. Even with reference to the Kabbalah, with which Levinson had but little sympathy, he says timidly, it is not for us to judge these lofty matters, chapter 135. Fear of the orthodox environment compels him to observe almost complete silence with reference to Hasidism, although in his private correspondence and in his anonymous writings he denounces it severely. Levinson concludes his historic review of Judaism with a eulogy upon the Russian government for its kindness towards the Jews, chapter 151, and with the following plan of reform suggested to it for execution, chapter 146. To open elementary schools for the teaching of Hebrew and the tenets of Jewish religion, as well as of Russian and arithmetic, and to establish institutions of higher rabbinical learning in the larger cities, to institute the office of chief rabbi with the supreme council under him, 
which should be in charge of Jewish spiritual and communal affairs in Russia, to allot to a third of the Russian Jewish population parcels of land for agricultural purposes, to prohibit luxuries in dress and furniture in which even the impernicious classes are prone to indulge. Levinson was not satisfied to propagate his ideas by purely literary means. He anticipated meager results from a literary propaganda among the broad Jewish masses in which the mere reading of such licentious books were considered a criminal offense. He had greater faith in his ability to carry out the regeneration of Jewish life with the powerful help of the government. As a matter of fact, Levinson had long before this begun to knock at the doors of the Russian government offices. Far back in 1823, he had presented to the heir apparent Konstantin Pavlovich a memorandum concerning Jewish sects and a project looking to the establishment of a system of Jewish schools and seminaries. Moreover, before publishing his first work, Teude, he had submitted the manuscript to Shishkov, the reactionary minister of public instruction, applying for a government subsidy towards the publication of a work which demonstrates the usefulness of enlightenment and agriculture, instill love for the Tsar as well as for the people with which we share our life, and recounts the innumerable favors which they have bestowed upon us. These words were penned on December 2, 1827, three months after the promulgation of the painful conscription new case ordering the compulsory enlistment of underage Cantonists. The request was complied with. A year later, the humble Bolinian literateur received by imperial command an award of 1,000 rubles, $500, for a work having for its object the moral transformation of the Jews. This award came when the volume had already appeared in print, in the terrible year 1828, which was marked by the first conscription of Jewish recruits, the ominous turn in the ritual murder trial of Feliz, and the constant tightening of the knots of disabilities. But these events failed to cure the political naivety of Levinson. In 1831, he laid before Leven, the new minister of public instruction, a memorandum advocating the necessity of modifications in Jewish religious life. Again, in 1833, he came forward with the dangerous proposal to close all Jewish printing presses except those situated in towns in which there was a censorship. The project was accompanied by a list of ancient and modern Hebrew books indicating those that may be considered useful and those that are harmful, the Hasidic works were declared to belong to the latter category. Levinson's project was partly instrumental in prompting the grievous law of 1836, which raised a cry of despair in the pale of settlement, ordering a revision of the entire Hebrew literature by Russian censors. Levinson's action would have been ignoble had it not been naive. The recluse of Kremenets, passionately devoted to his people but wanting in political foresight, was calling Russian officialdom to aid in his fight against the bigotry of the Jewish masses in the childish conviction that the Russian authorities had the welfare of the Jews truly at heart and that compulsory measures would do away with the hostility of the Jewish populace toward enlightenment. He failed to perceive, as did also some of his like-minded contemporaries, that the culture which the Russian government of his time was trying to foist upon the Jews was only apt to accentuate their distrust, that so long as they were the target of persecution, the Jews could not possibly accept the gift of enlightenment from the hands of those who lured them to the baptismal font, 
pushed their children on the path of religious treason and were ruthless in breaking and disfiguring their whole mode of life. In his literary works, Levinson was fond of emphasizing his relations with high government officials. This probably saved him from a great deal of unpleasantness on the part of the fanatic Hasidim, but it also had the effect of increasing his unpopularity among the Orthodox. The only merit the latter were willing to concede to Levinson was that of an apologist who defended Judaism against the attacks of non-Jews. During the epidemic of ritual murder trials, the rabbis of Lithuania and Volhynia addressed a request to Levinson to write a book against this hurried libel. At their suggestion, he published his work, Ifes Damim, No Blood, Vilna, 1837, in the form of dialogue between a Jewish sage and a Greek Orthodox patriarch in Jerusalem. Somewhat later, Levinson wrote another apologetic treatise defending the Talmud against the attacks contained in the book Netibot Olam, published in 1839 by the London missionary McCall. Levinson's great apologetic work, Jerubabel, which appeared several years after his death, was equally dedicated to the defense of the Talmud. It has, moreover, considerable scientific merit being one of the first research works in the domain of Talmudic theology. A number of other publications by Levinson deal with Hebrew philosophy and lexicography. All these efforts support Levinson's claim to the title of founder of a modern Jewish science in Russia, though his scholarly achievements cannot be classed with those of his German and Galician fellow writers, such as Rappaport, Junz, Joost, and Geiger. Levinson stood entirely aloof from the propaganda of bureaucratic enlightenment, which was carried on by Lilienthal in the name of Ubarov. The Volinian hermit was completely overshadowed by the energetic young German. Even when Lilienthal, after realizing that a union between Jewish culture and Russian officialdom was altogether unnatural, had disappeared from the stage, Levinson still persisted in cultivating his relations with the government. But by the time the bureaucrats of St. Petersburg had no more use for the Jewish friends of enlightenment. Broken in health, chained to his bed for a half a lifetime, without means of subsistence, lowly amidst a hostile orthodox environment, Levinson time and again addressed to St. Petersburg, humiliating appeals for monetary assistance, occasionally receiving small pittances, which were booked under the heading Relief in Distress, accepted subventions from various Jewish mecenas, and remained a pauper till the end of his life. The pioneer of modern culture among Russian Jews, the founder of neo-Hebraic literature, spent his life in the midst of a realm of darkness, shunned like an outcast, appreciated by a mere handful of sympathizers. It was only after his death that he was crowned with laurels when the intellectuals of Russian Jewry were beginning to press forward in close formation. 4. The Rise of Neo-Hebraic Culture the Volinian soil proved unfavorable for the seeds of enlightenment. The Haskala pioneers were looked upon as dangerous enemies in this hotbed of Tzadikism. They were held in disgrace and were often the victims of cruel persecutions from which some saved themselves by conversion. A more favorable soil for cultural endeavors was found in the extreme south of the Pale of Settlement as well as in its northern section. Odessa, the useful capital of New Russia, and Vilna, the old capital of Lithuania, both became centers of the Haskala movement. As far as Odessa was concerned, the seeds of enlightenment had been carried hither from neighboring Galicia by the Jews of Brody, who formed a wealthy merchant colony in the city. 
as early as 1826, Odessa saw the opening of the first Jewish school for secular education, which was managed at first by Sittenfeld and later on by the well-known public worker Bezalel Stone. Among the teachers of the new school was Simha Pinsko, who subsequently became the historian of Karaism. This school, the only educational establishment of its kind during that period, served in Odessa as a center for the Friends of Enlightenment. Being a new city unfettered by traditions and at the same time a large seaport with a checkered international population, Odessa outran other Jewish centers in the process of modernization, though it must be confessed that it never went beyond the externalities of civilization. As far as the period under discussion is concerned, the Jewish center of South can claim no share in the production of new Jewish values. While yielding to Odessa in point of external civilization, Vilna surpassed the capital of the South by a store of mental energy. The circle of the Vilna Maskilim, which came into being during the fourth decade of the 19th century, gave rise to the two founders of neo-Hebraic literary style, the prose writer Mordecai Aaron Ginzburg, 1796-1846, and the poet Abraham Bear Levinson, 1794-1878. Born in Townlet Saland in the Zmud region, lived for some time in Courland and finally settled in Vilna. He managed to familiarize himself with German literature and was so fascinated by it that he started his literary career by translating and adapting German works into Hebrew. His translation of Campus' Discovery of America and Polish Universal History as well as his own history of the Franco-Russian War of 1812, compiled from various sources, were, as far as Russia is concerned, the first specimens of secular literature in pure Hebrew, which boldly claimed their place side by side with rabbinic and Hasidic writings. In that juvenile stage of the Hebrew Renaissance, when the mere treatment of language and style was considered an achievement, even the appearance of such elementary books was hailed as epoch-making. The profoundest influence on the formation of the neo hebraic style must be ascribed to two other works by the same author, Kiryai Sefer, an epistolary manual containing specimens of personal commercial, and other forms of correspondence, Vilna, 1835, and many later editions, and Debir, a miscellaneous collection of essays consisting for the most part of translations and compilations, Vilna, 1844. Ginsburg's premature death in 1846 was mourned by the Vilna Masklim as the loss of a leader in the struggles for neo-Hebraic Renaissance, and they gave expression to these sentiments in verse and prose. Ginsburg's autobiography, Abiezer, 1863, and his letters, David, Volume 2, 1861, portrayed the milieu in which our author grew up and developed. Abram Bear Levinson, a native of Vilna, Awakened the dormant Hebrew lyre by the sonorous rhymes of his songs in the sacred tongue. Shire Sephard Kodesh, Volume 1, Leipzig, 1842. In this volume, solemn odes celebrating events of all kinds alternate with lyrical poems of a philosophical content. The unaccustomed ear of the Jew of that period was struck by these powerful sounds of rhymed biblical speech, which exhibited greater elegance and harmony than the Mosaic of Wesley, the Jewish club stock. His compositions, which are marked by thought rather than by feeling, suited to perfection the taste of the contemporary Jewish reader 
who was ever on the lookout for intellectuality, even when poetry was concerned. Philosophic and moralizing lyrics are a characteristic feature of Levinson's pen. The general human sorrow, common to all individuals, stirs him more deeply than national grief. His only composition of a nationalistic character, the wailing of the daughter of Judah, seems strangely out of harmony with the accompanying odes which celebrate the coronation of Nicholas I and similar patriotic occasions, although the wailing is shrewdly prefaced by a note evidently meant for the censor to the effect that the poem refers to the Middle Ages. At any rate, the principal merits of the songs in the sacred tongue is not to be sought in their poetry, but rather in their style, for it was this style which became the basis of neo-Hebraic poetic diction, perfected more and more by the poets of the succeeding generations. Ginsburg and Levinson were the central pillars of the Vilna masculine circle, which also included men of the type of Samuel Joseph Fuhn, the historian, Metadaya Strassen, the Talmudist, the censor Tugenhold, the bibliographer Ben Jacob, and Rosenthal, in a word, the radicals of that era, for the mere striving for the restoration of biblical Hebrew and for elementary secular education was looked upon as bold radicalism. The same circle made an attempt to create a scientific periodical after the pattern of similar publications in Galicia and Germany. In 1841 and 1843, two issues of the magazine Pire Zafan, Flowers of the North, appeared in Vilna under Fuhn's editorship. The volume contains scientific and publicistic articles as well as poems contributed by the feeble literary talents which were then active in the Hebrew literary and educational revival in Russia, all of them efforts of not very high merit. But even these poor hothouse flowers were fated to be nipped in the northern chill. The ruthless Russian censorship centered in the unassuming magazine of the Vilna Masculine, a criminal attempt to publish a Hebrew periodical. Such an undertaking required an official license from the central government in St. Petersburg, and the latter was not in the habit of granting licenses for such purposes. In Vilna, as in Odessa, the coterie of local masculine formed the mainstay of Lilienthal, the apostle of enlightenment, in his struggle with the Orthodox. In the year 1840, prior to Lilienthal's arrival, when the first intimation of Uvarov's plans reached the city of Vilna, the local masculine responded to the call of the government in a circular letter in which the following four cardinal reforms were emphasized. 1. The transformation of the rabbinate through the establishment of rabbinical seminaries, the appointment of graduates from German universities as rabbis, and the formation of consistories after the pattern of Western Europe. 2. The reform of school education through the opening of secular schools after the model of Odessa and Riga, and the training of new teachers from among the masculine. 3. The struggle with the fiends of obscurantism, who strifle every endeavor for popular enlightenment. 4. The improvement of Jewish economic life by intensifying agricultural colonization, the establishment of technical and arts and craft schools and similar measures. Several years later, the authors of this circular had reason to share Lilienthal's disillusionment over the benevolent intentions of the government. This, however, was not strong enough to uproot the original sin of the Haskalah, its constant readiness to lean for support upon enlightened absolutism. The despotism of the Orthodox and the intolerance of the unenlightened masses forced the handful of masculine to fall back upon 
those who, in the eyes of the Jewish populace, were the source of its sorrow and tears. There was a profound tragedy in this incongruity. The culture movement in Russia of the second quarter of the 19th century corresponds in its complexion to the early stage of the Mendelssohnian Enlightenment in Germany, the period of the Measefim. But there were also essential differences between the two. The beginning of a German Enlightenment was accompanied by a strong drift toward assimilation, which led to the elimination of the national language from literature. In Russia, the initial period of Haskala was not marked by any sudden social and cultural upheavals. On the contrary, it laid the foundations for a national literary renaissance, which in the following period was destined to become an important social factor. 5. The Jews and the Russian people As for the Russian people, an impenetrable wall continued as theretofore to keep it apart from the Jewish population. To the inhabitants of the two Russian capitals and of the interior of the empire, the pale of settlement seemed as distant as China, while among the Russians living within the pale, the sparks of former historic conflagration, the prejudices of the ages, and the unenlightened notions of days gone by were still glimmering beneath the ashes. The ignorance of some and the vicious prejudices of others could not very well manifest themselves in periodical literature for the simple reason that in pre-reformatory Russia, throttled by the hand of the censorship, none was in existence. Only in Russian fiction, one might see the shadow of the Jew moving across. In the imagination of the great Russian poet Pushkin, this shadow wavered between the despised Jew of the street in the Black Shoal, 1820, and the figure of the venerable old man reading the Bible under the shelter of the night, in the beginning of a novel, 1832. On the other hand, in Gogol's Taras Bulba, 1835-1842, the Jew bears the well-defined features of an inhuman fiend. In the delineation of the hideous figure of Zid Yankel, a mercenary, soulless, dastardly creature, Gogol, the descendant of the Heidemarks, gave vent to his inherited hatred of the Jew, the victim of Kmelitsky, and the Heidemarks. In these dismal historic tragedies, in the figures of the Jewish martyrs of old Ukraine, Gogol can only discern miserable, terror-stricken creatures. Thus, one of the principal founders of Russian fiction set up in its very center the repelling scarecrow of a Jew, an abomination of desolation which poured the poison of hatred into the hearts of the Russian readers and determined to a certain extent the literary types of later writers. In the backyards of Russian literature, which were then most of all patronized by the reading public, the literary slanderer Tadeusz Bulgarin delineated in his novel Ivan Vizigin, 1829, the type of a Lithuanian Jew by the name of Mofsha, Moses, who appears as the embodiment of all mortal sins. The product of an untalented and tainted pen, Bulgarin's novel was soon forgotten, yet it contributed its share towards instilling Jew hatred into the minds of the Russian people. End of section 10section 11 of history of the jews in russia and poland volume 2 from the death of alexander the first until the death of alexander the third 1825 to 1894 by shimon dubnov translated by israel friedlander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by ss kim manikut baisho portugal chapter 17 
The Last Years of Nicholas I. 1. The Assortment of the Jews The beginning of the Second Emancipation of 1848 in Western Europe synchronized with the last phase of the era of oppression in Russia. That phase, representing the concluding seven years of pre-reformatory Russia, was a dark patch in the life of the country at large, doubly dark in the life of the Jews. The power of absolutism, banished by the March Revolution from the European West, asserted itself with intensified fury in the land of the North, which had about that time earned the unenviable reputation of gendarme of Europe. Thrown back on its last stronghold, absolutism concentrated its energy upon the suppression of all kinds of revolutionary movements. In default of such a movement in Russia itself, this energy broke through the frontier line and found an outlet in the punitive expedition sent to support the Austrians in the pacification of mutinous Hungary. The triumphant passwords of political freedom, which were given out on the other side of the western frontier, only intensified the reactionary rage on this side. Since it was impossible to punish action, for under the vigilant eye of the terrible third section, revolutionary endeavors were a matter of impossibility, word and thought were subject to punishment. Censorship ran riot in the subdued literature of Russia, tearing out by the roots anything that did not fit into the mold of the bureaucratic way of thinking. The quiet precincts of the Russian intelligentsia, who, in the retirement of their homes, ventured to dream of a better political and social order, were invaded by political detectives who snatched thence numerous victims for the scaffold, the galleys, and conscription. Such were the contrivances employed during the last years of pre-reformatory Russia to hold together the old order of things in the land of officialdom and serfdom, in that Russia which the poet Kolmakov, though patriotic and slavophile, branded thus. Blackened in court with falsehood blackness, and stained by the yoke of slavery, full of godless flattery, of vicious lying, and every possible knavery. But the full weight of the yoke of slavery and falsehood blackness, by which pre-reformatory Russia was marked, fell upon the shoulders of the most hapless section of Russian subjects, the Jews. The tragic gloom of the end of Nicholas' reign finds its only parallel in Jewish annals in the beginning of the same reign. The would-be reforms proposed in the interval in the beginning of the 40s did not deceive the popular instinct. The Jews of the Pale saw not only the hand which was holding forth the Charter of Enlightenment, but also the other hand which hid a stone in the form of new cruel restrictions. Soon, the government drew off the mask of enlightenment and set out to realize its reserve program, that of correcting the Jews by police methods. It will be remembered that the principal item in this program was the assortment of the Jews, i.e. the segregation from among them of all persons without a certain status as to property or without definite occupation for the purpose of proceeding against them as criminal members of society. As far back as 1846, the government forewarned the Jews of the imminent bloody operation over a whole class against which Governor-General Voronsov had vainly protested. All Jews were ordered to register at the earliest possible moment among the guilds and estates assigned to them with the understanding that in case this measure should fail, the government would of itself carry out the assortment to wit, it will set apart the Jews who are not engaged in productive labor and will subject them as burdensome to society to various restrictions. The threat fell flat, for it was rather too much to expect that fully a half of the Jewish population 
doomed by civil disabilities and general economic conditions to a life of want and distress, could obtain at a stroke the necessary property status or definite occupations. Accordingly, on November 23, 1851, the Tsar gave his sanction to the temporary rules concerning the assortment of the Jews. All Jews were divided into five categories. Merchants, agriculturalists, artisans, settled burghers and unsettled burghers. The first three categories were to be made up of those who were enrolled among the corresponding guilds and estates. Settled burghers were to be those engaged in burger trade with business licenses, also the clergy and the learned class. The remaining huge mass of the proletariat was placed in the category of unsettled burghers who were liable to increased military conscription and to harsher legal restrictions as compared with the first four tolerated classes of Jews. This hapless proletariat, either out of work or only occasionally at work, was to bear a double measure of oppression and persecution and was to be branded as despised pariahs. By April the 1st, 1852, the Jews belonging to the four tolerated categories were required to produce their certificates of enrollment before the local authorities. Those who had failed to do so were to be entered into the fifth category, the criminal class of unsettled burghers. Within the brief space allotted to them, the Jews found themselves unable to obtain the necessary documents and thanks to the representations of the governors general of the Western governments, the term was extended till the autumn of 1852, but even then the assortment had not yet been accomplished. The government was fully prepared to launch a series of draconian laws against the parasites including police inspection and compulsory labor, but while engaged in these charitable projects, the lawgivers were taken aback by the Crimean War, which, with its disastrous consequences for Russia, diverted their attention from their war against the Jews. Yet, for a successive number of years, the law concerning the assortment, or Razriaden, as it was popularly styled by the Jews, hung like the sword of Damocles over the heads of hundreds of thousands of Jews, and the anxiety of the suffering masses were poured out in sad popular ditties. Ah, Azore, Agzraye, Miti, Razriadin. Alas, what misfortune and persecution there is in the assortment. 2. Compulsory Assimilation as for the measures of compulsory assimilation long ago foreshadowed by the government, such as the substitution of the Russian or German style of dress for the traditional Jewish attire, the long coat of the man, they were without any effect on Jewish life and merely resulted in confusion and consternation. A court imperial U case issued on May the 1st, 1850, prohibited all over the empire the use of distinct Jewish form of dress beginning with January the 1st, 1851, though the governors general were given the right of permitting aged Jews to wear out their old garments on the payment of a definite tax. The prohibition extended to the earlocks or payers of the men. A year later, in April 51, the government made a further step in advance and proceeded to deal with the female attire. His Imperial Majesty was graciously pleased to command that Jewish women be forbidden to shave their heads upon entering into marriage. In October 1852, this case was supplemented by regulation that a married Jewish guilty of shaving her head was liable to a fine of five rubles, two and a half dollars, and the rabbi abetting the crime was to be prosecuted. Since neither the Jews nor the Jewish were willing to submit to imperial orders, the former from habit, the latter from religious scruples, 
the provincial authorities entered upon a regular warfare against these rebels. Both the governors general and the governors subordinate to them displayed extraordinary enthusiasm in this direction. The officials tracked with utmost zeal not only the women culprits but also their accomplices, the rabbis who attended the wedding ceremony, even including the barbers who were called in to shave the heads of the Jewish ladies. Jewish women were examined at the police stations to find out whether they still wore their own hair beneath their kerchiefs or wigs. Frequently, the struggle manifested itself in tragic comic and even repulsive forms. In some places, the police adopted the practice of cutting the payers or shortening the long coats of the Jews by force. The opposition to the authorities was particularly vigorous in the Kingdom of Poland where the ranks and file of Hasidim were ready to suffer martyrdom for any Jewish custom, however obsolete. The fight was drawn out for a long time, even reached into the following reign, but the victory remained with the obstreperous masses. Though at a later period, as the result of general cultural tendencies, the traditional Jewish costume made way in certain sections of Jewry for the European form of dress, it was not in obedience to police measures, but in spite of them. Compulsory assimilation was as little successful now as had been compulsory isolation in the Middle Ages. The medieval rulers had imposed upon the Jews a distinct form of garment and a yellow badge to keep them apart from the Christians. Nicholas I employed forcible means to make the Jews by their style of dress appear similar to the Christians. The violence resorted to in both cases, though different in form, sprang from the same motive. 3. New conscription horrors There was yet one domain in which the squeezing and pressing power of Tzadom could fully employ in its destructive energy. We refer to military conscription. This genuine creation of the imperial brain became more and more intolerable, serving in Jewish life as a penal and correctional agency with its capture of old and young, its inquisitorial regime of Cantonists, its deportation for a quarter of a century and longer into far-off regions. Even the Russian peasants were stricken with terror at the thought of Nicholas' conscription, which in the reminiscence of the portrayers of that period is pictured as lifelong deportation, and they frequently shirked military duty by fleeing from the landowners and hiding themselves in the woods. How much more terrible must then conscription have been for the Jews, whose family was robbed both of a young father and a tender son? No means were left unused to evade this atrocious obligation. The reports of the governors refer to the immeasurable difficulties in carrying out the conscription among the Jews. Apart from innumerable cases of self-mutilation, to quote the words of one of these reports written in 1850, the disappearance, without exception, of all able-bodied Jews has become so general that in some communities outside of those unfit for military service because of age or physical defects, not a single person can be found during conscription who might be drafted into the army. Some flee abroad, whilst others hide in adjacent governments. Those in hiding were hunted down like wild beasts. Their life, as a contemporary witness testifies, was worse than that of galley slaves, for the slightest indiscretion brought ruin upon them. Many resorted to self-mutilation to render themselves unfit for military service. They chopped off their fingers or toes, damaged their eyesight, and perpetrated every possible form of maiming to evade the military service, which was in effect penal servitude. The most tender-hearted mother, to quote a contemporary, would place the finger of her beloved son 
under the kitchen knife of a home-bred clerk surgeon. This evasion resulted in immense shortages which pressed heavily upon the Jewish communities since the latter were held collectively responsible for supplying the full quota of recruits. The reports about the unsatisfactory conscription results among the Jews filled the government in St. Petersburg with rage. The persistent reluctance of human beings to be parted almost for life from those near and dear to them or to see their little ones carried off to an early grave or to the baptismal font was regarded as manifestation of criminal self-will. Accordingly, the former measures of cutting short and curbing this self-will were improved upon by new ones. In December 1850, the Tsar gave orders that for every missing Jewish recruit in a given community, three men of the minimum age of 20 from the same community and one more recruit for every 2,000 rubles, $1,000 of tax, Warriors should be impressed into service. A year later, the following atrocious measures were issued for the purpose of cutting short the concealment of Jews from military service. The fugitives were captured, flocked, and drafted into the army over and above the required quota of recruits. The communities in which they were hidden were to be fined. The relatives of recruits who failed to present himself in proper time were to be taken in his stead, even if these relatives happened to be heads of families. The official representatives of the communities were equally liable to being sent into the army if found convicted of any inaccuracy in carrying out the conscription. A reign of terror followed in the Jewish communities upon the promulgation of these laws. The Kahal elders, it will be remembered that they continued to exist after the abrogation of the Kahals, acting as the fiscal agents of the government, now faced a terrible alternative. To become, in the words of a contemporary, either murderers or martyrs, i.e., either to capture and send to, into the army, any youth or boy without discrimination, or themselves to don the gray uniform and be impressed into military services as penal recruits. In consequence, a fiendish hunt after human beings was set at foot in the pale of settlement. Adults were seized and, regardless of their being the only mainstay of their families, were taken captive and children of eight were captured and presented to the recruiting authorities as being of the obligatory age of 12. But despite all this hunting, many communities were not able to furnish their quota of soldiers and the number of penal recruits from among the Kahal elders was very considerable. Weeping and mourning resounded in the neighborhood of the recruiting stations in the Jewish towns where parents and relatives took leave from their dear ones who were doomed to a perpetual barrack life. And yet the fury of the government was not satisfied. In 1853, new temporary rules were issued by way of experiment whereby not only communities but also individuals among Jews were granted the right of offering as their substitutes any fellow Jew from another city than his own who was caught without a passport. Any Jew who happened to absent himself from his place of residence without a passport could be seized and drafted into service as a substitute for a regular recruit due from the family of the captor. The captive, regardless of age, was made a soldier, and the captor was given a receipt for one recruit. A new ferocious hunt began. The official captors employed by the cars were no longer the only ones to prowl after living prey. The chase was now taken up by every private individual who wished to find a substitute for a member of his family or who simply wanted to turn a penny by selling his recruiting receipt. Hordes of Jewish bandits sprang up who infested the road and the inns, and by trickery or force 
made the travelers part with their passports and then dragged them to the recruiting stations as captives to be sent into the army. Never before had the Jewish masses, yielding to pressure from above, sunk to such depths of degradation. The Jew became a beast of prey to his fellow Jew. Jews were afraid of budging an inch from their native cities. Every passerby was suspected of being a captor or a bandit. The recruiting inquisition of Nicholas inflicted upon the Jews the utmost limit of martyrdom. It set Jew against Jew, called forth a war of all against all, threw the tortured and the torturer into one heap, and sullied the Jewish soul. All this took place while the Crimean War was going on. The Russian army, on the altar of which so many human sacrifices had been offered in the course of 30 years, marched to save the honor of Russia, in truth, to save the old regime. Squadron upon squadron issued from the inner recesses of Russia and marched towards the battlefield of the south, marched to the slaughter, into the mouth of the cannons of the English and French, who knew how to conquer without penal conscriptions and without inflicting tortures upon tender aged Cantonists. The gendarme of Europe, who armed to his teeth, had contemptuously threatened to finish the enemy with his soldier caps, could not hold out against the army of the rotten West. Hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers fell beneath the walls of Sevastopol upon the heights of Inkerman. Thousands of Jewish soldiers were laid among them in brotherly graves. The Jews, enslaved by pre-reformatory Russia, died for a fatherland which treated them as pariahs which had bestowed upon them a monstrous conscription, the unexampled institutions of Cantonists, penal recruits, and captives. However, it soon became clear that those who had fallen under the walls of Sevastopol had sealed by their death not the honor, but the dishonor of the old regime of blood and iron. Beneath the rotting corpse of an obsolete statecraft, built upon serfdom and maintained by soldiery and police, the germs of new and better Russia began to stir. 4. The Ritual Murder Trial of Saratov One more detail was lacking to complete the dismal picture and to bring out the full symmetry between the end of Nicholas' reign and its ominous beginning, a medieval ritual murder trial after the pattern of the Valise case. And the trial of this nature did not fail to come. In December 1852 and in January 1853, two Russian boys from among the lower classes disappeared in the city of Saratov in central Russia. Their bodies were found two or three months later in the Volga, covered with wounds and bearing the traces of circumcision. The latter circumstance led the coroners to believe that the crime had been perpetrated by Jews. Saratov, a city situated outside the Pale of Settlement, harbored at that time a small Jewish settlement consisting of some 40 soldiers of the local garrison and several civilian Jewish tradesmen and artisans who lived in the prohibited Volga town by the grace of the police. There were also a few converts. The vigilant eyes of the coroners were riveted on this settlement. An official by the name of Durnovo, who had been dispatched from St. Petersburg to take charge of the case, began at once to direct the inquiry into the channel of a ritual murder case. Needless to say, there was soon found material witness from among the ignorant or criminal class who were under the hypnotic influence of the ritual murder myth. A private called Bogdanov, who had been convicted of vagrancy and an intoxicated gubernatorial official by the name of Krieger, testified that they were present at the time when the Jews squeezed out the blood from the bodies of the murdered boys. They also mentioned by name the principal perpetrators of the murder, 
the circumcision expert in the local Jewish settlement, a soldier called Schlieffmann, and a furrier named Yankel Yushkevichia, a devout Jew. The incriminated Jews were thrown into prison, but despite excruciating cross-examinations, they and the other defendants indignantly denied not only their complicity in the murder, but also the trial murder accusation as a whole. The investigation became more and more involved, drawing into its net a constantly growing number of persons until in July 1854, a special judicial commission was appointed by order of Nicholas I for the purpose of disclosing not only the particular crime committed at Saratov, but also of investigating the dogmas of the religious fanaticism of the Jews. The latter task, being of a theoretic nature, was entrusted in 1855 to a special commission under the auspices of the Ministry of the Interior. Among the theologians and Hebraists who were members of that commission was also the baptized professor Daniel Scholzen, who had scientifically disproved the ritual legend. In 1856, after a protracted inquiry of two years, the Judicial Commission, having failed to discover evidence against the accused, decided to set them at liberty but to leave them under strong suspicion. In the meantime, Alexander II had ascended the throne of the Tsars, and the dawn of Russian Renaissance began to disperse the nightmares of the past era. Yet, so deeply ingrained were the old prejudices in many bureaucratic minds that when the conclusion reached by the Judicial Commission was submitted to the Senate, the vote was divided. The case was transferred to the Council of State, and there the high dignitaries managed to effect a compromise between their medieval prejudices and their involuntary concessions to the spirit of the age. They refused to enter into a discussion of the still unsolved question as to the use of Christian blood by the Jews, but they unhesitatingly recognized the existence of the crime itself, which had been perpetrated at Saratov, this in spite of the fact that the only ground on which the crime was ascribed to alleged fanatical practices and laid at the door of the Jews were the traces of circumcision on the dead bodies. Ignoring this inner contradiction and setting aside the weighty objections of the liberal minister of justice, Jamiatin, the Council of State brought in a verdict of guilty against the impeached Jews, the soldier Schlieffmann and the two Yushkevichers, senior and junior, sentencing them to penal servitude. The sentence was confirmed by Alexander II in May 1860. The representatives of the St. Petersburg community, Baron Joseph Ginzburg and others, petitioned the Tsar to postpone the verdict until the scholarly commission of experts should have rendered its decision with regard to the compatibility of ritual murder with the teachings of Judaism. But the president of the Council of State, Count Orlov, presented the matter to the Tsar in a different light, asserting that all that the Jews intended by their petition was to keep off for an indefinite period the decision on a case in which their co-religionists are involved. He therefore insisted on the immediate execution of the sentence, and the Tsar yielded. After eight long years of incarceration, in the course of which two of the impeached Jews committed suicide, the principal perpetrator was found to be physical wrecks and no longer able to discharge their penal servitude. The innocent sufferer, old Yushkevichia, languished in prison for seven more years and was finally liberated in 1867 by order of Alexander II, who had been petitioned by Adolf Krimer, the president of the Alliance Israelite Universe, to pardon the unhappy man. In this way, the heritage of the dark past 
protruded into the increasing brightness of the new Russia, which in the beginning of the 60s was passing through the era of great reforms. End of section 11. Section 12 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Dubnov. Translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim. Manikt by Shaw, Portugal. Chapter 18. The Era of Reforms under Alexander II. Part 1. 1. The Abolition of Juvenile Conscription. When after the Crimean War, which had exposed the rottenness of the older order of things, a fresh current of air swept through the atmosphere of Russia, and the liberation of the peasantry and other great reforms were coming to fruition, the Jewish problem, too, was in line of being placed in the forefront of these reforms. For after having done away with the institution of serfdom, the state was consistently bound to liberate its three million Jewish serfs, who had been ruthlessly oppressed and persecuted during the old regime. Unfortunately, the Jewish question, which was nothing more nor less than the question of equal citizenship for the Jews, was not placed in the line of great reforms, but was pushed to the rear and solved fragmentarily on the installment plan, as it were, and within narrowly circumscribed limits. Like all the other officially inspired reforms of that period, which proceeded up to a certain point and halted before the prohibited zone of constitutional and political liberties, so too the solution of the Jewish problem was not allowed to pass beyond the borderline. For the crossing of that line would have rendered the whole question null and void by the simple recognition of the equality of all citizens. The regenerated Russia of Alexander II stubborn in its refusal of political freedom and civil equality, could only choose the path of half measures. Nevertheless, the transition from the pre-reformatory order of things to the new state of affairs signified a radical departure both in the life of Russia in general and in Jewish life in particular. It did so not because the new conditions were perfect, but because the old ones were so inexpressibly ugly and unbearable, and the mere loosening of the chains of servitude was hailed as a pledge of complete liberation. Far more intense than the political life of Russia was the crisis in its social life. While a chilling wind was still blowing from the winterly heights of Russian officialdom, while a grim censorship was still holding down the flight of the printed word, the released social energy was hurling and swirling in all classes of Russian society, sometimes breaking the fetters of police restraint. The outbursts of young Russia ran far ahead of the slow progress of the reforms inspired from above. It blazed the path for political freedom which the West of Europe had long transversed and which was to prove in Russia tortuous and thorny. The phase of Jewish life which claimed the first thought of Alexander II's government was the military conscription. Prior to the conclusion of the Crimean War, the Committee on Jewish Affairs called the Tsar's attention to the necessity of modifying the method of Jewish conscription with its fiendish contrivances of seizing juvenile contonists and enlisting penal and captive recruits. Nevertheless, the removal of this crying evil was postponed for a year until the promulgation of the Coronation Manifesto of August 26, 1856, when it was granted as 
an act of grace. Prompted by the desire, the manifesto reads, of making it easier for the Jews to discharge their military duty and of averting the inconveniences attached thereto, we commend as follows. 1. Recruits from among the Jews are to be drafted in the same way as from among the other estates, primarily from among those unsettled and not engaged in productive labor. Only in default of able-bodied men among these, the shortage is to be made up from among the category of Jews, who, by reason of their engaging in productive labor, are recognized as useful. 2. The drafting of recruits from among other estates and of those under age is to be repealed. 3. In regard to the making of the shortage of recruits, the general laws are to be applied, and the exaction of recruits from Jewish communities as a penalty for arrears is to be repealed. 4. The temporary rules, enacted by way of experiment in 1853, granting Jewish communities and Jewish individuals the right of presenting as recruits in their own state, co-religionists seized without passport are to be repealed. The abolition of Jewish conscription followed automatically upon the annulment by virtue of the same coronation manifesto of the general Russian institution of Cantonists and soldier children who are now ordered to be returned to their parents and relatives. Only in the case of the Jews, a rider was attached to the effect that those Jewish children who have embraced Christianity during their term of military service should not be allowed to go back to their parents and relatives if the latter remained in their old faith and should be placed exclusively in Christian families. The Coronation Manifesto of 1856 marks the end of the recruiting inquisition, which had lasted for nearly 30 years adding a unique page to the annals of Jewish martyrdom. In the matter of conscription, at least, the Jews were, in a certain measure, granted equal rights. The operation of the general statute concerning military service was extended to them, with a few limitations which were the heritage of the past. The old plan of the assortment of the Jews is reflected in the clause of the Manifesto, providing for increased conscription from among those unsettled and not engaged in productive labor, i.e. of the mass of the proletariat, as distinct from the more or less well-to-do classes. Nor was the old historic crime made good. The Jewish Cantonists, who had been forcibly converted to the Greek Orthodox faith, were not allowed to return to their kindred. As heretofore, baptism remained a conditio sine qua non for the advancement of Jewish soldiers, and only in 1861 was permission given to promote a Jewish private to the rank of a sergeant for general merit, without special distinction on the battlefield which had been formerly required. Beyond this rank, no Jew could hope to advance. 2. Homeopathic Emancipation and the Policy of Fusion Following upon the removal of the black stain of conscription came the question of lightening the yoke of slavery, that heavy burden of rightlessness which pressed so grievously upon the outcasts of the Jewish pale. Already in March 1856, Count Kiselev a semi-liberal official and formerly the president of the Jewish Committee, which had been appointed in 1840 and which was composed of the heads of the various ministries, submitted a memorandum to Alexander II, in which he took occasion to point out that the attainment of the goal indicated in the imperial ukase of 1840, that of bringing about the fusion of the Jews with the general population is hampered 
by various provisionally enacted restrictions which, when taken in conjunction with the general laws, contain contradictions and engender confusion. The result was an imperial order dated March 31, 1856, to revise all existing regulations affecting the Jews so as to bring them into harmony with the general policy of fusing these people with the original inhabitants, as far as the moral status of the Jews may render it possible. The same ministers who had taken part in the labors of the Jewish committee were instructed to draft a plan looking to the modification of the laws affecting the Jews and to submit their suggestions to the Tsar. In this way, the inception of the new reign was marked by a characteristic slogan, the fusion of the Jews with the Russian people to be promoted by the alleviation in their legal status. The way leading to this fusion was, in the judgment of Russian officialdom, blocked by the historic unity of the Jewish nation, a unity which, in government phraseology, was styled Jewish separatism, and interpreted as the effect of the inferior moral status of the Jews. At the same time, it was implied that the Jews with better morals, i.e., those who have shown a leaning toward Russification, might be accorded special legal advantages over their retrograde co-religionists. From that moment, the bureaucratic circles of St. Petersburg became obsessed with the idea of picking out special groups from among the Jewish population, distinguished by financial and educational qualifications for the purpose of bestowing upon them certain rights and privileges. It was the old coin, Nicholas' idea of the assortment of the Jews with the new legend stamped upon it. Formerly, it had been intended to penalize the useless or unsettled burghers by intensifying their rightlessness. Now this plan gave way to the policy of rewarding the useful elements by enlarging their rights or reducing their rightlessness. The objectionable principle upon which this whole system was founded, the division of a people into categories of favorites and outcasts, remained in full force. There was only a difference in degree. The threat of legal restrictions for the disobedient was replaced by holding out promises of legal alleviations for the obedient. A small group of influential Jewish merchants in St. Petersburg, which stood in close relations to the highest official spheres, the purveyor and banker Baron Joseph Yotzel Ginzburg and others, seized eagerly upon this idea which bade fair to shower privileges upon the well-to-do classes. In June 1856, this group addressed a petition to Alexander II, complaining about the disabilities which weighed so heavily upon all Jews, from the artisan to the first guild merchant, from the private soldier to the master of art, and forced them down to the level of a degraded, suspected, untolerated tribe. At the same time, they assured the Tsar that were the government to give a certain amount of encouragement to the Jews, the latter would gladly meet it halfway and help in the realization of its policy to draw the Jews nearer to the original inhabitants and turn them in the direction of productive labor war the petitioners declare the new generation which has been brought up in the spirit and under the control of the government was the higher mercantile class which for many years has diffused life activity and wealth in the land were the conscientious artisans who earned their bread in the sweat of their brow to receive from the government as a mark of distinction larger rights than those who have done nothing to attest their well-meaningness, usefulness, and industry, than the whole Jewish people, seeing that these few favored ones are the object of the government's righteousness and benevolence, and model of what it desires the Jews to become, 
would joyfully hasten to attain the goal marked out by the government. Our present petition, therefore, is to the effect that our gracious sovereign may bestow his kindness upon us and by distinguishing the grain from the chaff, may be pleased to accord a few moderate privileges to the most educated among us to wit. 1. Equal rights with the other Russian subjects or with the Karaite Jews to the educated and well-deserving Jews who possess the title of honorary citizens to the merchants affiliated for a number of years with the first or second guild and distinguished by their business integrity to the soldiers who have served irreproachably in the army. 2. The right of residence outside the pale of settlement to the best among the artisans who possess laudatory certificates from the trade unions. The privileges thus accorded to the best among us will help to realize the consummation of the governments that the sharply marked traits which distinguish the Jews from the native Russians should be leveled, and that the Jews should, in their way of thinking and acting, become akin to the latter. Once placed outside the secluded pale, the Jews will succeed in adopting from the genuine Russians the praiseworthy qualities by which they are distinguished, and the striving for culture and useful endeavor will become universal. The petition reflects the humiliating attitude of men who were standing on the boundary line between slavery and freedom, whose cast of mind had been formed under the regime of oppression and caprice. Pointing to the example of the West, where the bestowal of equal rights had contributed to the success of Jewish assimilation, the St. Petersburg petitioners were not even courageous enough to demand equal rights as the price of assimilation and professed, perhaps from diplomatic consideration, to content themselves with miserable crumbs of rights and privileges for the best among us. They failed to realize the meanness of their suggestion to divide the nation into best and worst, into those worthy of a human existence and those unworthy of it. 3. The extension of the right of residence. After some wavering, the government decided to adopt the method of picking the best. The intention of the authorities was to apply the gradual relaxation of Jewish rightlessness not to groups of restrictions, but to groups of persons. The government entered upon the scheme of abolishing or elevating certain restrictions not for the whole Jewish population, but merely for a few useful sections within it. Three such sections were marked off from the rest. Merchants of the first guild, university graduates, and incorporated artisans. The resuscitated Committee for the Amelioration of the Jews displayed an intense activity during that period, 1856 to 1863. For fully two years, 1857 to 1859, the question of granting the right of permanent residence in the interior governments to merchants of the first guild occupied the attention of that committee and of the Council of State. The committee had originally proposed to restrict these privileges by imposing a series of exceedingly onerous conditions. Thus. The merchants intending to settle in the Russian interior were to be required to have belonged to the first guild within the pale for ten years previously, and they were to be allowed to leave the pale only after securing in each case a permit from the Minister of the Interior and of Finance. But the Council of State found that circumscribed in this manner the privilege would benefit only a negligible fraction of the Jewish merchant class. There were altogether 108 Jewish First Guild merchants within the Pale, and therefore considered it necessary to reduce the requirements for settling in the interior. 
A long succession of meetings of this august body was taken up with the perplexing problem how to attract big Jewish capital into the central government and at the same time safeguard the latter against the excessive influx of Jews who, for the sake of settling there, would register in the first guild and under the disguise of relatives would bring with them, as one of the members of the council put it, the whole tribe of Israel. After protracted discussions, a resolution was adopted which was in substance as follows. The Jewish merchants who have belonged to the first guild for not less than two years prior to the issuance of this present law shall be permitted to settle permanently in the interior governments, accompanied by their families and a limited number of servants and clerks. These merchants shall be entitled to live and trade on equal terms with the Russian merchants, with the proviso that after settlement they shall continue their membership in the first guild, as well as their payment of the appertaining membership dues for no less than ten years, failing which they shall be sent back into the pale. Big Jewish merchants and bankers from abroad, noted for their social position, shall be allowed to trade in Russia under a special permit to be secured in each case from the ministers of the interior and of finance. The resolution of the Council of State was sanctioned by the Tsar on March 16, 1859, and thus became law. In this manner, the way was opened for big Jewish capital to enter the two Russian capitals and the tabut interior. The advent of the big capitalists was followed by the influx of their less fortunate brethren, who, driven by material want from the pale, was forced to seek new domiciles and, in the shape of first guild dues, paid for many years a heavy toll for their right of residence and commerce. The position of these merchants offers numerous points of contact with the status of the tolerated Jewish merchants in Vienna and Lower Austria prior to 1848. Toleration having been granted to the Jews with the proper financial status, the government proceeded to extend the same treatment to persons with educational qualifications. The latter class was the subject of protracted debate in the Jewish community as well as in the ministries and in the Council of State. As early as in 1857, the Minister of Public Instruction, Norov, had submitted a memorandum to the Jewish committee in which he argued that religious fanaticism and prejudice among the Jews could only be exterminated by inducing the Jewish youth to enter the general educational establishment, which end can only be obtained by enlarging their civil rights and by offering them material advantages. Accordingly, Norov suggested that the right of residence in the whole Russian Empire should be granted to the graduates of the higher and secondary educational institutions. Those Jews who should have failed to attend school were to be restricted in their rights of entering the mercantile guilds. The Jewish community refused to limit the rights of those who did not attend the general schools and proposed instead as a bait for the Jews who shunned secular education to confer special privileges in the discharge of military service upon those Jews who had attended the gymnasia or even the Russian district schools or the Jewish ground schools, more exactly to grant them the right of buying themselves off from conscription by the payment of 100 to 200 rubles, 1859. But the military department vetoed this proposal on the ground that education would thus bestow privileges upon Jews which were denied even to Christians. The suggestion relating to military privileges was therefore abandoned and the promotion of education among Jews reduced itself 
to an extension of the right of residence. In this connection, the Jewish community warmly debated the question as to whether the right of residence outside the pair should be accorded to graduates of the higher and secondary educational institutions or only to those of the higher. The ministers of the interior and public instruction, Lanskoy and Kovalevsky, advocated the former more liberal interpretation, but the majority of the committee members acting in the interest of ungraduated emancipation rejected the idea of bestowing the universal right of residence upon the graduates of gymnasia and lyceum, and even upon those of universities and other institutions of higher learning, with exception of those who had received a learned degree, doctor, magister, or candidate. The committee was willing, on the other hand, to permit the possessor of a learned degree not only to settle in the interior, but also to enter the civil service. The Jewish university graduate was thus expected to submit a scholarly paper or even a doctor's dissertation for two purposes, for procuring the right of residence in some Siberian locality and for the right of serving the state. Particular circumspection was recommended by the committee with reference to Jewish medical men. A Jewish physician without a degree of MD was not to be permitted to pass beyond the pale. In this shape, the question was submitted to the Council of State in 1861. Here, opinions were evenly divided. Twenty members advocated the necessity of bestowing the right of residence not only on graduates of universities but also of gymnasia, advancing the argument that even in the case of Jewish gymnasists, it is in all likelihood to be presumed that the gross superstitions and prejudices which hinder the association of the Jews with the original population of the empire will be, if not entirely eradicated, at least considerably weakened, and a further surgeon among Christians will contribute toward the ultimate extermination of these sinister prejudices which stand in the way of every moral improvement. Such was the opinion of the liberal half of the Council of State. The conservative half argued differently. Only those Jews deserve the right of residence who have received an education such as may serve as a pledge of their having renounced the errors of fanaticism. The wise measures adopted as a precaution against the influx of Jews into the interior governments would lose their efficacy, were permission to settle all over Russia to be granted suddenly to all Jews who have for a short term attended a gymnasium in the western and southwestern region for no other purpose, to be sure, than that of pursuing on a larger scale their illicit trades and other harmful occupations. Hence, only Jews with a reliable education, i.e., the graduates of higher educational institutions who have obtained the learned degree should be permitted to pass the boundary of the pale. Alexander II endorsed the opinion of the conservative members of the Council of State. The law, promulgated on November 27, 1861, reads as follows. Jews possessing certificates of the learned degree of Doctor of Medicine and Surgery or Doctor of Medicine and likewise of Doctor, Magister or Candidate of other university faculties are admitted to serve in all government offices without their being confined to the pale established for the residence of Jews. They are also permitted to settle permanently in all the provinces of the empire for the pursuit of commerce and industry. In addition, the law specifies that, apart from the members of their families, these Jews shall be permitted to keep, as a maximum, two domestic servants from among their co-religionists. The promulgation of this law brought about a curious state of affairs, the upshot of the genuinely Russian homeopathic system of emancipation. A handful of Jews who had obtained learned degrees from
from universities were permitted not only to reside in the interior of the empire, but also admitted here and there to government service in the capacity of civil and military physicians. Yet both of these rights were denied to all other persons with the same university education, physicians and active students who had not obtained learned degrees. On one occasion, the Minister of Public Instruction put before the Council of State the following legal puzzle. A Jewish student, while attending the University of Russian capital, enjoys the right of residence there, but when he has successfully finished his course and has obtained the customary certificate without the learned degree, he forfeits his right and must return to the pale. Yet the government in its stubbornness refused to make concessions, and when it was forced to make them, it did so rather in its own interest than in that of the Jews. Owing to the scarcity of medical help in the army and in the interior, new cases issued in 1865 and 1867 declared Jewish physicians, even without the title of doctor of medicine, to be admissible to the medical corps and later on to civil service in all places of the empire except the capitals St. Petersburg and Moscow. Nevertheless, the extension of the plain rights of domicile without admission to civil service remained for a long time dependent on a learned degree. It was only after two decades of hesitation that the law of January 19, 1879 conferred the right of universal residence on all categories of persons with the higher education, regardless of the nature of the diploma, and also including pharmacists, dentists, felt shares, and midwives. The privileges bestowed upon the big merchants and titled intellectuals affected by the few small groups of the Jewish population. The authorities now turned their attention to the mass of the people and, in accordance with its rules of political homeopathy, commenced to pick from it a handful of persons for better treatment. The question of admitting Jewish artisans into the Russian interior occupied the government for a long time. In 1856, Lanskoy, the Minister of the Interior, entered into an official correspondence concerning this matter with the governors general and governors of the western provinces. Most of the replies were favorable to the idea of conferring upon Jewish artisans the right of universal residence. Of the three governors general, whose opinion had been invited to the governor general of Vilna, was the only one who thought that the present situation needed no change. His colleague of Kiev, Count Vasilchikov, was, on the contrary, of the opinion that it would be a rational measure to transfer the surplus of the Jewish artisans who were cooped up within the pale and had been pauperized by excessive competition to the interior governments where there was a scarcity of skilled labor. Footnote. The official statistics of that time, about the year 1860, brought out the fact that the number of Jews in the 15th government of Pale of the Settlement, exclusive of the Kingdom of Poland, but inclusive of the Baltic region, amounted to 1,430,800, forming 8% of the total population of that territory. The number of artisans in the Jewish governments was far greater than in the Russian interior. Thus, in the government of Kiev, there were to be found 2.06 artisans to every thousand inhabitants, against 0.8 in the nearby government of Krusk, i.e. 2% times more. In reality, the number of Jews in the western region without the Kingdom of Poland exceeded considerably one and one-half millions there being no regular registration at that time. End of footnote. A surprisingly liberal pronouncement came from the Governor-General of New Russia, Count Stroganov. 
in the world of Russian officialdom professing the dogma of gradation and caution in the question of Jewish rights, he was the only one who had the courage to raise his voice on behalf of complete Jewish emancipation. He wrote, The existence in our times of restrictions in the rights of the Jews as compared with the Christian population in any shape or form is neither in accord with the spirit and tendency of the age nor with the policy of the government looking toward the amalgamation of the Jews with the original population of the empire. The Count therefore concluded that it was necessary to permit the Jews to live in all the places of the empire and engage without any restrictions and unequal terms with all Russian subjects in such craft and industries as they themselves may choose in accordance with their habits and abilities. It is scarcely necessary to add that the bold voice of the Russian dignitary who in a lucid interval spoke of in a manner reminiscent of civilized West was not listened to by the bureaucrats of St. Petersburg. Nevertheless, as far as the specific question of Jewish artisans was concerned, the favorable replies were bound to have a decisive effect. However, red tape sluggishness managed to retard the decision for several years. In 1863, the question was referred back to the Jewish committee only a short time before the dissolution of that body, which, for a quarter of a century, had perpetrated every conceivable experiment over the amelioration of the Jews. Thence, the matter was transferred to the Committee of Ministers and finally to the Council of State. In the ministerial body, Valuev, Minister of the Interior, favored the idea of granting the right of settling outside the pale to Jewish artisans and mechanics dependent on certain conditions by practicing caution and endeavoring to avert the rapid influx into the midst of the population of the interior governments of an element hitherto foreign to it. In reply to Baron Koff, who had advocated the admission of the Jewish artisans beyond the pale, not only with their families, but also with Jewish domestics, Valuev argued that this privilege will enable Jewish businessmen of all kinds to reside in the interior governments under the guise of employees of their co-religionists. The Jews, according to Valuev, will endeavor to transfer their activity to a field economically more favorable to them, and it goes without saying that they will not fail to seize the first best opportunity of exploiting the places of the empire hitherto inaccessible to them. The Council of State passed law in the formulation of the Ministry of the Interior, adding the necessary precaution against the entirely legitimate endeavor of Jewish businessmen to transfer their activity to a field economically more favorable to them. After nine years of preparation, on June 28, 1865, Alexander II finally gave his sanction to the law, permitting Jewish artisans, mechanics, and distillers, including apprentices, to reside all over the empire. Both in the wording of the law and in its subsequent application, the privilege was hatched about by numerous safeguards. Thus, the artisan who wished to settle outside the pale had to produce not only a certificate from his trade union testifying to his professional ability, but also a testimony from the police that he was not on the trial. At stated intervals, he had to procure a passport from his native town in the pale, since outside the pale, his status was that of a temporary resident. In his new place of residence, he was permitted to deal only in the wares of his own workmanship. If he happened to be out of work, he was to be sent back to the pale. While opening a valve in the suffocating pale, the government took good care to prevent the artificially pent-up Jewish energy from rushing through it. However, he being cooped up for so long, 
the Jews began to press through the opening. In the wake of the artisans, who, on account of the indicated restrictions of the law or because of the lack of traveling expenses, emigrated in comparatively small numbers, followed the commercial proletariat using criminal disguise of artisans in order to transfer their energies to a field economically more favorable to them. The position of these people was tragic. The fictitious artisans became the tributaries of the local police, depending entirely on its favor or disfavor. The detection of such criminals outside the pale was followed by the expulsion and the confiscation of their merchandise. As a matter of fact, the Russian government did everything in its power to stem the influx of Jews into the interior. Only with the greatest reluctance did it widen the range of the privileged Jewish groups. The Tsar himself, held in the throes of the old Muscovite tradition, frequently put his veto upon the proposals to enlarge the area of Jewish residence. A striking illustration of this attitude may be found in the case of the retired Jewish soldiers who, after discharging their galley-like army service over a quarter of a century, were expelled from the places where they had been stationed and sent back into the Pale. To the report submitted in 1858 by the Jewish Committee, pointing out the necessity of granting the right of universal residence to these soldiers, the Tsar attached the resolution. I decidedly refused to grant it. When petitions to the same effect became more insistent, all he did was to permit in 1860, by way of exemption, a group of retired soldiers who had served in St. Petersburg in the bodyguard to remain in the capital. Ultimately, however, he was obliged to yield, and in 1867, he revoked the law prohibiting retired Jewish soldiers to live outside the pale. Thus, after long wavering, the right of domicile was finally bestowed upon the so-called Nicholas soldiers and their offspring, a rather niggardly reward for having served the fatherland under the terrible hardships of the old form of conscription. End of section 12. Section 13 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825-1894, to 1894, by Shimon Dubunov. Translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim. Manikt by Shaw, Portugal. Chapter 18 the Era of Reforms under Alexander II, Part Two. 4. Further Alleviations and Attempts at Russification Nevertheless, the liberal spirit of the age did its work slowly but surely, and partial legal elevations were granted by the government or wrested from it by the force of circumstances. The various which had been erected for the Jews within the Pale itself were done away with. Thus, the right of residence was extended to the cities of Nikolaev and Sebastopol, which, though geographically situated within the Pale, had been legally placed outside of it. The obstructions in the way of temporary visit to the holy city of Kiev were mitigated. The disgraceful old-time privilege of several cities such as Zitomir and Vilna, entitling them to exclude the Jews from certain streets, was revoked. Moreover, by the law of 1862, the Jews were permitted to acquire land in the rural districts on those manorial estates in which, after the liberations of the peasants, the binding relations of the peasants to the landed proprietors had been completely discontinued. Unfortunately, what the Jews thus gained through the liberation of the peasants, they lost to the large extent soon afterward through the Polish insurrection of 1863, 
forfeiting the right of acquiring immovable property outside the cities in the great part of the Pale. For in 1864, after quelling the Polish insurrection, the government undertook to resify the western region, and both Poles and Jews were strictly barred from acquiring estates in the nine governments forming the jurisdiction of the governors general of Vilna and Kiev. The two other great reforms, that of rural self-government and the judiciary, were not stained by the ignominious label Kromie Yevrev, excepting the Jews, so characteristic of Russian legislation. The statute concerning gems to organizations issued in 1864 makes no exception for Jews and those among them with the necessary agrarian or commercial qualifications are granted the rights of active and passive suffrage within the scheme of provincial self-government. In fact, in the southern government, the Jews began soon afterwards to participate in the rural assemblies and were occasionally appointed to rural offices. Nor did the liberally conceived judicial regulations of 1864 contain any important discriminations against the Jews. Within a short time, Jewish lawyers attained to prominence as members of the Russian bar, although their admission to the bench was limited to a few isolated cases. Little by little, another dismal specter of the past, the missionary activity of the government began to fade away. In the beginning of Alexander's reign, the conversion of Jews was still encouraged by the grant of monetary assistance to converts. The law of 1859 extended these stipends to persons embracing any other Christian persuasion outside of Greek Orthodoxy. But in 1864, the government came to the conclusion that it was not worth its while to reward deserters and began a new policy by discontinuing its allowances to converts serving in the army. A little later, it repealed the law providing for a mitigation of sentence for criminal offenders who embrace Christianity during the inquiry or trial. In encouraging the fusion of the Jews with the original population, the government of Alexander II had in mind civil and cultural fusion rather than religious assimilation, which even the inquisitorial contrivances of Nicholas' conscription scheme had failed to accomplish. But as far as the cultural fusion, or for short, the russification of the Jews was concerned, the government even now occasionally indulged in practices which were borrowed from the antiquated system of enlightened absolutism. The official enlightenment, which had been introduced during the 40s, was slow in taking root. The year 1848 was the first scholastic year in the two Enlightenment nurseries, the rabbinical schools of Vilna and Zitomir. Beginning with that year, a number of elementary crown schools for Jewish children were opened in various cities of the Pale. The cruel persecutions of the outgoing regime affected the development of schools in a twofold manner. On the one hand, the Jewish population could not help turning away with disgust from the gift of enlightenment which its persecutors held out to it. On the other hand, the horrors of conscription induced many a Jewish youth to seek refuge in the new rabbinical schools which saved their inmates from the soldier's uniform. Many a parents who regarded both the barracks and the crown schools as training ground for converts preferred to send his children to the latter, where at least they were spared the martyrdom of the barracks. The pupils of the rabbinical schools came from the poorest classes, those that carried on their shoulders the whole weight of conscription. True, the distrustful attitude towards the official schools was gradually weakening as the new government of Alexander II was passing from the former policy of oppression to that of reforms. By and by, the compulsory attendance at these schools became a voluntary one, 
prompted by the desire for general culture or for special training as rabbi or teacher. Nevertheless, the expectation of the Russian government under Nicholas I that the new schools would take the place of the time-honored educational Jewish institutions, the Heder and Yeshiva, remained unfulfilled. Only an insignificant percentage of Jewish children went to the crown schools, and even these children did so only after having received their training at the Hedo or Yeshiva. Realizing this, the government decided to combat the traditional school as the rival of the new. Immediately upon his accession to the throne, Alexander confirmed the following resolution adopted by Jewish Committee on May 3, 1855. After the lapse of 20 years, no one shall be appointed rabbi or teacher of Jewish subjects except graduates of the rabbinical schools or of the general educational establishments of a higher or secondary grade. Having fixed a term of 20 years for abolishing the institution of melamets and religious leaders, the products of thousands of years of development, the government frequently brandished this Democlas sword over their heads. In 1856, a strict supervision was established over headers and melamets. A year later, the Jewish communities were instructed to elect henceforward as official rabbis only graduates of the rabbinical crown schools or of secular educational establishments, and in default of such, to invite educated Jews from Germany. But all these regulations proved of no avail. And in 1859, a new U.K. case became necessary, which loosened the official grip over the headers, but made it at the same time obligatory upon the children of Jewish merchants to attend the general Russian schools or the Jewish crown schools. The enforcement of school attendance would scarcely have produced the desired effect. The Orthodox managed somehow to give the slip to Russian learning, were it not for the fact that under the influence of the inner cultural transformation of Russian Jewry, the general Russian school became during that period more and more popular among the advanced classes of Jewish population, and gymnasium and university took their place alongside of Hedo and Yeshiva. Yet the hundreds of pupils in the new schools faded into insignificance when compared with the hundreds of thousands who were educated exclusively in the old schools. The fatal year 1875, the last of the 20 years of respite, granted to the Melamed for their self-annihilation arrived. But the huge Melamed army was not willing to pass out of Jewish life, in which they exercised a definite function with no substitute to take its place. The government was forced to yield. After several brief postponements, the Melamed were left in peace, and by a new case issued in 1879, the idea of abolishing the headers was dropped. Towards the end of this period, the government abandoned altogether its attempts to reform the Jewish schools and decided to liquidate its former activity in this direction. By a new case issued in 1873, the two rabbinical schools and all Jewish crown schools were closed. On the ruins of the vast educational network, Originally projected for the transformation of Judaism, only about a hundred elementary schools and two modest teachers' institutes, which were to supply teachers for these schools, were established by the government. The authorities were now inclined to look upon the general Russian schools as the most effective agencies of fusion and put their greatest trust in the elemental process of Russification which had begun to sweep over the upper layers of Jewry. 5. The Jews and the Polish Insurrection of 1863 While the official world of St. Petersburg was obsessed with the idea of russification of Jewry, in Warsaw, the tendency of Polonization as applied to the Jews of the Western region 
cropped up in the wake of the revolutionary Polish movement in the beginning of the 60s. At the inception of Alexander's reign, the Russian government set out to equalize the legal status of the Jews in the Kingdom of Poland with that of the Empire and to abolish the surviving special restrictions such as the prohibition of residing in certain towns or in certain parts of towns, disabilities in acquiring property and others. But the highest Polish administration in Warsaw was obstructing in every possible way the liberal attempts of the Russian government. Prior to the insurrection of 1863, the attitude of Polish society towards the Jews was one of the habitual animosity, and this notwithstanding the fact that by that time Warsaw harbored already a group of Jewish intellectuals who were eager to assimilate with the Poles and were imbued with Polish patriotism. When in 1859 the Warsaw Gazette published an anti-Semitic article in which the Jews were branded as foreigners, the Polish Jewish patriots including the banker Cronenberg, a convert, were stung to the quick, and they came forward with violent protest. This led to passionate debates in the Polish press, generally unfriendly to the Jews. The radical Polish organs, published abroad by political exiles, took occasion to denounce bitterly the anti-Semitic trends of Polish society. The veteran historian Lelevel, who had not yet forgotten Poland's historic injustice of 1831, issued a pamphlet in Brussels calling upon the Poles to live in harmony with the race with which it had existed side by side for 800 years. Lelevel's kindly words would scarcely have brought the anti-Semites to reason had not the Poles at that moment embarked upon an enterprise for the success of which they solely needed the sympathy and cooperation of their Jewish neighbors. The revolutionary movements which engulfed Russian Poland in 1860 to 1863 required the utmost exertion of effort on the part of the entire population in which the half million Jews played no small part. All of a sudden, Polish society opened its arms to those whom it had but recently branded as foreigners, and out of the ranks of Warsaw Jewry came a hearty response, expressing itself not only in patriotic manifestations, but also in sacrifice and achievements for the sake of the common fatherland. At the head of the Warsaw community during this stormy period stood a man who combined Polish patriotism with rabbinic orthodoxy. Formerly rabbi in Krakow, Berush Meisels had, as far back as 1848, been sent as deputy to the parliament at Kremsia and stood in the forefront of the Polish patriots of Galicia. In 1856, he accepted the post of rabbi in Warsaw. When the revolutionary movement had broken out, Meisels endeavored to instruct his flock in the spirit of Polish patriotism. Revered by the Jewish masses for his piety and by the intellectuals for his political trend of mind, this spiritual leader of Polish Jewry played in the revolutionary Polish movement a role equal in importance to that of the leading ecclesiastics of Poland. The harmonious cooperation of the Orthodox chief rabbi Meisels, the reform preacher Markus Yestrov, and the lay representatives of the community lent unity and organization to the part played by the Jews in preparing the rebellion. The Jews of Warsaw participated in all street manifestations and political processions which took place during the year 1860 to 1861. Among those pierced by Cossack bullets during the manifestation of February 27, 1861, were several Jews. The indignation which this shooting down of defenseless people aroused in Warsaw is generally regarded as the immediate cause of the mutiny. Rabbi Meisels was a member of the deputation which went to Viserui Gorchakov to demand satisfaction for the blood 
that had been spilled. In the demonstrative funeral procession which followed the coffins of the victims, the Jewish clergy, headed by Mises, marched alongside of the Catholic priesthood. Many Jews attended the memorial services in the Catholic churches at which fiery patriotic speeches were delivered. Similar demonstrations of mourning were held in the synagogues. An appeal sent out broadcast by the circle of patriotic Jewish Poles reminded the Jews of the anti-Jewish hatred of the Russian bureaucracy and called upon them to clasp joyfully the brotherly hand held forth by them, the Poles, to place themselves under the banner of the nation whose ministers of religion have all in churches spoken of us in words of love and brotherhood. The whole year 1861 stood, at least as far as the Polish capital was concerned, under the sign of Polish-Jewish Brotherhood. At the synagogue service held in memory of the historian Lelevel Yastrov, preached a patriotic sermon. On the day of Jewish New Year, prayers were offered up in the synagogue for the success of the Polish cause, accompanied by the singing of the national Polish hymn Boze Kos Polskie. When, as a protest against the invasion of the churches by the Russian soldiery, the Catholic clergy closed all churches in Warsaw, the rabbis and communal elders followed the suit and ordered the closing of the synagogues. This action aroused the ire of leaders, the new viceroy. Rabbi Meisels, the preachers Yastrov and Kramstik, as well as the president of the Congressional Board, were placed under arrest. The prisoners were kept in the citadel of Warsaw for three months, but were then released. In the meantime, Marquis Bielepolski, acting as mediator between the Russian government and the Polish people, had prepared his plan of reform as a means of warding off the mutiny. Among these reforms, which aimed at the partial restoration of Polish autonomy and the improvement of the status of the peasantry, was included a law providing for the legal equalities of the Jews. Wielding considerable influence, first as director of the Polish Commission of Ecclesiastic Affairs and Public Instruction, and later as the head of the whole civil administration of the kingdom, Wielepolski was able to secure St. Petersburg's assent to his project. On May 24, 1862, Alexander II signed the new case revoking the suspensory decree of 1808, which had entailed numerous disabilities for the Jews incompatible with the new tendencies in the political and agrarian life of the kingdom. This UK has conferred the following rights upon the Jews. 1. To acquire immovable property on all manorial estates on which the peasants had passed from the state of serfs into that of tenants. 2. To settle freely in the formerly prohibited cities and city districts not excluding those situated within the 21 verst zone along the Prussian and Austrian border. 3. To appear as witnesses in court on an equal footing with Christians in all legal proceedings and to take an oath in a new, less humiliating form. Bestowing these privileges upon the Polish Jews in the hope of bringing about their amalgamation with the local Christian population, the Tsar forbids, in the same UK, the further use of Hebrew and Yiddish in all civil affairs and legal documents, such as contracts, wills, obligations, also in commercial ledgers, and even in business correspondence. In conclusion, the UK directs the Administrative Council of the Kingdom of Poland to revise and eventually to repeal all the other laws which hamper the Jews in their pursuit of crafts and industries by imposing special taxes upon them. This UK case of Alexander II, though revoking all the parts of the inserting restrictions in the elementary civil rights of the Jews, was given the high-sounding title of an act of emancipation. The secluded Hasidic mass of Poland was glad to accept the legal alleviations offered to it 
without thinking of any linguistic and other kind of assimilation. On the other hand, the assimilated Jewish intelligentsia, which had joined the ranks of the Polish insurgents, was dreaming of complete emancipation and confidently hoped to attain it upon the successful termination of the revolutionary enterprise. In the meantime, the revolution was assuming ever larger proportions. The year 1863 arrived. The demonstrations on the streets of Warsaw were succeeded by bloody skirmishes between the Polish insurgents and the Russian troops in the woods of Poland and Lithuania. The Jews took no active part in this phase of the rebellion. As far as Poland proper was concerned, their participation was limited to the secret revolutionary propaganda. In Lithuania, again, neither the Jewish masses nor the newly arisen class of intellectuals sympathized with the Polish cause. In that part of the country, the systematic Jew-baiting of the Polish pans or noble landowners was still fresh in the minds, and the Jews, moreover, were pinning all their faith to the emancipation to be bestowed by St. Petersburg. The will or the wisp of Russification had already begun to lure the Jewish professional class. In many Lithuanian localities, the Jews, who failed to show their sympathy with the Polish revolutionary, ran the risk of being dealt with severely. Here and there, as had been the case in 1831, the rebels were as good as their word and hanged or shot the Jews suspected of Prussian sympathies. The reserved attitude of the Lithuanian Jews throughout the mutiny proved their salvation after the suppression of the rebellion, when the ferocious Muraviyov, the governor-general of Vilna, took up his bloody work of retribution. As for the Kingdom of Poland, neither the revolution nor its suppression entailed any serious consequences for them. True, the fraternization of the Warsaw Jews with the Poles during the revolutionary years weakened for a little while the hereditary Jew hatred of the Polish people and helped to intensify the fever of Polonization which had seized the Jewish upper classes. But indirectly, the effects of the Polish rebellion was detrimental to the Jews of the rest of the empire. The insurrection was not only followed by a general wave of political reaction, but it also gave strong impetus to the Polish of Russification, which was now applied with particular vigor to the western provinces and was damaging to the Jews both from the civil and cultural point of view. End of section 13. Section 14 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I Until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Dubnov, translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim, Manikt Baisho, Portugal. Chapter 19. The Reaction on the Alexander II, Part 1. 1. Change of Attitude Toward the Jewish Problem The decided drift toward political reaction in the second part of Alexander's reign affected also the specific Jewish problem, which the homeopathic reforms designed to ameliorate a fraction of the Jewish people had tried to solve in vain. The general reaction showed itself in the fact that, after having carried out the first great reforms, such as the liberation of the peasantry, the introduction of rural self-government, and the reorganization of the administration of the law, the government considered the task of Russian regeneration to be completed and stubbornly refused to use the expression current at the time to crown the edifice by the one great political reform, the grant of a constitution and political liberty. This refusal widened the bridge between the government 
and the progressive element of the Russian people, whose hopes were riveted on the ultimate goal of political reorganization. The striving for liberty, driven on the ground by police and censorship, assumed among the Russian youth the character of a revolutionary movement. And when the murderous hand of the third section descended heavily upon the champions of liberty, the useful revolutionaries retorted with political terrorism, which darkened the last days of Alexander II and led to his assassination. The complete emancipation of the Jews was out of place in this atmosphere of growing official reaction. The same bureaucracy which halted the march of the great reforms for the country at large was not inclined to allow even minor reforms when affecting the Jews only. Even the former desire for graded and partial amelioration of the position of the Jews had vanished. Instead, the center of the stage was again occupied by the old red tape activities, by discussions about the Jewish question, endless no less than fruitless, in the recesses of bureaucratic committees and subcommittees, by oracular and inward versions of governors and governors general upon the conduct of the Jews, and so on. The remongering of the reactionary variety was again at the premium. Once more, the authorities debated the question whether the Jews were to be regarded as useful or harmful to the state, instead of putting the diametrically opposite question of simple justice, whether the state which is called upon to serve the Jews as a part of civic organism of Russia is useful to them to an extent which may be lawfully claimed by them. Under Nicholas I, the government chancelleries had been busy inventing new remedies against the separatism of the Jews and their harmful pursuits. During the first liberal years of Alexander's reign, commerce ceased to be branded as harmful pursuit. Yet, as soon as the Jewish merchants stimulated by the partial extension of their rights of residence and occupation, displayed a wider economic activity and became successful competitors of the original Russian businessmen, they were met with shouts of protest demanding that this Jewish exploitation be effectively curbed. In this connection, it must be pointed out that the economic advancement of the Jews was not altogether due to the privileges accorded to them by the Russian legislation, but was rather the effect of general economic conditions. The great progress in industrial life during the era of reforms, more particularly the expansion of railroad enterprises during the 60s and 70s, opened up a wide field for the energies of Jewish capitalists. Moreover, the abolition in 1861 of the old system of farming out the sale of liquor transferred a part of the big Jewish capital from the liquor traffic into railroad building. The Jewish excise farmers were converted into railroad men as shareholders, supply merchants, or contractors. A new Jewish plutocracy came into being and its growth excited jealousy and fear among the Russian mercantile class. The government, filled with enthusiasm for the cultivation of large industries, was not as yet prepared to discriminate against the Jews whenever big capital was concerned. But it lent an attentive ear to the original Russian merchants whenever they complained about Jewish competition in petty trade, on which the lower Jewish classes depended for their livelihood. The government, which had not yet emancipated itself from the habit of assaulting its citizens and dividing them into a protected and a tolerated class, set out to elaborate measures for curbing the Jews belonging to the latter category. The question which confronted the government next was this. To what extent 
have the hopes for a fusion of the Jews with the original population been justified by the event. Here, too, the reply was unsatisfactory. The naive expectation that a few gratuities offered to Jews in the shape of privileges would fill them with the eager desire to fuse with the Russians did not come true. Strong as was the trend toward Russification in the new Jewish intelligentsia of the 60s, the broad masses of Jewry knew nothing of such a tendency. The authorities became suspicious. What if these crafty Hebrews should fool us again and refuse to pay for the donated rights by fusing with the Christians? Russian officialdom received new food for reflection, which was to last it for years, nay, for decades. 2. The informer Jacob Brafman Several occurrences were instrumental in determining the government to embark upon a new policy, that of investigating assiduously the inner life of the Jews. At the end of the 60s, a man appeared in Vilna who offered his services to the authorities as a detective and spy among the Jews. Jacob Brafman, a native of the government of Minsk, had deserted his race and religion in the last years of Nicholas conscription, hoping thereby to escape the nets of the vigilant Kahal captors who wished to draft him into the army. Embittered against the Kahal agent who had become a mere police tool, Brafman desired to wreak vengeance upon the Kahal as a whole, nay, upon the very idea of Jewish communal organization. When the fusion or assimilation of the Jews became the watchword for the highest official circles, the astute convert found that he could make his way by exposing the influence which, in his opinion, checked the endeavors of the government. A memorandum presented by him to Alexander II, when the letter was passing through Minsk in 1858, opened to him the doors of the Holy Synod. He was appointed instructor of Hebrew at Greek Orthodox Seminary and entrusted with the task of finding ways to remove the difficulties placed by the Jews in the path of their co-religionists intending to go over to Christianity. His mission to facilitate apostasy among the Jews proved a failure, and his services as detective were not yet appreciated during the liberal years of Alexander's reign. However, with the reactionary turn in Russian politics in the middle of the 60s, these services were once more in demand. Brafman hastened to the hotbed of reactionary chauvinism, the city of Vilna, which was firmly held in the iron grip of Moraviov, and there began to expose the separatism of the inner life of the Jews before the highest administration of the province. He contended that the Kahal, though officially abolished in 1844, continued in reality to exist and to maintain a widely ramified judiciary, Bet-Din, that it constitute a secret, uncanny sort of organization which wielded despotic power of the communities by employing such weapons as the harem excommunication, and hasaka, the Jewish legal practice of securing property rights, that it incited the Jewish masses against the state, the government, and the Christian religion, and fostered in these masses fanaticism and dangerous national separatism. In the opinion of Brafman, the only way to eradicate this secret Jewish government was to destroy the last vestige of Jewish communal autonomy by closing all religious and charitable societies and fraternities. The Jewish community itself ought to share the same fate, and the Jews, forming part of it, should be included among the Christian estates in the cities and villages. In a word, Judaism as a communal organization should pass out of existence altogether.
the heads of Russian administration in Lithuania listened eagerly to the sinister revelation of the new Pepperkin. In 1866, Governor-General Kaufman appointed a commission, which also included a few Jewish experts, to look into the material compiled by Brafman. This material consisted of the minutes of the Karl of Minsk from the first half of the 19th century, recording the entirely legitimate enactments which the communal administration had passed by virtue of the autonomous right granted to it by the government. Brafman published his material in a series of articles in the official organ of the province, the Vilensk Vestnik, the Vilna Herald. The articles were later published in a separate volume under the title Kniga Kahala, the Book of the Kahal. The data collected by Brafman was embellished with the customary anti-Semitic quotations from Talmudic and rabbinic literature and put in such a light that the government was placed on the horns of a dilemma either to destroy with one stroke the entire Jewish communal organization and all the cultural agencies attached to it or to run the risk of seeing Russia captured by the universal car. It may be added that Allianz is an elite universe, which had shortly before been founded in Paris for the purpose of assisting Jews in various countries, figured in Brafman's indictment as a constituent society of the universal Jewish car organization. The Book of the Kahal was printed at public expense and sent out to all government offices to serve as a guide for Russian officials and enable them to fight the inner enemy. It was in vain that Brafman's ignorance of rabbinic law and his entire distortion of the role played by the Kahal in days gone by was exposed by Jewish writers in articles and monographs. It was in vain that Jewish members of the commission appointed by the governor-general of Vilna protested against the barbarous proposals of the informer. The authorities of St. Petersburg seized upon Brafman's discoveries as incontrovertible evidence of the existence of Jewish separatism and as a justification for the method of cautiousness which they saw fit to apply it to the solution of the Jewish problem. 3. The fight against Jewish separatism Another incident which took place about the same time served in the eyes of the leading government circles as an additional illustration of Jewish separatism. In 1870, Alexander II was on a visit to the Kingdom of Poland and there beheld the sight of dense masses of Hasidim with their long earlocks and flowing coats. The Tsar, repelled by this spectacle, enjoined upon the Polish governors strictly to enforce in their domains the old Russian law prohibiting the Jewish form of dress. Thereupon, the administration of kingdom threw itself special zest upon the important task of eradicating the ugly costumes and earlocks of the Hasidim. Shortly afterwards, the question of Jewish separatism was the subject of discussion before the Council of State. Under the unmistakable influence of the recent revelation of Brafman, the Council of State arrived at the conclusion that the prohibition of external differences in dress is yet far from leading to the goal pursued by the government namely to destroy the exclusiveness of the Jews and the almost hostile attitude of the Jewish communities towards Christians, these communities forming in our land a secluded religious and civil caste, or one might say a state in a state. Hence the Council proposed to entrust a special commission with the task of considering ways and means to weaken as far as possible the communal cohesion among the Jews, December 1870. As a result, a commission of the kind suggested by the Council was established in 1871, 
consisting of the representatives of the various ministries and presided over by the Assistant Minister of the Interior, Lobonov Rostovsky. The Commission received the same Commission of the Amelioration of the Condition of the Jews. While the government was again engaged in one of its numerous experiments over the problem of Jewish separatism, an event unusual in those days took place, the Odessa pogrom of 1871. In this granary of the South, which owed its flourishing commerce to Jews and Greeks, an unfriendly feeling had sprung up between these two nationalities, which competed with one another in the corn trade and in the grocery business. This competition, though of great benefit to the consumers, was a thorn in the flesh of the Greek merchants. Time and again, the Greeks would scare the Jews during the Christian Passover by their barbarous custom of discharging pistols in front of their church, which was situated in the heart of the Jewish district. But in 1871, with the approach of the Christian Passover, the Greeks proceeded to organize a regular pogrom. To arouse the mob, the Greeks spread the rumor that the Jews had stolen a cross from the church fence and had thrown stones at the church building. The pogrom began on Palm Sunday, March 28. The Jews were maltreated and their houses and shops were sacked and looted. Having started in the immediate vicinity of the church, the riot spread to the neighboring streets and finally engulfed the whole city. For three days, hordes of Greeks and Russians gave free vent to the mob instinct, demolishing, burning, and robbing Jewish property, desecrating synagogues and beating Jews to senselessness in all parts of the city, undisturbed by the presence of police and troops who did nothing to stop the atrocities. The appeal of Representative Odessa Jews to Governor General Kotsubwe was met by the retort that the Jews themselves were to blame, having started first, and that the necessary measures for restoring order had been adopted. The latter assertion proved to be false, for on the following day the pogrom was renewed with even greater vigor. Only on the fourth day, when thousands of houses and shops had already been destroyed, and the rioters, intoxicated with their success, threatened to start a regular massacre, the authorities decided to step in and to pacify the rip rap by a rather quaint method. Soldiers were posted on the marketplace with wagon roads of roads, and the rioters, caught red-handed, were given a public whipping on the spot. The fatherly punishment inflicted by the local authorities upon their naughty children sufficed to put a stop to the pogrom. As for the central government in St. Petersburg, the only thing it wanted to know was whether the pogrom had any connection with the secret revolutionary propaganda, which, beginning with the Jews, might next set the mob against the nobility and Russian bourgeoisie. Since the official inquiry failed to reveal any political motives behind the Odessa riots, the St. Petersburg authorities were set at ease and were only too glad to take the word of the satraps of the Pale, who reported that the anti-Jewish movement had started as a crude protest of the masses against the failure to solve the Jewish question, namely to solve it in a reactionary spirit and as a manifestation of the popular resentment against Jewish exploitation. The old charge of separatism against the Jews thus found the companion in a new accusation, the economic exploitation of the Christian population of the Pale. The committee appointed at the recommendation of the Council of State was enjoined to conduct a strict inquiry into both these charges. Concretely, the work of the committee reduced itself to a consideration of two questions, one related to the Kahal, or the amelioration of the spiritual life of the Jews, 
and the other referring to the feasibility of thinning out the pale of settlement with the end in view of weakening the economic competition of the Jews. The material bearing on these questions included, apart from Brafman's standard work, a memorandum concerning the more important administrative problems in the Southeast, which had been submitted in 1871 by Governor General of Kiev, Dondukov Korsakov to the Tsar. The author of the memorandum voices his conviction that principal endeavors of the government must be concentrated upon the Jewish question. The Jews are becoming a great economic power in the southwestern provinces. They purchase or mortgage estates and obtain control of the factories and mills as well as of the grain, timber, and liquor trade, thereby arousing the bitter resentment of the Christian population, particularly in the rural districts. Moreover, the Jewish masses refusing to follow the lead of the handful of russified Jewish intellectuals, live entirely apart and remain in the throes of Talmudic fanaticism and Hasidic obscurantism. They possess complete self-government in their cars, their own system of finance in the basket tax, their separate charitable institutions, their own traditional schools in the headers of which there are in the southwest no less than 6,000. In addition, the Jews possess an international organization, the World Kahal, represented by Alliance Israelite Universe in Paris, whose president, Adolf Kremio, had had the audacity to protest to the Russian government against the acts of violence perpetrated upon the Jews. For all these reasons, the governor general is of the opinion that the revision of the whole legislation affecting the Jews has become an imperative necessity. Footnote. According to the official figures quoted in the memorandum, the number of Jews in the three southwestern governments, i.e. Volhynia, Podolia, and the Kiev province, amounted to 721,080. Of these, 14% lived in rural districts and 86% in cities and towns. They owned 27 sugar refineries out of 105, 619 distilleries out of 712, 5,700 mills out of 6,353, and so forth. The production of the industrial establishments in the hands of the Jews reached the sum of 70 million rubles. A similar tone was adopted in the other official documents, which came into the hands of the Committee for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Jews. The communications of the governors and the reports of the members of the committee were all animated by the same spirit, the spirit that spoke through Brafman's book of the Kahal. This was but natural. The officials, to whom this book had been sent by the central government for guidance, drew from it their whole political wisdom in things Jewish, and in their replies endeavored to fall in with the instructions of the Council of States conveyed to them by the committee, namely to consider ways and means to weaken the communal cohesion among the Jews. In the Kingdom of Poland, the governors complained similarly in their reports that the Jews of the province, though accorded equal rights by Wielepolski, had not complied with the conditions attached to that act, to wit, to abandon the use of their own language and script in exchange for the favors bestowed upon them. Outside of a handful of assimilated Poles of the mosaic persuasion, who were imbued with Polish chauvinism, the Hasidic rank and file were permeated by extreme separatism, fostered by the car through its various agencies, the congregational boards, the rabbinate, the headers, and the host of special institutions. These and similar communications formed the groundwork of the reports, or more correctly, the bills of indictment in which 
the members of the committee charged the Jews with the terrible crime of constituting a religio-political caste, in other words, a nationality. Following the lead of Brafman, the members of the committee laid particular emphasis in their reports on the obnoxiousness of the Talmud and the danger of Jewish separatism. Needless to say, the conclusion offered by them were of the kind anticipated in the instructions of the Council of State, the necessity of wiping out the last vestige of Jewish self-government, such as the Jewish community, the school, the mutual relief societies, in a word, everything that tends to foster the communal cohesion among the Jews. The barbarism of these proposals were covered by the fig leaf of enlightenment. When the benighted Jewish masses will have fused with the highly cultured populace of Russia. In other words, when the Jews will have ceased to be Jews, then will the Jewish question find its solution. In the meantime, however, the Jews are to be curbed by the bridle of disabilities. The referees of the committee on the question of the Pale of Settlement, Grigoriev, frankly stated, What is important in this question is not whether the Jews will fare better when granted the rights of residence all over the empire, but rather the effect of these measures on the economic well-being of an enormous part of Russian people. From this point of view, the referee finds that it would be dangerous to let the Jews pass beyond the pale, since the plague, which had thus far been restricted to the western provinces, will then spread over the whole empire. For a long time, the committee was at a deadlock, held down by bureaucratic reaction. It was only towards the end of its existence that the voice from another world, the posthumous voice of dead and buried liberalism resounded in its midst. In 1880, the committee was presented with a memorandum by two of its members, Nekludov and Karapov, in which the bold attempt was made to champion the heretic point of view of complete Jewish emancipation. The language of the memorandum was one which the Russian government had not heard for a long time. In the name of morality and justice, the authors of the memorandum call upon the government to abandon its grossly utilitarian attitude towards the Jews, who are to be denied civil rights so long as they do not prove useful to the original population. They expose the selfish motive underlying the bits of emancipation which had been doled out to the Jews during the preceding spell of liberalism the desire not to help the Jews, but to exploit their services. First guild merchants, physicians, lawyers, artisans were admitted into the interior for the sole purpose of developing business in those places and filling the palpable shortage in artisans and professional men. As soon as this or that category of Jews was found to be serviceable to the Russian people, it was relieved, and relieved only in parts, from the pressure of exceptional laws and received into the dominant population of the empire. But the millions of plain Jews, abandoned by the upper classes, have continued to languish in the suffocating pale. The Jewish population is denied the elementary right granting liberty of pursuit freedom of movement and land ownership, such as only a criminal may be deprived of by a verdict of the courts. As it is, discontent is rife among these disinherited masses. The rising generation of Jews has already begun to participate in the revolutionary movement to which they had hitherto been strangers. The system of oppression must be set aside. All the Jewish defects, their separatism and one-sided economic activity are merely the fruits of this oppression. Where the law has no confidence in the population, 
there inevitably the population has no confidence in the law and it naturally becomes an enemy of the existing order of things. Human reason does not admit any consideration which might justify the placing of many millions of the Jewish population on a level with criminal offenders. The first step in the direction of complete emancipation ought to be the immediate grant of the right of domicile all over the empire. Footnote. The narrow utilitarianism of the governmental policy in the Jewish question may also be illustrated by the official attitude towards the promotion of agriculture among the Jews. Under Alexander I and Nicholas I, Jewish agricultural colonization in the south of Russia was encouraged by the grant of special privileges, though the Jewish settlers were subjected to the stern tutelage of bureaucratic inspectors. But under Alexander II, when southern Russia was no longer in need of artificial colonization, the government discontinued its policy of promoting Jewish colonization and on new case issued in 1866 stopped the settlement of Jews in agricultural colonies altogether. A little later, the Jewish colonies in the southwest were deprived of a large part of their lands, which were distributed among the peasants. End of note. These bold wars which turned the Jews from defendants into plaintiffs ran counter to the fundamental task of the committee, which, according to the original instructions received by it, was expected to draft its plans in a spirit of reaction. At any rate, these wars were uttered too late. A new era was approaching, which, in solving the Jewish question, resorted to the methods such as would have horrified even the conservative statesmen of the 70s, the era of pogroms and cruel disabilities. End of section 14. Section 15 of History of the Jews in Russia and Poland, Volume 2, From the Death of Alexander I until the Death of Alexander III, 1825 to 1894, by Shimon Dubunov. Translated by Israel Friedlander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by S.S. Kim. Manik de Baisho, Portugal. Chapter 19. The Reaction under Alexander II. Part 2. 4. The Drift Towards Oppression. During the last decade of Alexander's reign, the machinery of Jewish legislation was working at a slow rate, pending the full revision of Jewish rights. Yet, the steps of the approaching reaction could be well discerned. Thus, in 1870, during the discussion of the draft of the new municipal statute by a special committee of the Ministry of the Interior, which included as experts the burgomasters of the most important Russian cities, the question arose whether the formal limitation of the number of Jewish aldermen in the municipal councils to one-third of the whole number of aldermen should be upheld or not. The cities involved were those of the Pale, where the Jews formed the majority of the population, and the committee was searching for ways and means to weaken the excessive influence of this majority upon the city administration and to subordinate it to the Christian minority. One solitary member, Novozelsky, the burgomaster of Odessa, advocated the repeal of the old restriction with the one proviso that the Jewish old men should be required to possess certain educational qualifications inasmuch as educated Jews were not quite as harmful as uneducated ones. A minority of the members of the committee favored the limitation of the number of Jewish old men to one half, but the majority staunchly defended the old norm, which was one third. The representatives of the majority, in particular Count Cherkasky, 
the burgomaster of Moscow, argued that the Jews constituted not only a religious but also a national entity, that they were still widely removed from assimilation or russification, that education, far from transforming the Jews into Russians, made them only more successful in the struggle for existence, that it was inadvisable for this reason to subject the whole Russian element of the population to the risk of falling under the domination of Judaism. The curious principle of municipal justice, by virtue of which the majority of house owners and taxpayers were to be ruled by the representatives of the minority carried the day. The new municipal statute sanctioned the norm of one-third for non-Christians and reaffirmed the ineligibility of Jews to the post of burgomaster. The law of 1874 establishing general military service and abolishing the former method of conscription proved the first legal enactment which imposed upon the Jews equal obligations with their fellow citizens prior to bestowing upon them equal rights. To be sure, the new regulation brought considerable relief to the Jews inasmuch as the heavy burden of military duty which had formerly been borne entirely by the poor burger class was now distributed over all estates while the burden itself was lightened by the reduction of the term of service. Moreover, the former collective responsibility of the community for the supply of recruits, which had given rise to the institution of captors and many other evils, was replaced by the personal responsibility of every individual conscript. All this, however, was not sufficient to change, certainly, the attitude of the Jewish populace towards military service. The formerly privileged mercantile class could not reconcile itself easily to the idea of sending their children to the army. The horrors of all the conscription were still fresh in their minds, and even in its new setting, military service was still suggestive of the hideous horrors of the past. Those who but yesterday had been dragged like criminals to the recruiting stations could not well be expected to change their sentiments overnight and appear there of their own free will. The result was that a considerable number of the Jews of military age, 21, failed to obey the summons of the first conscription. Immediately, the cry went up that the Jews evaded their military duty and the Christians were forced to make up the shortage. The official pens in St. Petersburg and in the provincial chancelleries became busy scribbling. The Ministry of War demanded the adoption of draconian measures to stop this evasion. As a result, the whole Jewish youth of conscription age was registered in 1875. At the recruiting stations, the age of the young Jews was determined by their external appearance without regard to their birth certificate. Finally, in the course of 1876 to 1878, a number of special provisions were enacted by way of exception from the general military statute for the purpose of ensuring the regular discharge of their military duty by the Jews. According to the new legal provisions, the Jews who had been rejected as unfit for military service were to be replaced by other Jews and under no circumstances by Christians. For this purpose, the Jewish conscripts were to be segregated from the Christians after the drawing of lots the first stage in the recruiting process. Moreover, in the case of Jews, a lower stature and a narrower chest were required than in that of non-Jews. In the case of a shortage of unprivileged recruits, permission was given to draft not only Jews enjoying by their family status the third and second class privileges, but also those of the first class i.e. to deprive Jewish parents of their only sons. 
Footnote 1. Since the number of men of military age greatly exceeds the required number of the recruits, the Russian law provides that lots be drawn by the conscripts to determine the order in which they are to present themselves for examination to the recruiting officers. When the quota is completed, the remaining conscripts, i.e. those who, having drawn a high number, have not yet been examined, are declared exempt from military service. Footnote 2. According to Russian law, the following three categories of recruits are exempt from military service. 1. The only sons. 2. The only wage-earning sons, though there will be other sons in the family. 3. Those who have an elder brother or brothers in the army. The first category is exempt under all circumstances. The last two on condition that the required number of recruits be secured out of the unprivileged conscripts. Only in the case of the Jews is the first category drawn upon in the case of a shortage. End of note. In this manner, the government sought to ensure with ruthless figure the discharge of this most onerous duty on the part of the Jews without making any attempt to ensure, at the same time, the rights of this population of three millions, which was made to spill its blood for the fatherland. In the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, many Jewish soldiers fought for Russia, and a goodly number of them were killed or wounded on the battlefield. Yet, in the Russian military headquarters, the post of commander-in-chief was occupied by the crown prince, the future Tsar Alexander III. No attention was paid to the thousands of Jewish victims, but rather to the fact that the Jewish form of army purveyors, Gregor Horowitz and Kohan, was found to have had a share in the commissariat scandals. When at the Congress of Berlin in 1878, a resolution was introduced calling upon the governments of Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria to accord equal rights to the Jews in their respective dominions and was warmly supported by all plenipotentiaries such as Waddington, Beaconsfield, Bismarck, and others, the only one to oppose the emancipation of the Jews on principle was the Russian Chancellor Korchakov. In his desire to save the prestige of Russia, which herself had failed to grant equal rights to the Jews, the Chancellor could not refrain from an anti-Semitic sally, remarking during the debate that one ought not to confound the Jews of Berlin, Paris, London, and Vienna, who cannot be denied civil and political rights, with the Jews of Serbia, Romania, and several Russian provinces, where they are a regular scourge to the native population. Altogether, the growth of anti-Semitism in the government circles and in certain layers of Russian society towards the close of the 70s became clearly pronounced. The laurels of Brahman, whose exposure of Judaism had netted him many personal benefits and profitable connections in the world of officialdom, were apt to stimulate all sorts of adventurers. In 1876, a new exposer of Judaism appeared on the scene, a man with the stained past, Hippolyte Lutostansky. He was originally a Roman Catholic priest in the government of Kovno, having been unfrocked by the Catholic consistory on account of incredible acts of lawlessness and immoral conduct, including libel, embezzlement, rape committed upon a Jews, and similar heroic exploits. He joined the Greek Orthodox Church, entered the famous Troitsa Monastery near Moscow as a monk, and was admitted as a student to the Ecclesiastic Academy of the same city. As a subject for his dissertation for the degree of candidate, the ignorant monk chose a sensational topic concerning the use of Christian blood by the Jews. It was an unlettered and scurrilous pamphlet 
in which the author, without indicating his sources, incorporated the contents of an official memorandum on the ritual murder legend from the time of Nicholas I, supplementing it by distorted quotations from the Talmudic and rabbinic literature, without the slightest knowledge of that literature or the Hebrew language. The monastic adventurer, finding himself in financial straits, brought his manuscript to Rabbi Minor of Moscow, declaring his willingness to forego the publication of his brochure, which no doubt would cause great harm to the Jews, for a consideration of 500 rubles, $250. His blackmail offer was rejected. Lutostansky thereupon published his hideous book in 1876 and traveled with it to St. Petersburg, where he managed to present it to the crown prince, subsequently Alexander III, and to secure from him a grateful acknowledgement. The book also found the approval of Chip of Gendarmerie, who acquired a large number of copies and distributed them among the secret police all over Russia. Encouraged by his success, Lutostansky issued a few years later, in 1879, another libellous work in two volumes under the title The Talmud and the Jews, which exhibit the same crudeness in style and content as his previous achievement, a typical specimen of a degraded backyard literature. The editor of the Hebrew journal Ha Melit, Alexander Zederbaum, demonstrated clearly that Lutostansky had forged his quotations and summoned him to a public disputation, which offer was wisely declined. Nevertheless, the agitation of this shameless impostor had a considerable effect on the highest official spheres in which an ever stronger drift toward anti-Semitism was clearly noticeable. In 1878, this anti-Semitic trend gave rise to a new ritual murder trial. The discovery in the government of Kutais in the Caucasus of the body of a little Gruzinian girl named Sarah Modebaze, who had disappeared on the eve of Passover, was deemed a sufficient reason by the judicial authorities to enter a charge of murder against ten local Jews, although the ritual character of the murder was not put forward openly in the indictment. The case was tried before the district court of Kutais, and the counsel for the defense succeeded by their brilliant speeches not only to demolish completely the whole structure of incriminating evidence, but also to deal a death blow to the sinister ritual legend. The case ended in 1879 with the acquittal of all the accused. With all, the ritual agitation left a nasty sediment in the Russian press. When in 1879, the famous Orientalist Daniel Cholson, a convert to Christianity and professor at the Greek Orthodox Ecclesiastic Seminary of St. Petersburg, who had written a learned apologetic treatise concerning the medieval accusations against the Jews, published a refutation of the ritual myth under the title Do Jews Use Christian Blood? He was attacked in the Novoye Vremia by the liberal historian Kostomarov, who attempted to disprove the conclusions of the defender of Judaism. The paper itself, hitherto liberal in its tendency, changed from about that time and steering its course by the prevailing moves in the leading government circles, launched a systematic campaign against the Jews. The anti-Semitic bacilli was floating in the social atmosphere of Russia and preparing the way for the pogrom epidemic of the following decades. End of section 15